Recorded Books Incorporated presents an unabridged recording of Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice, narrated by Frank Muller. This work is copyrighted 1976 by Anne Rice. This recording is copyrighted 1994 by Recorded Books Incorporated. And now, Book One of the Vampire Chronicles, Interview with the Vampire. I see, said the vampire thoughtfully, and slowly he walked across the room towards the window. For a long time he stood there against the dim light from Divisadero Street and the passing beams of traffic. The boy could see the furnishings of the room more clearly now, the round oak table, the chairs, a wash basin hung on one wall with a mirror. He set his briefcase on the table and waited. But how much tape do you have with you? asked the vampire, turning now so the boy could see his profile. Enough for the story of a life? Sure, if it's a good life. Sometimes I interview as many as three or four people a night, if I'm lucky. But it has to be a good story. That's only fair, isn't it? Admirably fair, the vampire answered. I would like to tell you the story of my life, then. I would like to do that very much. Great, said the boy, and quickly he removed the small tape recorder from his briefcase, making a check of the cassette and the batteries. I'm really anxious to hear why you believe this, why you know, said the vampire abruptly. We can't begin that way. Is your equipment ready? Yes, said the boy. Then sit down. I'm going to turn on the overhead light. But I thought vampires didn't like light, said the boy. If you think the dark adds to the atmosphere... But then he stopped. The vampire was watching him with his back to the window. The boy could make out nothing of his face now. And something about the still figure there distracted him. He started to say something again, but he said nothing. And then he sighed with relief when the vampire moved towards the table and reached for the overhead cord. At once the room was flooded with a harsh yellow light, and the boy staring up at the vampire could not repress a gasp, his fingers danced backwards on the table to grasp the edge. Dear God, he whispered. And then he gazed, speechless, at the vampire. The vampire was utterly white and smooth, as if he were sculpted from bleached bone, and his face was as seemingly inanimate as a statue, except for two brilliant green eyes that looked down at the boy intently, like flames in a skull. But then the vampire smiled almost wistfully, and the smooth white substance of his face moved with the infinitely flexible but minimal lines of a cartoon. Do you see? he asked softly. The boy shuddered, lifting his hand as if to shield himself from a powerful light, his eyes moved slowly over the finely tailored black coat he'd only glimpsed in the bar, the long folds of the cape, the black silk tie knotted at the throat, and the gleam of the white collar that was as white as the vampire's flesh. He stared at the vampire's full black hair, the waves that were combed back over the tips of the ears, the curls that barely touched the edge of the white collar. Now do you still want the interview? the vampire asked. The boy's mouth was open before the sound came out. He was nodding. Then he said, Yes. The vampire sat down, slowly, opposite him, and leaning forward said gently, confidentially, 
Don't be afraid. Just start the tape. And then he reached out over the length of the table. The boy recoiled, sweat running down the sides of his face. The vampire clamped a hand on the boy's shoulder and said, Believe me, I won't hurt you. I want this opportunity. It's more important to me than you can realize now. I want you to begin. And he withdrew his hand and sat, collected, waiting. It took a moment for the boy to wipe his forehead and his lips with a handkerchief, to stammer that the microphone was in the machine, to press the button, to say that the machine was on. You weren't always a vampire, were you? he began. No, answered the vampire. I was a twenty-five-year-old man when I became a vampire, and the year was 1791. The boy was startled by the preciseness of the date, and he repeated it before he asked, How did it come about? There's a simple answer to that. I don't believe I want to give simple answers, said the vampire. I think I want to tell the real story. Yes, the boy said quickly. He was folding his handkerchief over and over and wiping his lips now with it again. There was a tragedy, the vampire started. It was my younger brother. He died. And then he stopped, so that the boy cleared his throat and wiped at his face again before stuffing the handkerchief almost impatiently into his pocket. "'It's not painful, is it?' he asked timidly. "'Does it seem so?' asked the vampire. "'No.' He shook his head. "'It's simply that I've only told this story to one other person, and that was so long ago.' No, it's not painful. We were living in Louisiana then. We'd received a land grant and settled two indigo plantations on the Mississippi very near New Orleans. Ah, that's the accent, the boy said softly. For a moment the vampire stared blankly. I have an accent, he began to laugh. And the boy, flustered, answered quickly, I noticed it in the bar when I asked you what you did for a living. It's just a slight sharpness to the consonants, that's all. I never guessed it was French. It's all right, the vampire assured him. I'm not as shocked as I pretend to be. It's only that I forget it from time to time. But let me go on. Please, said the boy. I was talking about... The plantations, they had a great deal to do with it, really, my becoming a vampire. But I'll come to that. Our life there was both luxurious and primitive, and we ourselves found it extremely attractive. You see, we lived far better there than we could have ever lived in France. Perhaps the sheer wilderness of Louisiana only made it seem so, but... Seeming so, it was. I remember the imported furniture that cluttered the house. The vampire smiled. And the harpsichord. That was lovely. My sister used to play it. On summer evenings she would sit at the keys with her back to the open French windows. And I can still remember that thin, rapid music and the vision of the swamp rising beyond her, the moss-hung cypresses floating against the sky. And there were the sounds of the swamp, a chorus of creatures, the cry of the birds. I think we loved it. It made the rosewood furniture all the more precious, the music more delicate and desirable. Even when the wisteria tore the shutters off the attic windows and worked its tendrils right into the whitewashed brick in less than a year. Yes, we loved it. All except my brother. I don't think I ever heard him complain of anything, but I knew how he felt. My father was dead then, and I was head of the family, and I had to defend him constantly from my mother and sister, 
They wanted to take him visiting and to New Orleans for parties, but he hated these things. I think he stopped going altogether before he was twelve. Prayer was what mattered to him, prayer and his leather-bound lives of the saints. Finally I built him an oratory, removed from the house, and he began to spend most of every day there, and often the early evening. It was ironic, really. He was so different from us, so different from everyone, and I was so regular. There was nothing extraordinary about me whatsoever. The vampire smiled. Sometimes in the evening I would go out to him and find him in the garden near the oratory, sitting absolutely composed on a stone bench there, and I'd tell him my troubles, the difficulties I had with the slaves, how I distrusted the overseer or the weather or my brokers, all the problems that made up the length and breadth of my existence. And he would listen, making only a few comments, always sympathetic, so that when I left him I had the distinct impression he had solved everything for me. I didn't think I could deny him anything, and I vowed that no matter how it would break my heart to lose him, he could enter the priesthood when the time came. Of course I was wrong. The vampire stopped. For a moment the boy only gazed at him, and then he started as if awakened from deep thought, and he floundered as if he could not find the right words. Ah, he, he didn't want to be a priest? the boy asked. The vampire studied him, as if trying to discern the meaning of his expression. Then he said, I meant that I was wrong about myself, about my not denying him anything. His eyes moved over the far wall and fixed on the panes of the window. He began to see visions. Real visions? the boy asked, but again there was hesitation as if he were thinking of something else. I didn't think so, the vampire answered. It happened when he was fifteen. He was very... Handsome, then, he had the smoothest skin and the largest blue eyes. He was robust, not thin as I am now, and was then. But his eyes, it was as if when I looked into his eyes, I was standing alone on the edge of the world, on a windswept ocean beach. There was nothing but the soft roar of the waves. Well he said, his eyes still fixed on the window panes. He began to see visions. He only hinted at this at first, and he stopped taking his meals altogether. He lived in the oratory. At any hour of the day or night I could find him on the bare flagstones, kneeling before the altar. And the oratory itself was neglected. He stopped tending the candles, or changing the altar cloths, or even sweeping out the leaves. One night I became really alarmed when I stood in the rose arbor, watching him for one solid hour, during which he never moved from his knees, and never once lowered his arms, which he held outstretched in the form of a cross. The slaves all thought he was mad. The vampire raised his eyebrows in wonder. I was convinced that he was only overzealous, that in his love for God he had perhaps gone too far. Then he told me about the visions. Both St. Dominic and the Blessed Virgin Mary had come to him in the oratory. They had told him he was to sell all our property in Louisiana, everything we owned, and use the money to do God's work in France. My brother was to be a great religious leader, to return the country to its former fervor, to turn the tide against atheism and the revolution. Of course, he had no money of his own. I was to sell the plantations and our townhouses in New Orleans and give the money to him. Again the vampire stopped, and the boy sat motionless, regarding him, astonished. Ah, uh, excuse me. 
he whispered. What did you say? Did you sell the plantations? No, said the vampire, his face calm as it had been from the start. I laughed at him. And he... he became incensed. He insisted his command came from the Virgin herself. Who was I to disregard it? Who indeed, he asked softly, as if he were thinking of this again. Who indeed? And the more he tried to convince me, the more I laughed. It was nonsense, I told him, the product of an immature and even morbid mind. The oratory was a mistake, I said to him. I would have it torn down at once. He would go to school in New Orleans and get such inane notions out of his head. I don't remember all that I said. But I remember the feeling. Behind all this contemptuous dismissal on my part was a smoldering anger and a disappointment. I was bitterly disappointed. I didn't believe him at all. But that's understandable said the boy quickly when the vampire paused, his expression of astonishment softening. I mean, would anyone have believed him? Is it so understandable? The vampire looked at the boy. I think perhaps it was vicious egotism. Let me explain. I loved my brother, as I told you, and at times I believed him to be a living saint. I encouraged him in his prayer and meditations, as I said, and I was willing to give him up to the priesthood. And if someone had told me of a saint in Arles or Lourdes who saw visions, I would have believed it. I was a Catholic. I believed in saints. I lit tapers before their marble statues in churches. I knew their pictures, their symbols, their names. But I didn't, couldn't, Believe my brother. Not only did I not believe he saw visions, I couldn't entertain the notion for a moment. Now, why? Because he was my brother. Holy he might be, peculiar most definitely, but Francis of Assisi, no, not my brother. No brother of mine could be such. That is egotism. Do you see? The boy thought about it before he answered, and then he nodded and said that yes, he thought that he did. Perhaps he saw the visions, said the vampire. Then you, you don't claim to know now whether he did or not. No, but I do know that he never wavered in his conviction for a second. That I know now, and knew then, the night he left my room, crazed and grieved. He never wavered for an instant, and within minutes he was dead. How? the boy asked. He simply walked out of the French doors onto the gallery and stood for a moment at the head of the brick stairs, and then he fell. He was dead when I reached the bottom, his neck broken. The vampire shook his head in consternation, but his face was still serene. "'Did you see him fall?' asked the boy. "'Did he lose his footing?' "'No, but two of the servants saw it happen. "'They said that he had looked up, as if he had just seen something in the air. "'Then his entire body moved forward, as if being swept by a wind.' One of them said he was about to say something when he fell. I thought that he was about to say something too, but it was at that moment I turned away from the window. My back was turned when I heard the noise. He glanced at the tape recorder. I could not forgive myself. I felt responsible for his death, he said. And everyone else seemed to think I was responsible also. But how could they? You said they saw him fall. It wasn't a direct accusation. They simply knew that something had passed between us that was unpleasant, that we had argued minutes before the fall. The servants had heard us. My mother had heard us. My mother would not stop asking me what had happened and why my brother, who was so quiet, had been shouting. 
Then my sister joined in, and of course I refused to say. I was so bitterly shocked and miserable that I had no patience with anyone, only the vague determination they would not know about his visions. They would not know that he had become finally not a saint, but only a fanatic. My sister went to bed rather than face the funeral, and my mother told everyone in the parish that something horrible had happened in my room, which I would not reveal, and even the police questioned me on the word of my own mother. Finally the priest came to see me and demanded to know what had gone on. I told no one. It was only a discussion, I said. I was not on the gallery when he fell, I protested, and they all stared at me as if I'd killed him. And I felt that I'd killed him. I sat in the parlor beside his coffin for two days, thinking I had killed him. I stared at his face until spots appeared before my eyes and I nearly fainted. The back of his skull had been shattered on the pavement, and his head had the wrong shape on the pillow. I forced myself to stare at it, to study it, simply because I could hardly endure the pain and the smell of decay, and I was tempted over and over to try to open his eyes. All these were mad thoughts, mad impulses. The main thought was this. I had laughed at him. I had not believed him. I had not been kind to him. He had fallen because of me. This really happened, didn't it? The boy whispered. You're telling me something that's true. Yes, said the vampire, looking at him without surprise. I want to go on telling you. But as his eyes passed over the boy and returned to the window, he showed only faint interest in the boy, who seemed engaged in some silent inner struggle. But you said you didn't know about the visions, that you, a vampire, didn't know for certain whether I want to take things in order, said the vampire. I want to go on telling you things as they happened. No, I don't know about the visions. To this day. And again he waited until the boy said, Yes, please, please, go on. Well, I wanted to sell the plantations. I never wanted to see the house or the oratory again. I leased them, finally, to an agency which would work them for me and manage things so I need never go there, and I moved my mother and sister to one of the townhouses in New Orleans. Of course I did not escape my brother for a moment. I could think of nothing but his body rotting in the ground. He was buried in the St. Louis Cemetery in New Orleans, and I did everything to avoid passing those gates. But still I thought of him constantly. Drunk or sober, I saw his body rotting in the coffin, and I couldn't bear it. Over and over I dreamed that he was at the head of the steps, and I was holding his arm, talking kindly to him, urging him back into the bedroom, telling him gently that I did believe him, that he must pray for me to have faith. Meantime, the slaves on Pointe du Lac, that was my plantation, had begun to talk of seeing his ghost on the gallery. The overseer couldn't keep order. People in society asked my sister offensive questions about the whole incident, and she became an hysteric. She wasn't really an hysteric. She simply thought she ought to react that way, so she did. I drank all the time and was at home as little as possible. I lived like a man who wanted to die but who had no courage to do it himself. I walked black streets and alleys alone. I passed out in cabarets. I backed out of two duels more from apathy than cowardice and truly wished to be murdered. And then I was attacked. 
It might have been anyone. And my invitation was open to sailors, thieves, maniacs, anyone. But it was a vampire. He caught me just a few steps from my door one night and left me for dead. Or so I thought. You mean he sucked your blood? the boy asked. Yes, the vampire laughed. He sucked my blood. That is the way it's done. But you lived, said the young man. You said he left you for dead. Well, he drained me almost to the point of death, which was for him sufficient. I was put to bed as soon as I was found, confused and really unaware of what had happened to me. I suppose I thought that drink had finally caused a stroke. I expected to die now and had no interest in eating or drinking or talking to the doctor. My mother sent for the priest. I was feverish by then, and I told the priest everything, all about my brother's visions and what I had done. I remember I clung to his arm, making him swear over and over he would tell no one. I know I didn't kill him, I said to the priest finally. It's that I cannot live now that he's dead, not after the way I treated him. That's ridiculous, he answered me. Of course you can live. There's nothing wrong with you but self-indulgence. Your mother needs you, not to mention your sister. And as for this brother of yours, he was possessed of the devil. I was so stunned when he said this, I couldn't protest. The devil made the visions, he went on to explain. The devil was rampant. The entire country of France was under the influence of the devil, and the revolution had been his greatest triumph. Nothing would have saved my brother but exorcism, prayer, and fasting, men to hold him down while the devil raged in his body and tried to throw him about. The devil threw him down the steps. It's perfectly obvious, he declared. You weren't talking to your brother in that room. You were talking to the devil. Well, this enraged me. I believed before that I had been pushed to my limits, but I had not. He went on talking about the devil, about voodoo amongst the slaves and cases of possession in other parts of the world, and I went wild. I wrecked the room in the process of nearly killing him. But your strength, the vampire, asked the boy. I was out of my mind, the vampire explained. I did things I could not have done in perfect health. The scene is confused, pale, fantastical now, but I do remember that I drove him out of the back doors of the house, across the courtyard and against the brick wall of the kitchen, where I pounded his head until I nearly killed him. When I was subdued finally, and exhausted then, almost to the point of death, they bled me, the fools. But I was going to say something else. It was then that I conceived of my own egotism. Perhaps I'd seen it reflected in the priest. His contemptuous attitude towards my brother reflected my own. His immediate and shallow carping about the devil, his refusal to even entertain the idea that sanctity had passed so close. But he did believe in possession by the devil. That is a much more mundane idea, said the vampire immediately. People who cease to believe in God or goodness altogether still believe in the devil. I don't know why. No, I do indeed know why. Evil is always possible, and goodness is eternally difficult. But you must understand possession is really another way of saying someone is mad. I felt it was for the priest. I'm sure he'd seen madness. Perhaps he had stood right over raving madness and pronounced it possession. You don't have to see Satan when he is exorcised. 
but to stand in the presence of a saint, to believe that the saint has seen a vision. No, it's egotism, our refusal to believe it could occur in our midst. I never thought of it that way, said the boy. But what happened to you? You said they bled you to cure you, and that must have nearly killed you. The vampire laughed. Yes, it certainly did. But the vampire came back that night. You see, he wanted Pointe-du-Lac, my plantation. It was very late. After my sister had fallen asleep, I can remember it as if it were yesterday. He came in from the courtyard, opening the French doors without a sound. A tall, fair-skinned man with a mass of blond hair and a graceful, almost feline quality to his movements. And gently he draped a shawl over my sister's eyes and lowered the wick of the lamp. She dozed there beside the basin and the cloth with which she'd bathed my forehead, and she never once stirred under that shawl until morning. But by that time I was greatly changed. What was this change? asked the boy. The vampire sighed. He leaned back against the chair and looked at the walls. At first I thought he was another doctor, or someone summoned by the family to try to reason with me. But this suspicion was removed at once. He stepped close to my bed and leaned down so that his face was in the lamplight, and I saw that he was no ordinary man at all. His gray eyes burned with an incandescence, and the long white hands which hung by his sides were not those of a human being. I think I knew everything in that instant, and all that he told me was only aftermath. What I mean is, the moment I saw him, saw his extraordinary aura, and knew him to be no creature I'd ever known, I was reduced to nothing. That ego which could not accept the presence of an extraordinary human being in its midst was crushed. All my conceptions, even my guilt and wish to die, seemed utterly unimportant. I completely forgot myself, he said, now silently touching his breast with his fist. I forgot myself totally. And in the same instant, I knew totally the meaning of possibility. From then on, I experienced only increasing wonder. As he talked to me and told me of what I might become, of what his life had been and stood to be, my past shrank to embers. I saw my life as if I stood apart from it the vanity, the self-serving, the constant fleeing from one petty annoyance after another, the lip service to God and the Virgin, and a host of saints whose names filled my prayer books, none of whom made the slightest difference in a narrow, materialistic and selfish existence. I saw my real gods, the gods of most men, food, drink, and security in conformity, cinders. The boy's face was tense with a mixture of confusion and amazement. And so you decided to become a vampire? he asked. The vampire was silent for a moment. Decided. It doesn't seem the right word. Yet I cannot say it was inevitable from the moment that he stepped into that room. No. Indeed, it was not inevitable. Yet I can't say I decided. 
Let me say that when he'd finished speaking, no other decision was possible for me, and I pursued my course without a backward glance, except for one. Except for one? What? My last sunrise, said the vampire. That morning I was not yet a vampire, and I saw my last sunrise. I remember it completely. Yet I do not think I remember any other sunrise before it. I remember the light came first to the tops of the French windows, paling behind the lace curtains, and then a gleam growing brighter and brighter in patches among the leaves of the trees. Finally the sun came through the windows themselves, and the lace lay in shadows on the stone floor, and all over the form of my sister, who was still sleeping, shadows of lace on the shawl over her shoulders and head. As soon as she was warm, she pushed the shawl away without awakening. And then the sun shone full on her eyes, and she tightened her eyelids. Then it was gleaming on the table where she rested her head on her arms, and gleaming, blazing in the water in the pitcher. And I could feel it on my hands on the counterpane, and then on my face. I lay in the bed thinking about all the things the vampire had told me, and then it was that I said goodbye to the sunrise and went out to become a vampire. It was the last sunrise. The vampire was looking out the window again, and when he stopped, the silence was so sudden the boy seemed to hear it. Then he could hear the noises from the street. The sound of a truck was deafening. The light cord stirred with the vibration. Then the truck was gone. Do you miss it? he asked then in a small voice. Not really, said the vampire. There are so many other things. But where were we? You want to know how it happened, how I became a vampire. Yes, said the boy. How did you change exactly? I can't tell you exactly, said the vampire. I can tell you about it and close it with words that will make the value of it to me evident to you. But I can't tell you exactly any more than I could tell you exactly what is the experience of sex if you have never had it. The young man seemed struck suddenly with still another question, but before he could speak the vampire went on. As I told you, this vampire, Lestat, wanted the plantation. A mundane reason, surely, for granting me a life which will last until the end of the world, but he was not a very discriminating person. He didn't consider the world's small population of vampires as being a select club, I should say. He had human problems. A blind father who did not know his son was a vampire and must not find out. Living in New Orleans had become too difficult for him, considering his needs and the necessity to care for his father, and he wanted Pointe du Lac. We went at once to the plantation the next evening ensconced the blind father in the master bedroom, and I proceeded to make the change. I cannot say that it consisted in any one step, really, though one, of course, was the step beyond which I could make no return. But there were several acts involved, and the first was the death of the overseer. Lestat took him in his sleep. I was to watch and to approve, that is, to witness the taking of a human life as proof of my commitment and part of my change. This proved without doubt the most difficult part for me. I've told you I had no fear regarding my own death, only a squeamishness about taking my life myself. But I had a most 
high regard for the life of others, and a horror of death most recently developed because of my brother. I had to watch the overseer awake with a start, try to throw off Lestat with both hands, fail, then lie there struggling under Lestat's grasp and finally go limp, drained of blood, and die. He did not die at once. We stood in his narrow bedroom for the better part of an hour, watching him die. Part of my change, as I said. Lestat would never have stayed otherwise. Then it was necessary to get rid of the overseer's body. I was almost sick from this. Weak and feverish already, I had little reserve, and handling the dead body with such a purpose caused me nausea. Lestat was laughing, telling me callously that I would feel so different once I was a vampire that I would laugh too. He was wrong about that. I never laugh at death, no matter how often and regularly I am the cause of it. But let me take things in order. We had to drive up the river road until we came to open fields and leave the overseer there. We tore his coat, stole his money, and saw to it his lips were stained with liquor. I knew his wife, who lived in New Orleans, and knew the state of desperation she would suffer when the body was discovered. But more than sorrow for her, I felt pain that she would never know what had happened, that her husband had not been found drunk on the road by robbers. As we beat the body, Bruising the face and the shoulders, I became more and more aroused. Of course, you must realize that all this time the vampire Lestat was extraordinary. He was no more human to me than a biblical angel. But under this pressure, my enchantment with him was strained. I had seen my becoming a vampire in two lights— the first light was simply enchantment. Lestat had overwhelmed me on my deathbed, but the other light was my wish for self-destruction, my desire to be thoroughly damned. This was the open door through which Lestat had come on both the first and second occasion. Now I was not destroying myself, but someone else, the overseer, his wife, his family. I recoiled and might have fled from Lestat, my sanity thoroughly shattered, had he not sensed, with an infallible instinct, what was happening. Infallible instinct, the vampire mused. Let me say the powerful instinct of a vampire to whom even the slightest change in a human's facial expression is as apparent as a gesture. Lestat had preternatural timing. He rushed me into the carriage and whipped the horses home. I want to die, I began to murmur. This is unbearable. I want to die. You have it in your power to kill me. Let me die. I refused to look at him, to be spellbound by the sheer beauty of his appearance. He spoke my name to me, softly, laughing, as I said, he was determined to have the plantation. But would he have let you go? asked the boy. Under any circumstances? I don't know. Knowing Lestat as I do now, I would say he would have killed me rather than let me go. But this was what I wanted, you see. It didn't matter. No, this was what I thought I wanted. As soon as we reached the house, I jumped down out of the carriage and walked, a zombie, to the brick stairs where my brother had fallen. The house had been unoccupied for months now, the overseer having his own cottage, and the Louisiana heat and damp were already picking apart the steps. Every crevice was sprouting grass and even small wildflowers. 
I remember feeling the moisture which in the night was cool as I sat down on the lower steps and even rested my head against the brick and felt the little wax-stemmed wildflowers with my hands. I pulled a clump of them out of the easy dirt in one hand. I want to die. Kill me. Kill me, I said to the vampire. Now I am guilty of murder. I can't live. He sneered with the impatience of people listening to the obvious lies of others. And then in a flash he had fastened on me just as he had on my man. I thrashed against him wildly. I dug my boot into his chest and kicked him as fiercely as I could, his teeth stinging my throat, the fever pounding in my temples. And with a movement of his entire body much too fast for me to see, he was suddenly standing disdainfully at the foot of the steps. I thought you wanted to die, Louis, he said. The boy made a soft, abrupt sound when the vampire said his name, which the vampire acknowledged with the quick statement, Yes, that is my name, and went on. Well, I lay there, helpless in the face of my own cowardice and fatuousness again, he said. Perhaps so directly confronted with it, I might in time have gained the courage to truly take my life, not to whine and beg for others to take it. I saw myself turning on a knife then, languishing in a day-to-day -day suffering which I found as necessary as penance from the confessional, truly hoping death would find me unawares and render me fit for eternal pardon. And also I saw myself as if in a vision, standing at the head of the stairs, just where my brother had stood, and then hurtling my body down on the bricks. But there was no time for courage. Or shall I say there was no time in Lestat's plan for anything but his plan. Now listen to me, Louis, he said, and he lay down beside me now on the steps, his movement so graceful and so personal that at once it made me think of a lover. I recoiled. But he put his right arm around me and pulled me close to his chest. Never had I been this close to him before. And in the dim light I could see the magnificent radiance of his eye and the unnatural mask of his skin. As I tried to move, he pressed his right fingers against my lips and said, Be still. I am going to drain you now to the very threshold of death, and I want you to be quiet, so quiet that you can almost hear the flow of blood through your veins, so quiet that you can hear the flow of that same blood through mine. It is your consciousness, your will, which must keep you alive. I wanted to struggle, but he pressed so hard with his fingers that he held my entire prone body in check. And as soon as I stopped my abortive attempt at rebellion, he sank his teeth into my neck. The boy's eyes grew huge. He had drawn farther and farther back in his chair as the vampire spoke, and now his face was tense, his eyes narrow, as if he were preparing to weather a blow. "'Have you ever lost a great amount of blood?' asked the vampire. "'Do you know the feeling?' The boy's lips shaped the word, "'No,' but no sound came out. He cleared his throat. "'No!' he said. Candles burned in the upstairs parlor, where he had planned the death of the overseer, and oil lanterns swayed in the breeze on the gallery. All of this light coalesced and began to shimmer, as though a golden presence hovered above me, suspended in the stairwell, softly entangled with the railings, curling and contracting like smoke. Listen, keep your eyes wide, Lestat whispered to me, his lips moving against my neck. I remember that the movement of his lips raised the hair all over my body, sent a shock of sensation through my body that was not unlike the pleasure of passion. He mused. His right finger slightly curled beneath his chin, the first finger appearing to lightly stroke it. The result was that 
within minutes I was weak to paralysis. Panic-stricken, I discovered I could not even will myself to speak. Lestat still held me, of course, and his arm was like the weight of an iron bar. I felt his teeth withdraw with such a keenness that the two puncture wounds seemed enormous, lined with pain. And now he bent over my helpless head and, taking his right hand off me, bit his own wrist. The blood flowed down upon my shirt and coat, and he watched it with a narrow, gleaming eye. It seemed an eternity that he watched it and that shimmer of light now hung behind his head like the backdrop of an apparition. I think that I knew what he meant to do, even before he did it, and I was waiting in my helplessness as if I'd been waiting for years. He pressed his bleeding wrist to my mouth, said firmly, a little impatiently, Lewis, drink, and I did. Steady, Lewis, and hurry, he whispered to me a number of times. I drank, sucking the blood out of the holes, experiencing for the first time since infancy the special pleasure of sucking nourishment, the body focused with the mind upon one vital source. Then something happened. The vampire sat back, a slight frown on his face. How pathetic it is to describe these things which can't truly be described, he said, his voice low almost to a whisper. The boy sat as if frozen. I saw nothing but that light, then, as I drew blood. And then... This next thing, this next thing was sound. A dull roar at first, and then a pounding like the pounding of a drum, growing louder and louder, as if some enormous creature were coming up on one, slowly through a dark and alien forest, pounding as he came, a huge drum, and then there came the pounding of another drum, as if another giant were coming, yards behind him. And each giant, intent on his own drum, gave no notice to the rhythm of the other. The sound grew louder and louder until it seemed to fill not just my hearing but all my senses, to be throbbing in my lips and fingers, in the flesh of my temples, in my veins, above all in my veins, drum, and then the other drum, and then Lestat pulled his wrist free suddenly, and I opened my eyes and checked myself in a moment of reaching for his wrist, grabbing it, forcing it back to my mouth at all costs. I checked myself because I realized that the drum was my heart, and the second drum had been his. The vampire sighed. Do you understand? The boy began to speak, and then he shook his head. No, I mean, I do, he said. I mean, I... Of course, said the vampire, looking away. Wait, wait, said the boy in a welter of excitement. The tape is almost gone. I have to turn it over. The vampire watched patiently as he changed it. What happened then? the boy asked. His face was moist, and he wiped it hurriedly with his handkerchief. I saw as a vampire, said the vampire, his voice now slightly detached. It seemed almost distracted. Then he drew himself up. Lestat was standing again at the foot of the stairs, and I saw him as I could not possibly have seen him before. He had seemed white to me before, starkly white, so that in the night he was almost luminous. And now I saw him filled with his own life and own blood. He was radiant, 
not luminous. And then I saw that not only Lestat had changed, but all things had changed. It was as if I had only just been able to see colors and shapes for the first time. I was so enthralled with the buttons on Lestat's black coat that I looked at nothing else for a long time. Then Lestat began to laugh, and I heard his laughter as I had never heard anything before. His heart I still heard like the beating of a drum, and now came this metallic laughter. It was confusing, each sound running into the next sound, like the mingling reverberations of bells, until I learned to separate the sounds, and then they overlapped, each soft but distinct, increasing but discreet peals of laughter. The vampire smiled with delight. Peals of bells. Stop looking at my buttons, Lestat said. Go out there into the trees. Rid yourself of all the human waste in your body, and don't fall so madly in love with the night that you lose your way. That, of course, was a wise command. When I saw the moon on the flagstones, I became so enamored with it that I must have spent an hour there. I passed my brother's oratory without so much as a thought of him, and standing among the cottonwood and oaks I heard the night as if it were a chorus of whispering women, all beckoning me to their breasts. As for my body, it was not yet totally converted, and as soon as I became the least accustomed to the sounds and sights, it began to ache. All my human fluids were being forced out of me. I was dying as a human, yet completely alive as a vampire. And with my awakened senses, I had to preside over the death of my body with a certain discomfort, and then, finally, fear. I ran back up the steps to the parlor, where Lestat was already at work on the plantation papers, going over the expenses and profits for the last year. You're a rich man, he said to me when I came in. Something's happening to me, I shouted. You're dying, that's all, don't be a fool. Don't you have any oil lamps, all this money, and you can't afford whale oil except for that lantern? Bring me that lantern. Dying, I shouted, dying. It happens to everyone, he persisted, refusing to help me. As I look back on this, I still despise him for it. Not because I was afraid but because he might have drawn my attention to these changes with reverence. He might have calmed me and told me I might watch my death with the same fascination with which I had watched and felt the night, but he didn't. Lestat was never the vampire I am. Not at all. The vampire did not say this boastfully. He said it as if he would truly have had it otherwise. Alors, he sighed, I was dying fast, which meant that my capacity for fear was diminishing as rapidly. I simply regret I was not more attentive to the process. Lestat was being a perfect idiot. Oh, for the love of hell, he began shouting, do you realize I've made no provision for you? What a fool I am. I was tempted to say, yes, you are, but I didn't. You'll have to bed down with me this morning. I haven't prepared you a coffin. The vampire laughed. The coffin struck such a chord of terror in me, I think it absorbed all the capacity for terror I had left. Then came only my mild alarm at having to share a coffin with Lestat. He was in my father's bedroom, meantime, telling the old man good-bye, that he would return in the morning. But where do you go? Why must you live by such a schedule? the old man demanded, and Lestat became impatient. Before this he'd been gracious to the old man, almost to the point of sickening one. But now he became a bully. I take care of you, don't I? I've put a better roof over your head than you ever put over mine. If I want to sleep all day and drink all night, I'll do it, damn you. The old man started to whine. Only my peculiar state of emotions and most unusual feeling of exhaustion kept me from disapproving. 
I was watching the scene through the open door, enthralled with the colors of the counterpane and the positive riot of color in the old man's face. His blue veins pulsed beneath his pink and grayish flesh. I found even the yellow of his teeth appealing to me, and became almost hypnotized by the quivering of his lip. Such a son, such a son, he said, never suspecting, of course, the true nature of his son. All right, then, go. I know you keep a woman somewhere. You go to see her as soon as her husband leaves in the morning. Give me my rosary. What's happened to my rosary? Lestat said something blasphemous and gave him the rosary. But, the boy started. Yes, said the vampire. I'm afraid I don't allow you to ask enough questions. I was going to ask. Rosaries have crosses on them, don't they? Oh, the rumor about crosses, the vampire laughed. You refer to our being afraid of crosses? Unable to look on them, I thought, said the boy. Nonsense, my friend, sheer nonsense. I can look on anything I like, and I rather like looking on crucifixes in particular. And what about the rumor about keyholes, that you can become steam and go through them? I wish I could laughed the vampire. How positively delightful! I should like to pass through all manner of different keyholes and feel the tickle of their peculiar shapes. No, he shook his head, that is, how would you say today? Bullshit? The boy laughed, despite himself. Then his face grew serious. You mustn't be so shy with me, the vampire said. What is it? The story about... "'Stakes through the heart,' said the boy, his cheeks coloring slightly. "'The same,' said the vampire. "'Bull-shit,' he said, carefully articulating both syllables, so that the boy smiled. "'No magical power whatsoever. "'Why don't you smoke one of your cigarettes? "'I see you have them in your shirt pocket.' "'Oh, thank you,' the boy said, as if it were a marvelous suggestion. But once he had the cigarette to his lips, his hands were trembling so badly that he mangled the first fragile book match. "'Allow me,' said the vampire. And taking the book, he quickly put a lighted match to the boy's cigarette. The boy inhaled, his eyes on the vampire's fingers. Now the vampire withdrew across the table with a soft rustling of garments. "'There's an ashtray on the basin,' he said." and the boy moved nervously to get it. He stared at the few butts in it for a moment, and then seeing the small waste-basket beneath, he emptied the ashtray and quickly set it on the table. His fingers left damp marks on the cigarette when he put it down. "'Is this your room?' he asked. "'No,' answered the vampire. "'Just a room.' "'What happened then?' the boy asked. The vampire appeared to be watching the smoke gather beneath the overhead bulb. Ah, we went back to New Orleans post-haste, he said. Lestat had his coffin in a miserable room near the ramparts. And did you get into the coffin? I had no choice. I begged Lestat to let me stay in the closet, but he laughed, astonished. Don't you know what you are, he asked. "'But is it magical? Must it have this shape?' I pleaded, only to hear him laugh again. I couldn't bear the idea, but as we argued I realized I had no real fear. It was a strange realization. All my life I'd feared closed places. Born and bred in French houses with lofty ceilings and floor-length windows, I had a dread of being enclosed. I felt uncomfortable even in the confessional in church. It was a normal enough fear. And now I realized, as I protested to Lestat, I did not actually feel this any more. I was simply remembering it, hanging on to it from habit, from a deficiency of ability to recognize my present and exhilarating freedom. You're carrying on badly, Lestat said finally, and it's almost dawn. I should let you die. You will die, you know. The sun will destroy the blood I've given you, in every tissue, every vein. But you shouldn't be feeling this fear at all. I think you're like a man who loses an arm or a leg and keeps insisting that he can feel pain where the arm or leg used to be. 
Well, that was positively the most intelligent and useful thing Lestat ever said in my presence, and it brought me around at once. Now I'm getting into the coffin, he finally said to me in his most disdainful tone, and you will get in on top of me if you know what's good for you. And I did. I lay face down on him, utterly confused by my absence of dread and filled with a distaste for being so close to him, handsome and intriguing though he was. And he shut the lid. Then I asked him if I was completely dead. My body was tingling and itching all over. No, you're not, then, he said. When you are, you'll only hear and see it changing and feel nothing. You should be dead by tonight. Go to sleep. Was he right? Were you dead when you woke up? Yes. Changed, I should say as obviously I am alive. My body was dead. It was some time before it became absolutely cleansed of the fluids and matter it no longer needed, but it was dead. And with the realization of it came another stage in my divorce from human emotions. The first thing which became apparent to me, even while Lestat and I were loading the coffin into a hearse and stealing another coffin from a mortuary, was that I did not like Lestat at all. I was far from being his equal yet, but I was infinitely closer to him than I had been before the death of my body. I can't really make this clear to you, for the obvious reason that you are now as I was before my body died. You cannot understand. But before I died, Lestat was absolutely the most overwhelming experience I'd ever had. Your cigarette has become one long cylindrical ash. Oh, the boy quickly ground the filter into the glass. You mean that when the gap was closed between you, he lost his... Spell? he asked, his eyes quickly fixed on the vampire, his hands now producing a cigarette and match much more easily than before. Yes, that's correct, said the vampire with obvious pleasure. The trip back to Pointe du Lac was thrilling, and the constant chatter of Lestat was positively the most boring and disheartening thing I experienced. Of course, as I said, I was far from being his equal. I had my dead limbs to contend with, to use his comparison. And I learned that on that very night when I had to make my first kill. This ends Disc 1. Interview with the Vampire, Disc 2. The vampire reached across the table now and gently brushed an ash from the boy's lapel, and the boy stared at his withdrawing hand in alarm. Excuse me, said the vampire. I didn't mean to frighten you. Excuse me, said the boy. I just got the impression suddenly that your arm was abnormally long. You reached so far without moving. No said the vampire, resting his hands again on his crossed knees. I moved forward much too fast for you to see. It was an illusion. You moved forward? But you didn't. You were sitting just as you are now, with your back against the chair. No, repeated the vampire firmly. I moved forward, as I told you. Here, I'll do it again. And he did it again. And the boy stared with the same mixture of confusion and fear. You still didn't see it, said the vampire. But you see, if you look at my outstretched arm now, it's really not remarkably long at all. And he raised his arm, first finger pointing heavenward, as if he were an angel about to give the word of the Lord. You have experienced a fundamental difference between the way you see and I see. My gesture appeared slow and somewhat languid to me, and the sound of my finger brushing your coat was quite audible. Well, I didn't mean to frighten you, I confess. 
but perhaps you can see from this that my return to Pointe du Lac was a feast of new experiences, the mere swaying of a tree branch in the wind a delight. Yes, said the boy, but he was still visibly shaken. The vampire eyed him for a moment, and then he said, I was telling you about your first kill, said the boy. Yes. I should say first, however, that the plantation was in a state of pandemonium. The overseer's body had been found, and no one could explain the blind old man's presence. And no one had been able to find me in New Orleans. My sister had contacted the police, and several of them were at Pointe du Lac when I arrived. It was already quite dark, naturally, and Lestat quickly explained to me that I must not let the police see me in even minimal light, especially not with my body in its present remarkable state. So I talked to them in the Avenue of Oaks before the plantation house, ignoring their requests that we go inside. I explained I'd been to Pointe du Lac the night before, and the blind old man was my guest. As for the overseer, he had not been here, but had gone to New Orleans on business. After that was settled, during which my new detachment served me admirably, I had the problem of the plantation itself. My slaves were in a state of complete confusion, and no work had been done all day. We had a large plant then for the making of indigo dye, and the overseer's management had been most important. But I had several extremely intelligent slaves, who might have done his job just as well a long time before, if I had recognized their intelligence and not feared their African appearance and manner. I studied them clearly now, and gave the management of things over to them. To the best I gave the overseer's house on a promise. Two of the young women were brought back into the house from the fields to care for Lestat's father, and I told them I wanted as much privacy as possible, and they would all of them be rewarded not only for service but for leaving me and Lestat absolutely alone. I did not realize at the time that these slaves would be the first and possibly the only ones, to ever suspect that Lestat and I were not ordinary creatures. I failed to realize that their experience with the supernatural was far greater than that of white men. In my own inexperience I still thought of them as childlike savages, barely domesticated by slavery. I made a bad mistake. But let me keep to my story. I was going to tell you about my first kill. Lestat bungled it with his characteristic lack of common sense. Bungled it? asked the boy. I should never have started with human beings. But this was something I had to learn by myself. Lestat had us plunge headlong into the swamps right after the police and the slaves were settled. It was very late, and the slave cabins were completely dark. We soon lost sight of the lights of Pointe du Lac altogether, and I became very agitated. It was the same thing again, remembered fears, confusion. Lestat, had he any native intelligence, might have explained things to me patiently and gently, that I had no need to fear the swamps, that to snakes and insects I was utterly invulnerable, and that I must concentrate on my new ability to see in total darkness. Instead, he harassed me with condemnations. He was concerned only with our victims, with finishing my initiation and getting on with it. And when we finally came upon our victims, he rushed me into action. They were a small camp of runaway slaves. Lestat had visited them before and picked off perhaps a fourth of their number by watching from the dark for one of them to leave the fire or by taking them in their sleep. They knew absolutely nothing of Lestat's presence. We had to watch for well over an hour before one of the men, they were all men, finally left the clearing and came just a few paces into the trees. He unhooked his pants now and attended to an ordinary physical necessity. 
and as he turned to go, Lestat shook me and said, Take him. The vampire smiled at the boy's wide eyes. I think I was about as horror-struck as you would be, he said. But I didn't know then that I might kill animals instead of humans. I said quickly I could not possibly take him. And the slave heard me speak. He turned his back to the distant fire and peered into the dark. Then quickly and silently he drew a long knife out of his belt. He was naked except for the pants and the belt, a tall, strong-armed, sleek young man. He said something in the French patois, and then he stepped forward. I realized that though I saw him clearly in the dark, he could not see us. Lestat stepped in back of him with a swiftness that baffled me and got a hold around his neck while he pinned his left arm. The slave cried out and tried to throw Lestat off. He sank his teeth now, and the slave froze as if from snakebite. He sank to his knees, and Lestat fed fast as the other slaves came running. You sicken me, he said when he got back to me. It was as if we were black insects, utterly camouflaged in the night, watching the slaves move, oblivious to us, discover the wounded man, drag him back, fan out in the foliage, searching for the attacker. Come on, we have to get another one before they all return to camp, he said. And quickly we set off after one man who was separated from the others. I was still terribly agitated. Convinced I couldn't bring myself to attack, and feeling no urge to do so. There were many things, as I mention, which Lestat might have said and done. He might have made the experience rich in so many ways. But he did not. What could he have done? the boy asked. What do you mean? Killing is no ordinary act, said the vampire. One doesn't simply glut oneself on blood, he shook his head. It is the experience of another's life, for certain, and often the experience of the loss of that life, through the blood, slowly. It is again and again the experience of the loss of my own life, which I experienced when I sucked the blood from Lestat's wrist and felt his heart pound with my heart. It is again and again a celebration of that experience, because for vampires that is the ultimate experience. He said this most seriously, as if he were arguing with someone who held a different view. I don't think Lestat ever appreciated that, though how he could not, I don't know. Let me say he appreciated something, but very little, I think, of what there is to know. In any event, he took no pains to remind me now of what I'd felt when I clamped onto his wrist for life itself and wouldn't let it go, or to pick and choose a place for me where I might experience my first kill with some measure of quiet and dignity. He rushed headlong through the encounter, as if it was something to put behind us as quickly as possible, like so many yards of the road. Once he had caught the slave, he gagged him and held him, baring his neck. Do it, he said. You can't turn back now. Overcome with revulsion and weak with frustration, I obeyed. I knelt beside the bent, struggling man, and clamping both my hands on his shoulders, I went into his neck. My teeth had only just begun to change, and I had to tear his flesh, not puncture it. But once the wound was made, the blood flowed. And once that happened, once I was locked onto it, drinking, all else vanished. Lestat and the swamp and the noise of the distant camp meant nothing. Lestat might have been an insect, buzzing, lighting, then vanishing in significance. The sucking mesmerized me. The warm struggling of the man was soothing to the tension of my hands. 
and there came the beating of the drum again, which was the drumbeat of his heart. Only this time it beat in perfect rhythm with the drumbeat of my own heart, the two resounding in every fiber of my being, until the beat began to grow slower and slower, so that each was a soft rumble that threatened to go on without end. I was drowsing falling into weightlessness, and then Lestat pulled me back. He's dead, you idiot, he said with his characteristic charm and tact. You don't drink after they're dead, understand that. I was in a frenzy for a moment, not myself, insisting to him that the man's heart still beat, and I was in an agony to clamp on to him again. I ran my hands over his chest, then grabbed at his wrists. I would have cut into his wrist if Lestat hadn't pulled me to my feet and slapped my face. This slap was astonishing. It was not painful in the ordinary way. It was a sensational shock of another sort, a rapping of the senses so that I spun in confusion and found myself helpless and staring, my back against a cypress, the night pulsing with insects in my ears. You'll die if you do that. Lestat was saying. He'll suck you right down into death with him if you cling to him in death. And now you've drunk too much. Besides, you'll be ill. His voice grated on me. I had the urge to throw myself on him suddenly, but I was feeling just what he'd said. There was a grinding pain in my stomach, as if some whirlpool there were sucking my insides into itself. It was the blood passing too rapidly into my own blood but I didn't know it. Lestat moved through the night now like a cat, and I followed him, my head throbbing, this pain in my stomach no better when we reached the house of Pont du Lac. As we sat at the table in the parlor, Lestat dealing a game of solitaire on the polished wood, I sat there staring at him with contempt. He was mumbling nonsense. I would get used to killing, he said. It would be nothing. I must not allow myself to be shaken. I was reacting too much as if the mortal coil had not been shaken off. I would become accustomed to things all too quickly. Do you think so? I asked him finally. I really had no interest in his answer. I understood now the difference between us. For me, the experience of killing had been cataclysmic. So had that of sucking Lestat's wrist. These experiences so overwhelmed and so changed my view of everything around me, from the picture of my brother on the parlor wall to the sight of a single star in the topmost pane of the French window, that I could not imagine another vampire taking them for granted. I was altered. Permanently, I knew it. And what I felt most profoundly for everything, even the sound of the playing cards being laid down one by one upon the shining rows of the solitaire, was respect. Lestat felt the opposite. Or he felt nothing. He was the sow's ear out of which nothing fine could be made. As boring as a mortal, as trivial and unhappy as a mortal, he chattered over the game, belittling my experience, utterly locked against the possibility of any experience of his own. By morning I realized that I was his complete superior, and I had been sadly cheated in having him for a teacher. He must guide me through the necessary lessons, if there were any more real lessons, and I must tolerate in him a frame of mind which was blasphemous to life itself. I felt cold towards him. I had no contempt in superiority, only a hunger for new experience, for that which was beautiful and as devastating as my kill. And I saw that if I were to maximize every experience available to me, I must exert my own powers over my learning. Lestat was of no use. It was well past midnight when I finally rose out of the chair and went out on the gallery. The moon was large over the cypresses, and the candlelight poured from the open doors. 
The thick plastered pillars and walls of the house had been freshly whitewashed, the floorboards freshly swept, and a summer rain had left the night clean and sparkling with drops of water. I leaned against the end pillar of the gallery, my head touching the soft tendrils of a jasmine which grew there in constant battle with a wisteria, and I thought of what lay before me throughout the world and throughout time and resolved to go about it delicately and reverently, learning that from each thing which would take me best to another. What this meant I wasn't sure myself. Do you understand me when I say I did not wish to rush headlong into experience, that what I'd felt as a vampire was far too powerful to be wasted? Yes, said the boy eagerly. It sounds as if it was like being in love. The vampire's eyes gleamed. That's correct. It is like love. He smiled. And I tell you my frame of mind that night, so you can know there are profound differences between vampires, and how I came to take a different approach from Lestat. You must understand I did not snub him because he did not appreciate his experience. I simply could not understand how such feelings could be wasted. But then Lestat did something which was to show me a way to go about my learning. He had more than a casual appreciation of the wealth at pointe lac He'd been much pleased by the beauty of the china used for his father's supper, and he liked the feel of the velvet drapes, and he traced the patterns of the carpets with his toe. And now he took from one of the china closets a crystal glass and said, I do miss glasses. Only he said this with an impish delight that caused me to study him with a hard eye. I disliked him intensely. I want to show you a little trick, he said, that is, if you like glasses. And after setting it on the card table, he came out on the gallery where I stood and changed his manner again into that of a stalking animal, eyes piercing the dark beyond the lights of the house, peering down under the arching branches of the oaks. In an instant he had vaulted the railing and dropped softly on the dirt below, and then lunged into the blackness to catch something in both his hands. When he stood before me with it, I gasped to see it was a rat. "'Don't be such a damned idiot,' he said. "'Haven't you ever seen a rat?' It was a huge, struggling field rat with a long tail. He held its neck so it couldn't bite. Rats can be quite nice, he said. And he took the rat to the wine glass, slashed its throat, and filled the glass rapidly with blood. The rat then went hurtling over the gallery railing, and Lestat held the wine glass to the candle triumphantly. You may well have to live off rats from time to time, so wipe that expression off your face, he said. Rats, chicken, cattle. Traveling by ship, you damn well better live off rats if you don't wish to cause such a panic on board that they search your coffin. You damn well better keep the ship clean of rats. And then he sipped the blood as delicately as if it were burgundy. He made a slight face. It gets cold so fast. Do you mean, then, we can live from animals? I asked. Yes. He drank it all down and then casually threw the glass at the fireplace. I stared at the fragments. You don't mind, do you? He gestured to the broken glass with a sarcastic smile. I surely hope you don't, because there's nothing much you can do about it if you do mind. I can throw you and your father out of Pointe-du-Lac, if I mind, I said. I believe this was my first show of temper. Why would you do that? he asked with mock alarm. You don't know everything yet, do you? He was laughing then and walking slowly about the room. He ran his fingers over the satin finish of the spinet. Do you play? he asked. I said something like, don't touch it, and he laughed at me. I'll touch it if I like, he said. You don't know, for example, all the ways you can die, and dying now would be such a calamity, wouldn't it? 
There must be someone else in the world to teach me these things, I said. Certainly you're not the only vampire. And your father, he's perhaps seventy. You couldn't have been a vampire long, so someone must have instructed you. And do you think you can find other vampires by yourself? They might see you coming, my friend, but you won't see them. No, I don't think you have much choice about things at this point, friend. I'm your teacher, and you need me, and there isn't much you can do about it either way, and we both have people to provide for. My father needs a doctor, and then there is the matter of your mother and sister. Don't get any mortal notions about telling them you are a vampire. Just provide for them and for my father. Which means that tomorrow night you had better kill fast, and then attend to the business of your plantation. Now to bed. We both sleep in the same room. It makes for far less risk. No, you secure the bedroom for yourself, I said. I have no intention of staying in the same room with you. He became furious. Don't do anything stupid, Lewis, I warn you. There's nothing you can do to defend yourself once the sun rises. Nothing. Separate rooms mean separate security, double precautions, and double chance of notice. He then said a score of things to frighten me into complying. But he might as well have been talking to the walls. I watched him intently, but I didn't listen to him. He appeared frail and stupid to me. A man made of dried twigs with a thin, carping voice. I can sleep alone, I said, and gently put my hand around the candle flames one by one. It's almost morning, he insisted. So lock yourself in, I said, embracing my coffin, hoisting it and carrying it down the brick stairs. I could hear the locks snapping on the French doors above, the swoosh of the drapes. The sky was pale, but still sprinkled with stars, and another light rain blew now on the breeze from the river, speckling the flagstones. I opened the door of my brother's oratory, shoving back the roses and thorns which had almost sealed it, and set the coffin on the stone floor before the prie dieu. I could almost make out the images of the saints on the walls. Paul, I said softly, addressing my brother, for the first time in my life I feel nothing for you, nothing for your death, and for the first time I feel everything for you. Feel the sorrow of your loss as if I never before knew feeling. You see, the vampire turned toward the boy. For the first time now, I was fully and completely a vampire. I shut the wood blinds flat upon the small barred windows and bolted the door. Then I climbed into the satin-lined coffin, barely able to see the gleam of cloth in the darkness, and locked myself in. That is how I became a vampire. And there you were, said the boy after a pause, with another vampire you hated. But I had to stay with him, answered the vampire. As I've told you, he had me at a great disadvantage. He hinted there was much I didn't know and must know, and that he alone could tell me. But in fact, the main part of what he did teach me was practical, and not so difficult to figure out for oneself. How we might travel, for instance, by ship, having our coffins transported for us as though they contained the remains of loved ones being sent here or there for burial. How no one would dare to open such a coffin, and we might rise from it at night to clean the ship of rats, things of this nature. And then there were the shops and businessmen he knew who admitted us well after hours to outfit us in the finest Paris fashions, and those agents willing to transact financial matters in restaurants and cabarets. And in all of these mundane matters Lestat was an adequate teacher. What manner of man he'd been in life, I couldn't tell, and didn't care. But he was, for all appearances, of the same class now as myself, which meant little to me, except that it made our lives run a little more smoothly than they might have otherwise. He had impeccable taste, though my library to him was a pile of dust, and he seemed more than once to be infuriated by the sight of my reading a book or writing some observations in a journal. That mortal nonsense, he would say to me. 
while at the same time spending so much of my money to splendidly furnish Pointe du Lac that even I, who cared nothing for the money, was forced to wince. And in entertaining visitors at Pointe du Lac, those hapless travellers who came up the river road by horseback or carriage begging accommodations for the night, sporting letters of introduction from other planters or officials in New Orleans, to these he was so gentle and polite that it made things far easier for me, who found myself hopelessly locked to him, and jarred over and over by his viciousness. "'But he didn't harm these men?' asked the boy. "'Oh, yes, often he did. "'But I'll tell you a little secret, if I may, "'which applies not only to vampires, but to generals, soldiers, and kings.' Most of us would much rather see somebody die than be the object of rudeness under our roofs. Strange, yes, but very true, I assure you. That Lestat hunted for mortals every night, I knew. But had he been savage and ugly to my family, my guests, and my slaves, I couldn't have endured it. He was not. He seemed particularly to delight in the visitors, but he said we must spare no expense where our families were concerned. And he seemed to me to push luxury upon his father to an almost ludicrous point. The old blind man must be told constantly how fine and expensive were his bed jackets and robes, and what imported draperies had just been fixed to his bed, and what French and Spanish wines we had in the cellar, and how much the plantation yielded even in bad years, when the coast talked of abandoning the indigo production altogether and going into sugar. But then at other times he would bully the old man, as I mentioned. He would erupt into such rage that the old man whimpered like a child. "'Don't I take care of you in baronial splendor?' Lestat would shout at him. "'Don't I provide for your every want? "'Stop whining to me about going to church or to old friends. "'Such nonsense. "'Your old friends are dead. "'Why don't you die and leave me in my bankroll in peace?' "'The old man would cry softly that these things meant so little to him in old age. "'He would have been content on his little farm forever.' I wanted often to ask him later, where was this farm? From where did you come to Louisiana, to get some clue to that place where Lestat might have known another vampire? But I didn't dare to bring these things up, lest the old man start crying and Lestat become enraged. But these fits were no more frequent than periods of near obsequious kindness, when Lestat would bring his father's supper on a tray and feed him patiently, while talking of the weather and the New Orleans news and the activities of my mother and sister. It was obvious that a great gulf existed between father and son, both in education and refinement. But how it came about I could not quite guess and from this whole matter I achieved a somewhat consistent detachment. Existence, as I've said, was possible. There was always the promise behind his mocking smile that he knew great things, or terrible things, had commerce with levels of darkness I could not possibly guess at. And all the time he belittled me and attacked me for my love of the senses, my reluctance to kill, and the near swoon which killing could produce in me. He laughed uproariously when I discovered that I could see myself in a mirror and that crosses had no effect upon me, and would taunt me with sealed lips when I asked about God or the devil. I'd like to meet the devil some night, he said once with a malignant smile. I'd chase him from here to the wilds of the Pacific. I am the devil. And when I was aghast at this, he went into peals of laughter. But what happened was simply that in my distaste for him, I came to ignore and suspect him, and yet to study him with a detached fascination. Sometimes I'd find myself staring at his wrist, from which I'd drawn my vampire life and I would fall into such a stillness that my mind seemed to leave my body, or rather my body to become my mind. And then he would see me and stare at me with a stubborn ignorance of what I felt and longed to know, and reaching over, shake me roughly out of it. 
I bore this with an overt detachment unknown to me in mortal life, and came to understand this as a part of vampire nature, that I might sit at home at Pointe du Lac and think for hours of my brother's mortal life, and see it short and rounded in unfathomable darkness, understanding now the vain and senseless wasting passion with which I'd mourned his loss, and turned on other mortals like a maddened animal. All that confusion was then like dancers frenzied in a fog. And now, now, in this strange vampire nature, I felt a profound sadness. But I did not brood over this. Let me not give you that impression, for brooding would have been to me the most terrible waste. But rather I looked around me at all the mortals that I knew, and saw all life as precious, condemning all fruitless guilt and passion that would let it slip through the fingers like sand. It was only now, as a vampire, that I did come to know my sister, forbidding her the plantation for the city life which she so needed in order to know her own time of life and her own beauty, and come to marry, not brood for our lost brother, or my going away, or become a nursemaid for our mother. And I provided for them all they might need or want, finding even the most trivial request worth my immediate attention. My sister laughed at the transformation in me when we would meet at night and I would take her from our flat out the narrow wooden streets to walk along the tree-lined levee in the moonlight, savoring the orange blossoms and the caressing warmth, talking for hours of her most secret thoughts and dreams, those little fantasies she dared to tell no one and would even whisper to me when we sat in the dim-lit parlor entirely alone and I would see her sweet and palpable before me, a shimmering, precious creature soon to grow old, soon to die, soon to lose these moments that in their intangibility promised to us wrongly, wrongly, an immortality, as if it were our very birthright, which we could not come to grasp the meaning of until this time of middle life when we looked on only as many years ahead as already lay behind us, when every moment, every moment, must be first known and then savored. It was detachment that made this possible, a sublime loneliness with which Lestat and I moved through the world of mortal men, and all material troubles passed from us. I should tell you the practical nature of it, Lestat had always known how to steal from victims chosen for sumptuous dress and other promising signs of extravagance. But the great problems of shelter and secrecy had been for him a terrible struggle. I suspected that beneath his gentleman's veneer he was painfully ignorant of the most simple financial matters. But I was not. And so he could acquire cash at any moment and I could invest it. If he were not picking the pocket of a dead man in an alley, he was at the greatest gambling tables in the richest salons of the city, using his vampire keenness to suck gold and dollars and deeds of property from young planters' sons who found him deceptive in his friendship and alluring in his charm. But this had never given him the life he wanted, and so for that he had ushered me into the preternatural world, that he might acquire an investor and manager, for whom these skills of mortal life became most valuable in this life after. But let me describe New Orleans, as it was then, and as it was to become, so you can understand how simple our lives were. There was no city in America like New Orleans, it was filled not only with the French and Spanish of all classes who had formed in part its peculiar aristocracy, but later with immigrants of all kinds, the Irish and the German in particular. Then there were not only the black slaves, yet unhomogenized and fantastical in their different tribal garb and manners, but the great growing class of the free people of color, 
those marvelous people of our mixed blood and that of the islands, who produced a magnificent and unique cast of craftsmen, artists, poets, and renowned feminine beauty. And then there were the Indians, who covered the levee on summer days selling herbs and crafted wares. And drifting through all, through this medley of languages and colors, were the people of the port, the sailors of ships who came in great waves to spend their money in the cabarets, to buy for the night the beautiful women, both dark and light, to dine on the best of Spanish and French cooking, and drink the imported wines of the world. Then add to these, within years after my transformation, the Americans, who built the city upriver from the old French quarter with magnificent Grecian houses which gleamed in the moonlight like temples. And, of course, the planters, always the planters, coming to town with their families in shining landaus, to buy evening gowns and silver and gems, to crowd the narrow streets on the way to the old French opera house and the Théâtre d'Orléans and the Saint-Louis Cathedral, from whose open doors came the chants of high mass over the crowds of the Place d'Armes on Sundays, over the noise and bickering of the French market, over the silent ghostly drift of the ships along the raised waters of the Mississippi, which flowed against the levee above the ground of New Orleans itself, so that the ships appeared to float against the sky. This was New Orleans, a magical and magnificent place to live, in which a vampire, richly dressed and gracefully walking through the pools of light of one gas lamp after another, might attract no more notice in the evening than hundreds of other exotic creatures, if he attracted any at all, if any one stopped to whisper behind a fan, That man, how pale, how he gleams, how he moves, it's not natural. A city in which a vampire might be gone before the words had even passed the lips, seeking out the alleys in which he could see like a cat, the darkened bars in which sailors slept with their heads on the table, great high-ceilinged hotel rooms where a lone figure might sit, her feet upon an embroidered cushion, her legs covered with a lace counterpane, her head bent under the tarnished light of a single candle, never seeing the great shadow move across the plaster flowers of the ceiling, never seeing the long long white finger reached to press the fragile flame. Remarkable, if for nothing else because of this, that all of those men and women who stayed for any reason left behind them some monument, some structure of marble and brick and stone that still stands, so that even when the gas lamps went out, and the planes came in, and the office buildings crowded the blocks of Canal Street, something irreducible of beauty and romance remained. Not in every street, perhaps, but in so many that the landscape is for me the landscape of those times always. And walking now in the starlit streets of the quarter or the garden district, I am in those times again. I suppose that is the nature of the monument. Be it a small house or a mansion of Corinthian columns and wrought iron lace. The monument does not say that this or that man walked here. No, that what he felt in one time, in one spot, continues. The moon that rose over New Orleans then still rises. As long as the monuments stand, it still rises. The feeling, at least here and there, it remains the same. The vampire appeared sad. He sighed as if he doubted what he had just said. What was it? he asked suddenly as if he were slightly tired. Yes, money. Lestat and I had to make money. And I was telling you that he could steal. But it was investment afterwards that mattered. What we accumulated we must use. But I go ahead of myself. I killed animals. But I'll get to that in a moment. Lestat killed humans all the time. Sometimes two or three a night, sometimes more. He would drink from one just enough to satisfy a momentary thirst, and then go on to another. 
The better the human, as he would say in his vulgar way, the more he liked it. A fresh young girl, that was his favorite food, the first of the evening. But the triumphant kill for Lestat was a young man. A young man around your age would have appealed to him in particular. Me? the boy whispered. He had leaned forward on his elbows to peer into the vampire's eyes, and now he drew up. Yes, the vampire went on, as if he hadn't observed the boy's change of expression. You see, they represented the greatest loss to Lestat, because they stood on the threshold of the maximum possibility of life. Of course, Lestat didn't understand this himself. I came to understand it. Lestat understood nothing. I shall give you a perfect example of what Lestat liked. Up the river from us was the Frenier plantation, a magnificent spread of land which had great hopes of making a fortune in sugar just shortly after the refining process had been invented. I presume you know sugar was refined in Louisiana. There is something perfect and ironic about it, this land which I loved, producing refined sugar. I mean this more unhappily than I think you know. This refined sugar is a poison. It was like the essence of life in New Orleans, so sweet that it can be fatal, so richly enticing that all other values are forgotten. But as I was saying, upriver from us lived the Freniers, a great old French family which had produced in this generation five young women and one young man. Now three of the young women were destined not to marry, but two were young enough still and all depended upon the young man. He was to manage the plantation as I had done for my mother and sister. He was to negotiate marriages, to put together dowries when the entire fortune of the place rode precariously on the next year's sugar crop. He was to bargain, fight, and keep at a distance the entire material world for the world of Frenier. Lestat decided he wanted him, and when fate alone nearly cheated Lestat, he went wild. He risked his own life to get the Frenier boy, who had become involved in a duel. He had insulted a young Spanish Creole at a ball. The whole thing was nothing, really. But like most young Creoles, this one was willing to die for nothing. They were both willing to die for nothing. The Frenier household was in an uproar. You must understand, Lestat knew this perfectly. Both of us had hunted the Frenier plantation, Lestat for slaves and chicken thieves, and me for animals. You were killing only animals? Yes, but I'll come to that later, as I said. We both knew the plantation, and I had indulged in one of the greatest pleasures of a vampire, that of watching people unbeknownst to them. I knew the Frenier sisters as I knew the magnificent rose-trees around my brother's oratory. They were a unique group of women. Each in her own way was as smart as the brother, and one of them, I shall call her Babette, was not only as smart as her brother, but far wiser. Yet none had been educated to care for the plantation. None understood even the simplest facts about its financial state. All were totally dependent upon young Frenier, and all knew it. And so, larded with their love for him, their passionate belief that he hung the moon, and that any conjugal love they might ever know would only be a pale reflection of their love for him, larded with this was a desperation as strong as the will to survive. If Frenier died in the duel, the plantation would collapse. Its fragile economy... A life of splendor, based on the perennial mortgaging of the next year's crop, was in his hands alone. So you can imagine the panic and misery in the Frenier household the night that the son went to town to fight the appointed duel. And now picture Lestat, gnashing his teeth like a comic opera devil because he was not going to kill the young Frenier. You mean, then, that you felt for the Frenier women? I felt for them totally said the vampire. Their position was agonizing, and I felt for the boy. That night he locked himself in his father's study and made a will. He knew full well that if he fell under the rapier at four a.m. the next morning his family would fall with him. 
He deplored his situation and yet could do nothing to help it. To run out on the duel would not only mean social ruin for him, but would probably have been impossible. The other young man would have pursued him until he was forced to fight. When he left the plantation at midnight, he was staring into the face of death itself with the character of a man who, having only one path to follow, has resolved to follow it with perfect courage. He would either kill the Spanish boy or die. It was unpredictable despite all his skill. His face reflected a depth of feeling and wisdom I'd never seen on the face of any of Lestat's struggling victims. I had my first battle with Lestat, then and there. I'd prevented him from killing the boy for months, and now he meant to kill him before the Spanish boy could. We were on horseback, racing after the young Frenier towards New Orleans. Lestat bent on overtaking him. I bent on overtaking Lestat. Well, the duel, as I told you, was scheduled for 4 a.m. On the edge of the swamp, just beyond the city's northern gate. And arriving there just shortly before four, we had precious little time to return to pont du lac which meant our own lives were in danger. I was incensed at Lestat as never before, and he was determined to get the boy. Give him his chance, I was insisting, getting hold of Lestat before he could approach the boy. It was midwinter, bitter cold and damp in the swamps, one volley of icy rain after another sweeping the clearing where the duel was to be fought. Of course, I did not fear these elements, in the sense that you might. They did not numb me, nor threaten me with mortal shivering or illness. But vampires feel cold as acutely as humans, and the blood of the kill is often the rich, sensual alleviation of that cold. But what concerned me that morning was not the pain I felt, but the excellent cover of darkness these elements provided, which made Frenier extremely vulnerable to Lestat's attack. All he need do would be step away from his two friends towards the swamp, and Lestat might take him. And so I physically grappled with Lestat. I held him. But towards all this you had detachment, distance. Hmm, the vampire sighed. Yes, I had it. And with it a supremely resolute anger. To glut himself upon the life of an entire family was to me Lestat's supreme act of utter contempt and disregard for all he should have seen with a vampire's depth. So I held him in the dark where he spit at me and cursed at me. And young Frenier took his raper from his friend and second and went out on the slick, wet grass to meet his opponent. There was a brief conversation. Then the duel commenced. In moments it was over. Frenier had mortally wounded the other boy with a swift thrust to the chest. And he knelt in the grass, bleeding, dying, shouting something unintelligible at Frenier. The victor simply stood there. Everyone could see there was no sweetness in the victory. Frenier looked on death as if it were an abomination. His companions advanced with their lanterns, urging him to come away as soon as possible and leave the dying man to his friends. Meantime the wounded one would allow no one to touch him. And then, as Frenier's group turned to go, the three of them walking heavily towards their horses, the man on the ground drew a pistol. Perhaps I alone could see this in the powerful dark, but in any event I shouted to Frenier as I ran towards the gun, and this was all Lestat needed. While I was lost in my clumsiness, distracting Frenier and going for the gun itself, Lestat, with his years of experience and superior speed, grabbed the young man and spirited him into the cypresses. I doubt his friends even knew what had happened. The pistol had gone off, the wounded man had collapsed, and I was tearing through the near-frozen marshes, shouting for Lestat. Then I saw him. Frenier lay sprawled over the knobbed roots of a cypress, his boots deep in the murky water, and Lestat was still bent over him, one hand on the hand of Frenier that still held the foil. 
I went to pull the stat off, and that right hand swung at me with such lightning speed I did not see it, did not know it had struck me, until I found myself in the water also. And, of course, by the time I recovered, Frenier was dead. I saw him as he lay there, his eyes closed, his lips utterly still as if he were just sleeping. Damn you! I began cursing Lestat. And then I started, for the body of Frenier had begun to slip down into the marsh. The water rose over his face and covered him completely. Lestat was jubilant. He reminded me tersely that we had less than an hour to get back to Pointe du Lac, and he swore revenge on me. If I didn't like the life of a southern planter, I'd finish you tonight. I know a way, he threatened me. I ought to drive your horse into the swamps. You'd have to dig yourself a hole and smother. He rode off. Even over all these years, I feel that anger for him like a white-hot liquid filling my veins. I saw, then, what being a vampire meant to him. He was just a killer the boy said, his voice reflecting some of the vampire's emotion. No regard for anything. No. Being a vampire for him meant revenge. Revenge against life itself. Every time he took a life, it was revenge. It was no wonder, then, that he appreciated nothing. The nuances of vampire existence weren't even available to him because he was focused with a maniacal vengeance upon the mortal life he'd left. Consumed with hatred, he looked back. Consumed with envy, nothing pleased him unless he could take it from others, and once having it, he grew cold and dissatisfied, not loving the thing for itself. And so he went after something else. Vengeance blind and sterile and contemptible. But I've spoken to you about the Frenier sisters. It was almost half-past five when I reached their plantation. Dawn would come shortly after six, but I was almost home. I slipped into the upper gallery of their house and saw them all gathered in the parlor. They had never even dressed for bed. The candles burnt low, and they sat already as mourners, waiting for the word. They were all dressed in black, as was their at-home custom, and in the dark the black shapes of their dresses massed together with their raven hair, so that in the glow of the candles their faces appeared as five soft, shimmering apparitions, each uniquely sad each uniquely courageous. Babette's face alone appeared resolute. It was as if she had already made up her mind to take the burdens of Frenier if her brother died, and she had that same expression on her face now, which had been on her brother's when he mounted to leave for the duel. What lay ahead of her was nearly impossible. What lay ahead was the final death of which Lestat was guilty, so I did something then which caused me great risk. I made myself known to her. I did this by playing the light. As you can see, my face is very white and has a smooth, highly reflective surface, rather like that of polished marble. Yes, the boy nodded and appeared flustered. It's very beautiful, actually, said the boy. I wonder if... But what happened? You wonder if I was a handsome man when I was alive, said the vampire. The boy nodded. I was. Nothing structurally has changed in me. Only I never knew that I was handsome. Life whirled about me a wind of petty concerns, as I've said. I gazed at nothing, not even a mirror especially not a mirror, with a free eye. But this is what happened. I stepped near to the pane of glass and let the light touch my face. 
and this I did at a moment when Babette's eyes were turned towards the panes. Then I appropriately vanished. Within seconds all the sisters knew a strange creature had been seen, a ghost-like creature, and the two slave maids steadfastly refused to investigate. I waited out these moments impatiently for just that which I wanted to happen. Babette finally took a candelabrum from a side table, lit the candles, and, scorning everyone's fear, ventured out into the cold gallery alone to see what was there, her sisters hovering in the door like great black birds, one of them crying that the brother was dead and she had indeed seen his ghost. Of course, you must understand that Babette, being as strong as she was, never once attributed what she saw to imagination or to ghosts. I let her come the length of the dark gallery before I spoke to her, and even then I let her see only the vague outline of my body beside one of the columns. "'Tell your sisters to go back,' I whispered to her. "'I come to tell you of your brother. Do as I say.' She was still for an instant, and then she turned to me and strained to see me in the dark. "'I have only a little time. I would not harm you for the world,' I said. And she obeyed. Saying it was nothing, she told them to shut the door, and they obeyed as people obey who not only need a leader but are desperate for one. Then I stepped into the light of Babette's candles. The boy's eyes were wide. He put his hand to his lips. Did you look to her as you do to me? he asked. You ask that with such innocence, said the vampire. Yes, I suppose I certainly did. Only by candlelight I always had a less supernatural appearance, and I made no pretense with her of being an ordinary creature. I have only minutes, I told her at once, but what I have to tell you is of the greatest importance. Your brother fought bravely and won the duel, but wait, you must know now, he is dead. Death was proverbial with him, the thief in the night, about which all his goodness or courage could do nothing. But this is not the principal thing which I came to tell you. It is this. You can rule the plantation, and you can save it. All that is required is that you let no one convince you otherwise. You must assume his position, despite any outcry, any talk of convention, any talk of propriety or common sense. You must listen to nothing. The same land is here now that was here yesterday morning when your brother slept above. Nothing is changed. You must take his place. If you do not, the land is lost and the family is lost. You will be five women on a small pension doomed to live but half or less of what life could give you. Learn what you must know. Stop at nothing until you have the answers. And take my visitation to you to be your courage whenever you waver. You must take the reins of your own life. Your brother is dead. I could see by her face that she had heard every word. She would have questioned me had there been time, but she believed me when I said there was not. Then I used all my skill to leave her so swiftly I appeared to vanish. From the garden I saw her face above in the glow of her candles. I saw her search the dark for me, turning around and around and then I saw her make the sign of the cross and walk back to her sisters within. The vampire smiled. There was absolutely no talk on the river coast of any strange apparition to Babette Frenier. 
But after the first mourning and sad talk of the women left all alone, she became the scandal of the neighborhood because she chose to run the plantation on her own. She managed an immense dowry for her younger sister and was married herself in another year. And Lestat and I almost never exchanged words. Did he go on living at Pointe du Lac? Yes. I could not be certain he'd told me all I needed to know. And great pretense was necessary. My sister was married in my absence, for example, while I had a malarial chill, and something similar overcame me the morning of my mother's funeral. Meantime, Lestat and I sat down to dinner each night with the old man and made nice noises with our knives and forks while he told us to eat everything on our plates and not to drink our wine too fast. With dozens of miserable headaches, I would receive my sister in a darkened bedroom that covers up to my chin, bid her and her husband bear with the dim light on account of the pain in my eyes as I entrusted to them large amounts of money to invest for us all. Fortunately, her husband was an idiot. A harmless one, but an idiot. The product of four generations of marriages between first cousins. But though these things went well, we began to have our problems with the slaves. They were the suspicious ones, and, as I've indicated, Lestat killed anyone and everyone he chose. So there was always some talk of mysterious death on the part of the coast. But it was what they saw of us which began the talk, and I heard it one evening when I was playing a shadow about the slave cabins. Now, let me explain first the character of these slaves. It was only about 1795, Lestat and I having lived there for four years in relative quiet, I investing the money which he acquired, increasing our lands, purchasing apartments and townhouses in New Orleans which I rented, the work of the plantation itself producing little, more a cover for us than an investment. I say our, this is wrong. I never signed anything over to Lestat, and, as you realize, I was still legally alive. But in 1795, these slaves did not have the character which you've seen in films and novels of the South. They were not soft-spoken, brown-skinned people in drab rags who spoke an English dialect. They were Africans, and they were islanders, that is, some of them had come from Santo Domingo. They were very black and totally foreign. They spoke in their African tongues, and they spoke the French patois. And when they sang, they sang African songs, which made the fields exotic and strange, always frightening to me in my mortal life. They were superstitious and had their own secrets and traditions. In short, they had not yet been destroyed as Africans completely. Slavery was the curse of their existence, but they had not been robbed yet of that which had been characteristically theirs. They tolerated the baptism and modest garments imposed on them by the French Catholic laws, but in the evenings they made their cheap fabrics into alluring costumes, made jewelry of animal bones and bits of discarded metal which they polished to look like gold, and the slave cabins of pointe lac were a foreign country, an African coast after dark, in which not even the coldest overseer would want to wander. No fear for the vampire. Not until one summer evening, when, passing for a shadow, I heard through the open doors of the black foreman's cottage a conversation which convinced me that Lestat and I slept in real danger. The slaves knew now we were not ordinary mortals. In hushed tones, the maids told of how, through a crack in the door, they had seen us dine on empty plates with empty silver, lifting empty glasses to our lips, laughing, our faces bleached and ghostly in the candlelight, the blind man a helpless fool in our power. Through keyholes they had seen Lestat's coffin, 
and once he had beaten one of them mercilessly for dawdling by the gallery windows of his room. There is no bed in there. They confided one to the other with nodding heads. He sleeps in the coffin, I know it. They were convinced, on the best of grounds, of what we were. And as for me, they'd seen me, evening after evening, emerge from the oratory, which was now little more than a shapeless mass of brick and vine, layered with flowering wisteria in the spring, wild roses in summer, moss gleaming on the old unpainted shutters, which had never been opened, spiders spinning in the stone arches. Of course I'd pretended to visit it in memory of Paul, but it was clear by their speech they no longer believed such lies. And now they attributed to us not only the deaths of slaves found in the fields and swamps, and also the dead cattle and occasional horses, but all other strange events. Even floods and thunder were the weapons of God in a personal battle waged with Louis and Lestat. But worse still, they were not planning to run away. We were devils, our power inescapable, no, we must be destroyed. And at this gathering, where I became an unseen member, were a number of the Frenier slaves. This meant word would get to the entire coast. And though I firmly believed the entire coast to be impervious to a wave of hysteria, I did not intend to risk notice of any kind. I hurried back to the plantation house to tell Lestat our game of playing planter was over, He'd have to give up his slave whip and golden napkin ring and move into town. He resisted, naturally. His father was gravely ill and might not live. He had no intention of running away from stupid slaves. I'll kill them all, he said calmly, in threes and fours. Some will run away and that will be fine. You're talking madness. The fact is I want you gone from here. You want me gone? You! he sneered. He was building a card palace on the dining-room table with a pack of very fine French cards. You whining coward of a vampire who prowls the night killing alley cats and rats and staring for hours at candles as if they were people and standing in the rain like a zombie until your clothes are drenched and you smell like old wardrobe trunks in attics and have the look of a baffled idiot at the zoo. You've nothing more to tell me, and your insistence on recklessness has endangered us both. I might live in that oratory while this house fell to ruin. I don't care about it, I told him, because this was quite true. But you must have all the things you never had of life, and make of immortality a junk shop in which both of us become grotesque. Now, go look at your father and tell me how long he has to live, for that's how long you stay and only if the slaves don't rise up against us. He told me then to go look at his father myself, since I was the one who was always looking, and I did. The old man was truly dying. I had been spared my mother's death, more or less, because she had died very suddenly on an afternoon. She'd been found with her sewing basket, seated quietly in the courtyard, she had died as one goes to sleep. But now I was seeing a natural death that was too slow with agony and with consciousness. And I'd always liked the old man. He was kindly and simple and made few demands. By day he sat in the sun of the gallery, dozing and listening to the birds. By night any chatter on our part kept him company. He could play chess carefully feeling each piece and remembering the entire state of the board with remarkable accuracy, and though Lestat would never play with him, I did often. Now he lay gasping for breath, his forehead hot and wet, the pillow around him stained with sweat. And as he moaned and prayed for death, Lestat in the other room began to play the spinet. I slammed it shut, barely missing his fingers. "'You won't play while he dies,' I said." The hell I won't, he answered me. I'll play the drum if I like. And taking a great sterling silver platter from a sideboard, he slipped a finger through one of its handles and beat it with a spoon. I told him to stop it or I would make him stop it. And then we both ceased our noise because the old man was calling his name. 
He was saying that he must talk to Lestat now, before he died. I told Lestat to go to him. The sound of his crying was terrible. Why should I? I've cared for him all these years. Isn't that enough? And he drew from his pocket a nail file, and seating himself on the foot of the old man's bed, he began to file his long nails. This ends Disc 2. Interview with the Vampire Disc 3 Meantime, I should tell you that I was aware of slaves about the house. They were watching and listening. I was truly hoping the old man would die within minutes. Once or twice before I dealt with suspicion or doubt on the part of several slaves, but never such a number. I immediately rang for Daniel, the slave to whom I'd given the overseer's house and position. But while I waited for him I could hear the old man talking to Lestat. Lestat, who sat with his legs crossed, filing and filing, one eyebrow arched, his attention on his perfect nails. It was the school, the old man was saying. Oh, I know you remember. What can I say to you, he moaned. You'd better say it, Lestat said, because you're about to die. The old man let out a terrible noise, and I suspect I made some sound of my own. I positively loathed Lestat. I had a mind now to get him out of the room. Well, you know that, don't you? Even a fool like you knows that, said Lestat. You'll never forgive me, will you? Not now, not even after I'm dead, said the old man. I don't know what you're talking about, said Lestat. My patience was becoming exhausted with him, and the old man was becoming more and more agitated. He was begging Lestat to listen to him with a warm heart, the whole thing was making me shudder. Meantime, Daniel had come, and I knew the moment I saw him that everything at Pont du Lac was lost. Had I been more attentive, I'd have seen signs of it before now. He looked at me with eyes of glass. I was a monster to him. Monsieur Lestat's father is very ill, going. I said, ignoring his expression. I want no noise tonight. The slaves must all stay within the cabins. A doctor is on his way. He stared at me as if I were lying. And then his eyes moved curiously and coldly away from me towards the old man's door. His face underwent such a change that I rose at once and looked in the room. It was Lestat. "'slouched at the foot of the bed, his back to the bedpost, "'his nail-file working furiously, "'grimacing in such a way "'that both his great teeth showed prominently. "'The vampire stopped, his shoulders shaking with silent laughter. "'He was looking at the boy, "'and the boy looked shyly at the table. "'But he had already looked, and fixedly, at the vampire's mouth.' He had seen that the lips were of a different texture from the vampire's skin, that they were silken and delicately lined like any person's lips, only deadly white. And he had glimpsed the white teeth. Only the vampire had such a way of smiling that they were not completely revealed, and the boy had not even thought of such teeth until now. "'You can imagine,' said the vampire, "'what this meant.' I had to kill him. You what? said the boy. I had to kill him. He started to run. He would have alarmed everyone. Perhaps it might have been handled some other way, but I had no time. So I went after him, overpowering him. But then, finding myself in the act of doing what I had not done for four years, I stopped. This was a man. He had his bone-handle knife in his hand to defend himself, and I took it from him easily and slipped it into his heart. He sank to his knees at once, his fingers tightening on the blade, bleeding on it. And the sight of the blood, the aroma of it, maddened me. I believe I moaned aloud, 
but I did not reach for him. I would not. Then I remember seeing Lestat's figure emerge in the mirror over the sideboard. Why did you do this? he demanded. I turned to face him, determined he would not see me in this weakened state. The old man was delirious, he went on. He could not understand what the old man was saying. The slaves, they know. You must go to the cabins and keep watch, I managed to say to him. I'll care for the old man. Kill him, Lestat said. Are you mad? I answered. He's your father. I know he's my father, said Lestat. That's why you have to kill him. I can't kill him. If I could, I would have done it a long time ago. Damn him! He wrung his hands. We've got to get out of here. And look what you've done, killing this one. There's no time to lose. His wife will be wailing up here in minutes, or she'll send someone worse. The vampire sighed. This was all true. Lestat was right. I could hear the slaves gathering around Daniel's cottage, waiting for him. Daniel had been brave enough to come into the haunted house alone. When he didn't return, the slaves would panic, become a mob. I told Lestat to calm them, to use all his power as a white master over them, and not to alarm them with horror. And then I went into the bedroom and shut the door. I had then another shock in a night of shocks, because I'd never seen Lestat's father as he was then. He was sitting up now, leaning forward, talking to Lestat, begging Lestat to answer him, telling him he understood his bitterness better than Lestat did himself. And he was a living corpse. Nothing animated his sunken body but a fierce will. Hence his eyes, for their gleam, were all the more sunken in his skull, and his lips in their trembling made his old yellowed mouth more horrible. I sat at the foot of the bed, and suffering to see him so, I gave him my hand. I cannot tell you how much his appearance had shaken me. For when I bring death it is swift and consciousless, leaving the victim as if in enchanted sleep. But this was the slow decay, the body refusing to surrender to the vampire of time which had sucked upon it for years on end. Lestat, he said, just for once don't be hard with me, just for once be for me the boy you were, my son. He said this over and over, the words, my son, my son. And then he said something I could not hear about innocence and innocence destroyed. But I could see that he was not out of his mind, as Lestat thought, but in some terrible state of lucidity. The burden of the past was on him with full force, and the present, which was only death, which he fought with all his will, could do nothing to soften that burden. But I knew I might deceive him if I used all my skill. And bending close to him now, I whispered the word, Father. It was not Lestat's voice. It was mine, a soft whisper. But he calmed at once, and I thought then he might die. But he held my hand as if he were being pulled under by dark ocean waves, and I alone could save him. He talked now of some country teacher, a name garbled, who found in Lestat a brilliant pupil and begged to take him to a monastery for an education. He cursed himself for bringing Lestat home, for burning his books. You must forgive me, Lestat, he cried. I pressed his hand tightly, hoping this might do for some answer. But he repeated this again. You have it all to live for, but you are as cold and brutal as I was then, with the work always there, and the cold and hunger. Lestat, you must remember, you were the gentlest of them all. God will forgive me if you forgive me. Well, at that moment the real Esau came through the door. I gestured for quiet, but he wouldn't see that, so I had to get up quickly so the father wouldn't hear his voice from a distance. The slaves had run from him. 
But they're out there. They're gathered in the dark. I hear them, said Lestat. And then he glared at the old man. Kill him, Lewis, he said to me, his voice touched with the first pleading I'd ever heard in it. Then he bit down in rage. Do it! Lean over that pillow and tell him you forgive him all. Forgive him for taking you out of school when you were a boy. Tell him that now. For what? Lestat grimaced, so that his face looked like a skull. Taking me out of school? He threw up his hands and let out a terrible roar of desperation. Damn him! Kill him! he said. No, I said. You forgive him, or you kill him yourself. Go on, kill your own father. The old man begged to be told what we were saying. He called out, Son! Son! And Lestat danced like the maddened Rumpelstiltskin about to put his foot through the floor. I went to the lace curtains. I could see and hear the slaves surrounding the house of pont forms woven in the shadows, drawing near. You were Joseph among your brothers, the old man said, the best of them, but how was I to know? It was when you were gone I knew, when all those years passed, and they could offer me no comfort, no solace. And then you came back to me and took me from the farm. But it wasn't you. It wasn't the same boy. I turned on Lestat now and veritably dragged him towards the bed. Never had I seen him so weak and at the same time enraged. He shook me off and then knelt down near the pillow, glowering at me. I stood resolute and whispered, Forgive. It's all right, father. You must rest easy. I hold nothing against you, he said, his voice thin and strained over his anger. The old man turned on the pillow, murmuring something soft with relief, but Lestat was already gone. He stopped short in the doorway, his hands over his ears. They're coming, he whispered, and then turning just so he could see me, he said, Take him, for God's sake! The old man never even knew what happened. He never awoke from his stupor. I bled him just enough, opening the gash so he would then die without feeding my dark passion. That thought I couldn't bear. I knew now it wouldn't matter if the body was found in this manner, because I had had enough of pont du lac and Lestat, and all this identity of pont du lacs prosperous master. I would torch the house and turn to the wealth I had held under many names, safe for just such a moment. Meantime, Lestat was after the slaves. He would leave such ruin and death behind him, no one could make a story of that night at pont du lac and I went with him. As before, his ferocity was mysterious, but now I bared my fangs on the humans who fled from me, my steady advance overcoming their clumsy, pathetic speed as the veil of death descended, or the veil of madness. The power and the proof of the vampire was incontestable, so that the slaves scattered in all directions. And it was I who ran back up the steps to put the torch to pont du lac Lestat came bounding after me. What are you doing? he shouted. Are you mad? But there was no way to put out the flames. They're gone, and you're destroying it, all of it. He turned round and round in the magnificent parlor amid his fragile splendor. Get your coffin out. You have three hours till dawn, I said. The house was a funeral pyre. Could the fire have hurt you? asked the boy. Most definitely said the vampire. Did you go back to the oratory? Was it safe? No, not at all. Some fifty-five slaves were scattered around the grounds. Many of them would not have desired the life of a runaway, and would most certainly go right to Frenier or south to the Beljardin plantation downriver. I had no intention of staying there that night, but there was little time to go anywhere else. The woman, Babette, said the boy, the vampire smiled. Yes, I went to Babette. She lived now at Frenier with her young husband. I had enough time to load my coffin into the carriage and go to her. 
But what about Lestat? The vampire sighed. Lestat went with me. It was his intention to go on to New Orleans, and he was trying to persuade me to do just that. But when he saw I meant to hide at Frenier, he opted for that also. We might not have ever made it to New Orleans. It was growing light. Not so that mortal eyes would have seen it, but Lestat and I could see it. Now as for Babette, I had visited her once again. As I told you, she had scandalized the coast by remaining alone on the plantation without a man in the house, without even an older woman. Babette's greatest problem was that she might succeed financially only to suffer the isolation of social ostracism. She had such a sensibility that wealth itself meant nothing to her. Family, a line, this meant something to Babette. Though she was able to hold the plantation together, the scandal was wearing on her. She was giving up inside. I came to her one night in the garden. Not permitting her to look on me, I told her in a most gentle voice that I was the same person she'd seen before, that I knew of her life and her suffering. Don't expect people to understand it, I told her. They are fools. They want you to retire because of your brother's death. They would use your life as if it were merely oil for a proper lamp. You must defy them, but you must defy them with purity and confidence. She was listening all the while in silence. I told her she was to give a ball for a cause, and the cause to be religious, she might pick a convent in New Orleans, anyone, and plan for a philanthropic ball. She would invite her deceased mother's dearest friends to be chaperones, and she would do all of this with perfect confidence. Above all, perfect confidence. It was confidence and purity which were all important. Well, Babette thought this to be a stroke of genius. I don't know what you are, and you will not tell me, she said. This was true, I would not. But I can only think that you are an angel. And she begged to see my face, that is, she begged in the manner of such people as Babette, who are not given to truly begging anyone for anything. Not that Babette was proud, she was simply strong and honest, which in most cases makes begging... I see... You want to ask me a question? The vampire stopped. Oh, no, said the boy, who had meant to hide it. But you mustn't be afraid to ask me anything. If I held something too close... And when the vampire said this, his face darkened for an instant. He frowned, and as his brows drew together, a small well appeared in the flesh of his forehead, over his left brow, as though someone had pressed it with a finger... It gave him a peculiar look of deep distress. If I held something too close for you to ask about it, I would not bring it up in the first place, he said. The boy found himself staring at the vampire's eyes, at the eyelashes which were fine black wires in the tender flesh of the lids. Ask me, he said to the boy. Babette, the way you speak of her, said the boy, as if your feeling was special. Did I give you the impression I could not feel? asked the vampire. No, not at all. Obviously you felt for the old man. You stayed to comfort him when you were in danger. And what you felt for a young Frenier when Lestat wanted to kill him. All this you explained. But I was wondering... Did you have a special feeling for Babette? Was it feeling for Babette all along that caused you to protect Frenier? You mean love, said the vampire. Why do you hesitate to say it? Because you spoke of detachment, said the boy. Do you think that angels are detached? asked the vampire. The boy thought for a moment. Yes, he said. But aren't angels capable of love? 
asked the vampire. Don't angels gaze upon the face of God with complete love? The boy thought for a moment. Love or adoration, he said. What is the difference? asked the vampire thoughtfully. What is the difference? It was clearly not a riddle for the boy. He was asking himself. Angels feel love and pride, the pride of the fall, and hatred, the strong, overpowering emotions of detached persons in whom emotion and will are one, he said finally. He stared at the table now, as though he were thinking this over, was not entirely satisfied with it. I had for Babette a strong feeling. It is not the strongest I've ever known for a human being, he looked up at the boy, but it was very strong. Babette was to me in her own way an ideal human being. He shifted in his chair, the cape moving softly about him, and turned his face to the windows. The boy bent forward and checked the tape. Then he took another cassette from his briefcase, and begging the vampire's pardon, fitted it into place. I'm afraid I did ask something too personal. I didn't mean, he said anxiously to the vampire. You asked nothing of the sort, said the vampire, looking at him suddenly. It is a question right to the point. I feel love, and I felt some measure of love for Babette, though not the greatest love I've ever felt. It was foreshadowed in Babette. To return to my story, Babette's charity ball was a success, and her re-entry in social life assured by it. Her money generously underwrote any doubts in the minds of her suitors' families, and she married. On summer nights I used to visit her, never letting her see me or know that I was there. I came to see that she was happy, and seeing her happy, I felt a happiness as the result. And to Babette I came now with Lestat. He would have killed the Freniers long ago if I hadn't stopped him, and he thought now that was what I meant to do. And what peace would that bring? I asked. You call me the idiot, and you've been the idiot all along. Do you think I don't know why you made me a vampire? You couldn't live by yourself. You couldn't manage even the simplest things. For years now I've managed everything while you sat about making a pretense of superiority. There's nothing left for you to tell me about life. I have no need of you and no use for you. It's you who need me. And if you touch but one of the Frenier slaves, I'll get rid of you. It will be a battle between us, and I needn't point out to you I have more wit to fare better in my little finger than you in your entire frame. Do as I say. Well, this startled him, though it shouldn't have. And he protested he had much to tell me of things and types of people I might kill who would cause sudden death and places in the world I must never go and so forth and so on. Nonsense that I could hardly endure. But I had no time for him. The overseer's lights were lit at Frenier. He was trying to quell the excitement of the runaway slaves and his own. And the fire of Pointe du Lac could be seen still against the sky. Babette was dressed and attending to business, having sent carriages to pont lac and slaves to help fight the blaze. Frightened runaways were kept away from the others, and at that point no one regarded their stories as any more than slave foolishness. Babette knew something dreadful had happened and suspected murder, never the supernatural. She was in the study making a note of the fire in the plantation diary when I found her. It was almost morning. I had only a few minutes to convince her she must help. I spoke to her at first, refusing to let her turn around, and calmly she listened. I told her I must have a room for the night to rest. I've never brought you harm. I ask you now for a key, and your promise that no one will try to enter that room until tonight. 
Then I'll tell you all. I was nearly desperate now. The sky was paling. Lestat was yards off in the orchard with the coffins. But why have you come to me tonight? she asked. And why not to you? I replied. Did I not help you at the very moment when you most needed guidance? When you alone stood strong among those who are dependent and weak? Did I not twice offer you good counsel? And haven't I watched over your happiness ever since? I could see the figure of Lestat at the window. He was in a panic. Give me the key to a room. Let no one come near it till nightfall. I swear to you I would never bring you harm. And if I don't, if I believe you come from the devil, she said now, and meant to turn her head, I reached for the candle and put it out. She saw me standing with my back to the graying windows. If you don't, and if you believe me to be the devil, I shall die, I said. Give me the key. I could kill you now if I chose, do you see? And now I moved close to her and showed myself to her more completely, so that she gasped and drew back, holding to the arm of her chair. But I would not. I would die rather than kill you. I will die if you don't give me such a key as I ask. It was accomplished. What she thought, I don't know. But she gave me one of the ground-floor storage rooms where wine was aged, and I am sure she saw Lestat and me bringing the coffins. I not only locked the door, but barricaded it. Lestat was up the next evening when I awoke. Then she kept her word. Yes. Only she had gone a step further. She had not only respected our locked door, she had locked it again from without. And the stories of the slaves, she'd heard them. Yes, she had. Lestat was the first to discover we were locked in, however. He became furious. He had planned to get to New Orleans as fast as possible. He was now completely suspicious of me. I only needed you as long as my father lived, he said, desperately trying to find some opening somewhere. The place was a dungeon. Now I won't put up with anything from you, I warn you. He didn't even wish to turn his back on me. I sat there, straining to hear voices in the rooms above, wishing that he would shut up, not wishing to confide for a moment my feeling for Babette or my hopes. I was also thinking something else. You ask me about feeling and detachment. One of its aspects, detachment with feeling, I should say, is that you can think of two things at the same time. You can think that you are not safe and may die, and you can think of something very abstract and remote. And this was definitely so with me. I was thinking at that moment, wordlessly and rather deeply, how sublime friendship between Lestat and me might have been, how few impediments to it there would have been, and how much to be shared. Perhaps it was the closeness of Babette which caused me to feel it. For how could I truly ever come to know Babette, except, of course, through the one final way, to take her life? to become one with her in an embrace of death, when my soul would become one with my heart and nourished with it. But my soul wanted to know Babette without my need to kill, without robbing her of every breath of life, every drop of blood. But Lestat, how we might have known each other, had he been a man of character, a man of even a little thought, the old man's words came back to me. Lestat, a brilliant pupil, a lover of books that had been burned. I knew only the Lestat who sneered at my library, called it a pile of dust, ridiculed relentlessly my reading, my meditations. I became aware now that the house over our heads was quieting. 
Now and then feet moved, and the boards creaked, and the light in the cracks of the boards gave a faint, uneven illumination. I could see Lestat feeling along the brick walls, his hard, enduring vampire face, a twisted mask of human frustration. I was confident we must part ways at once, that I must, if necessary, put an ocean between us. And I realized that I'd tolerated him this long because of self-doubt. I'd fooled myself into believing I stayed for the old man and for my sister and her husband. But I stayed with Lestat because I was afraid he did know essential secrets as a vampire, which I could not discover alone, and, more important, because he was the only one of my kind whom I knew. He had never told me how he had become a vampire, or where I might find a single other member of our kind. This troubled me greatly, then, as much as it had for four years. I hated him and wanted to leave him, yet could I leave him? Meantime, as all this passed through my thoughts, Lestat continued his diatribe. He didn't need me. He wasn't going to put up with anything, especially not any threat from the Freniers. We had to be ready when that door opened. Remember, he said to me finally, speed and strength. They cannot match us in that. And fear. Remember always to strike fear. Don't be sentimental now. You'll cost us everything. You wish to be on your own after this? I asked him. I wanted him to say it. I did not have the courage. Or rather, I did not know my own feelings. I want to get to New Orleans, he said. I was simply warning you I don't need you. But to get out of here, we need each other. You don't begin to know how to use your powers. You have no innate sense of what you are. Use your persuasive powers with this woman if she comes. But if she comes with others... Then be prepared to act like what you are. Which is what? I asked him, because it had never seemed such a mystery to me as it did at that time. What am I? He was openly disgusted. He threw up his hands. Be prepared, he said, now baring his magnificent teeth, to kill. He looked suddenly at the boards overhead. They're going to bed up there, do you hear them? After a long, silent time, during which Lestat paced and I sat there musing, plumbing my mind for what I might do or say to Babette, or deeper still for the answer to a harder question, what did I feel for Babette? After a long time, a light flared beneath the door. Lestat was poised to jump whoever should open it. It was Babette alone, and she entered with a lamp, not seeing Lestat, who stood behind her, but looking directly at me. I had never seen her as she looked then. Her hair was down for bed, a mass of dark waves behind her white dressing gown, and her face was tight with worry and fear. This gave it a feverish radiance, and made her large brown eyes all the more huge. As I have told you, I loved her strength and honesty, the greatness of her soul. And I did not feel passion for her as you would feel it, but I found her more alluring than any woman I'd known in mortal life. Even in the severe dressing gown, her arms and breasts were round and soft and she seemed to me an intriguing soul clothed in rich, mysterious flesh. I, who am hard and spare and dedicated to a purpose, felt drawn to her irresistibly, and knowing it could only culminate in death, I turned away from her at once, wondering if when she gazed into my eyes she found them dead and soulless. "'You are the one who came to me before,' she said now, as if she hadn't been sure. "'And you are the owner of Pointe du Lac. "'You are!' "'I knew as she spoke that she must have heard the wildest stories of last night. 
and there would be no convincing her of any lie. I had used my unnatural appearance twice to reach her, to speak to her. I could not hide it or minimize it now. I mean you no harm, I said to her. I need only a carriage and horses, the horses I left last night in the pasture. She didn't seem to hear my words. She drew closer, determined to catch me in the circle of her light. And then I saw Lestat behind her, his shadow merging with her shadow on the brick wall. He was anxious and dangerous. You will give me the carriage? I insisted. She was looking at me now, the lamp raised, and just when I meant to look away, I saw her face change. It went still, blank, as if her soul were losing its consciousness. She closed her eyes and shook her head. It occurred to me that I had somehow caused her to go into a trance without any effort on my part. What are you? she whispered. You're from the devil. You were from the devil when you came to me. The devil? I answered her. This distressed me, more than I thought I could be distressed. If she believed this, then she would think my counsel bad. She would question herself. Her life was rich and good, and I knew she mustn't do this. Like all strong people, she suffered always a measure of loneliness. She was a marginal outsider, a secret infidel of a certain sort. And the balance by which she lived might be upset if she were to question her own goodness. She stared at me with undisguised horror. It was as if in horror she forgot her own vulnerable position. And now Lestat, who was drawn to weakness like a parched man to water, grabbed her wrist, and she screamed and dropped the lamp. The flames leaped in the spattered oil, and Lestat pulled her backwards towards the open door. You get the carriage, he said to her. Get it now, and the horses. You are in mortal danger. Don't talk of devils. I stomped on the flames and went for Lestat, shouting at him to leave her. He had her by both wrists, and she was furious. You'll rouse the house if you don't shut up, he said to me, and I'll kill her. Get the carriage. Lead us. Talk to the stable boy, he said to her, pushing her into the open air. We moved slowly across the dark court, my distress almost unbearable. Lestat ahead of me, and before us both Babette, who moved backwards, her eyes peering at us in the dark. Suddenly she stopped. One dim light burned in the house above. I'll get you nothing, she said. I reached for Lestat's arm and told him I must handle this. She'll reveal us to everyone unless you let me talk to her, I whispered to him. Then get yourself in check, he said disgustedly. Be strong, don't quibble with her. You go as I talk. Go to the stables and get the carriage and the horses, but don't kill. Whether he'd obey me or not, I didn't know. But he darted away just as I stepped up to Babette. Her face was a mixture of fury and resolution. She said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And I stood there before her then, speechless, just holding her in my glance as surely as she held me. If she could hear Lestat in the night, she gave no indication. Her hatred for me burned like fire. Why do you say this to me? I asked. Was the counsel I gave you bad? Did I do you harm? I came to help you, to give you strength. I thought only of you when I had no need to think of you at all. She shook her head. But why? Why do you talk to me like this? she asked. I know what you've done at Pointe du Lac. You've lived there like a devil. The slaves are wild with stories. All day men have been on the river road on the way to Pont du Lac. My husband was there. He saw the house in ruins, the bodies of slaves throughout the orchards, the fields. What are you? Why do you speak to me gently? What do you want of me? She clung now to the pillars of the porch and was backing slowly to the staircase. Something moved above in the lighted window. 
I cannot give you such answers now, I said to her. Believe me when I tell you I came to you only to do you good, and would not have brought worry and care to you last night for anything had I the choice. The vampire stopped. The boy sat forward, his eyes wide. The vampire was frozen, staring off, lost in his thoughts, his memory. And the boy looked down suddenly, as if this were the respectful thing to do. He glanced again at the vampire, and then away, his own face as distressed as the vampire's. And then he started to say something, but he stopped. The vampire turned towards him and studied him, so that the boy flushed and looked away again anxiously. But then he raised his eyes and looked into the vampire's eyes. He swallowed, but he held the vampire's gaze. Is this what you want? the vampire whispered. Is this what you wanted to hear? He moved the chair back soundlessly and walked to the window. The boy sat as if stunned, looking at his broad shoulders and the long mass of the cape. The vampire turned his head slightly. You don't answer me. I'm not giving you what you want, am I? You wanted an interview, something to broadcast on the radio. That doesn't matter. I'll throw the tapes away if you want. The boy rose. I can't say I understand all you're telling me. You'd know I was lying if I said I did. So how can I ask you to go on except to say what I do understand? What I do understand is like nothing I've ever understood before. He took a step towards the vampire. The vampire appeared to be looking down into Divisadero Street. Then he turned his head slowly and looked at the boy. And smiled. His face was serene and almost affectionate, and the boy suddenly felt uncomfortable. He shoved his hands into his pockets and turned towards the table. Then he looked at the vampire tentatively and said, Will you please go on? The vampire turned with folded arms and leaned against the window. Why? He asked. The boy was at a loss. Because I want to hear it. He shrugged. Because I want to know what happened. All right, said the vampire, with the same smile playing on his lips. And he went back to the chair and sat opposite the boy and turned the recorder just a little and said, Marvelous contraption, really. So let me go on. You must understand that what I felt for Babette now was a desire for communication, stronger than any other desire I then felt, except for the physical desire for blood. It was so strong in me, this desire, that it made me feel the depth of my capacity for loneliness. When I'd spoken to her before, there had been a brief but direct communication, which was as simple and as satisfying as taking a person's hand, clasping it, letting it go gently. All this in a moment of great need and distress. But now we were at odds. To Babette I was a monster, and I found it horrible to myself and would have done anything to overcome her feeling. I told her the counsel I'd given her was right, that no instrument of the devil could do right, even if he chose. I know, she answered me, but by this she meant that she could no more trust me than the devil himself. I approached her, and she moved back. I raised my hand, and she shrank, clutching for the railing. All right, then. I said, feeling a terrible exasperation. Why did you protect me last night? Why have you come to me alone? What I saw in her face was cunning. She had a reason, but she would by no means reveal it to me. 
It was impossible for her to speak to me freely, openly, to give me the communication I desired. I felt weary looking at her. The night was already late, and I could see and hear that Lestat had stolen into the wine cellar and taken our caskets, and I had a need to get away, and other needs besides. The need to kill and drink. But it wasn't that that made me weary. It was something else, something far worse. It was as if this night were only one of thousands of nights, world without end, night curving into night to make a great arching line of which I couldn't see the end, a night in which I roamed alone under cold, mindless stars. I think I turned away from her and put my hand to my eyes. I felt oppressed and weak suddenly. I think I was making some sound without my will. And then, on this vast and desolate landscape of night, where I was standing alone and where Babette was only an illusion, I saw suddenly a possibility that I'd never considered before a possibility from which I'd fled, wrapped as I was with the world, fallen into the senses of the vampire, in love with color and shape and sound and singing and softness and infinite variation. Babette was moving, but I took no note of it. She was taking something from her pocket. Her great ring of household keys jingled there. She was moving up the steps, let her go away, I was thinking. Creature of the devil, I whispered. Get thee behind me, Satan, I repeated. I turned to look at her now. She was frozen on the steps with wide, suspicious eyes. She'd reached the lantern which hung on the wall, and she held it in her hands, just staring at me, holding it tight like a valuable purse. You think I come from the devil? I asked her. She quickly moved her left fingers around the hook of the lantern, and with her right hand made the sign of the cross, the Latin words barely audible to me. And her face blanched and her eyebrows rose when there was absolutely no change because of it. Did you expect me to go up in a puff of smoke? I asked her. I drew closer now, for I had gained detachment from her by virtue of my thoughts. And where would I go? I asked her. And where would I go? To hell from whence I came? To the devil from whom I came? I stood at the foot of the steps. Suppose I told you I know nothing of the devil. Suppose I told you that I do not even know if he exists. It was the devil I'd seen upon the landscape of my thoughts. It was the devil about whom I thought now. I turned away from her. She wasn't hearing me as you are now. She wasn't listening. I looked up at the stars. Lestat was ready. I knew it. It was as if he'd been ready there with the carriage for years. And she had stood upon the step for years. I had the sudden sensation my brother was there, and had been there for ages also, and that he was talking to me low in an excited voice, and what he was saying was desperately important, but it was going away from me as fast as he said it, like the rustle of rats in the rafters of an immense house. There was a scraping sound and a burst of light. I don't know whether I come from the devil or not. I don't know what I am, I shouted at Babette, my voice deafening in my own sensitive ears. I am to live to the end of the world, and I do not even know what I am. But the light flared before me. It was the lantern which she had lit with a match, and held now so I couldn't see her face. For a moment I could see nothing but the light, and then the great weight of the lantern struck me full force in the chest, and the glass shattered on the bricks, and the flames roared on my legs, in my face. Lestat was shouting from the darkness, Put it out! Put it out, idiot! It will consume you! and I felt something thrashing me wildly in my blindness. It was Lestat's jacket. I'd fallen helpless back against the pillar, helpless as much from the fire and the blow 
as from the knowledge that Babette meant to destroy me, as from the knowledge that I did not know what I was. All this happened in a matter of seconds. The fire was out, and I knelt in the dark with my hands on the bricks. Lestata at the top of the stairs had Babette again, and I flew up after him, grabbing him about the neck and pulling him backwards. He turned on me, enraged, and kicked me, but I clung to him and pulled him down on top of me to the bottom. Babette was petrified. I saw her dark outline against the sky and the glint of light in her eyes. Come on, then, Lestat said, scrambling to his feet. Babette was putting her hand to her throat. My injured eyes strained to gather the light to see her. Her throat bled. Remember, I said to her, I might have killed you or let him kill you. I did not. You called me devil. You are wrong. Then you'd stopped Lestat just in time, said the boy. Yes, Lestat could kill and drink like a bolt of lightning. But I had saved only Babette's physical life. I was not to know that until later. In an hour and a half, Lestat and I were in New Orleans. The horses nearly dead from exhaustion. The carriage parked on a side street a block from a new Spanish hotel. Lestat had an old man by the arm and was putting fifty dollars into his hand. Get us a suite, he directed him, and order some champagne. Say it is for two gentlemen and pay in advance. And when you come back, I'll have another fifty for you. And I'll be watching for you, I wager. His gleaming eyes held the man in thrall. I knew he'd kill him as soon as he returned with the hotel room keys, and he did. I sat in the carriage, watching wearily as the man grew weaker and weaker and finally died, his body collapsing like a sack of rocks in a doorway as Lestat let him go. Good night, sweet prince said Lestat, and here's your fifty dollars, and he shoved the money into his pocket as if it were a capital joke. Now we slipped in the courtyard doors of the hotel and went up to the lavish parlor of our suite. Champagne glistened in a frosted bucket. Two glasses stood on the silver tray. I knew Lestat would fill one glass and sit there staring at the pale yellow color, and I, a man in a trance, lay on the settee staring at him as if nothing he could do mattered. I have to leave him or die, I thought. It would be sweet to die, I thought. Yes, die. I wanted to die before. Now I wish to die. I saw it with such sweet clarity, such dead calm. You're being morbid, Lestat said suddenly. It's almost dawn. He pulled the lace curtains back, and I could see the rooftops under the dark blue sky and above the great constellation Orion. Go kill, said Lestat, sliding up the glass. He stepped out of the sill, and I heard his feet land softly on the rooftop beside the hotel. He was going for the coffins, or at least one. My thirst rose in me like fever, and I followed him. My desire to die was constant, like a pure thought in the mind, devoid of emotion. Yet I needed to feed. I've indicated to you I would not then kill people. I moved along the rooftop in search of rats. But why? You've said Lestat shouldn't have made you start with people. Did you mean, do you mean for you it was an aesthetic choice, not a moral one? Had you asked me then, I would have told you it was aesthetic. That I wished to understand death in stages. That the death of an animal yielded such pleasure and experience to me, that I had only begun to understand it, and wished to save the experience of human death for my mature understanding. But it was moral. Because all aesthetic decisions are moral, really. I don't understand, said the boy. I thought aesthetic decisions could be completely immoral. What about the cliché of the artist who leaves his wife and children so he can paint? 
or Nero playing the harp while Rome burned. Both were moral decisions. Both served a higher good in the mind of the artist. The conflict lies between the morals of the artist and the morals of society, not between aesthetics and morality. But often this isn't understood, and here comes the waste, the tragedy. An artist stealing paints from a store, for example, imagines himself to have made an inevitable but immoral decision, and then he sees himself as fallen from grace. What follows is despair and petty irresponsibility, as if morality were a great glass world which can be utterly shattered by one act. But this was not my great concern then. I did not know these things then. I believed I killed animals for aesthetic reasons only, and I hedged against the great moral question of whether or not by my very nature I was damned. Because, you see, though Lestat had never said anything about devils or hell to me, I believed I was damned when I went over to him, just as Judas must have believed it when he put the noose around his neck. You understand? The boy said nothing. He started to speak but didn't. The color burned for a moment in blotches on his cheeks. Were you? He whispered. The vampire only sat there, smiling, a small smile that played on his lips like the light. The boy was staring at him now as if he were just seeing him for the first time. Perhaps, said the vampire, drawing himself up and crossing his legs, we should take things one at a time. Perhaps I should go on with my story. Yes, please, said the boy. I was agitated that night, as I told you. I had hedged against this question as a vampire, and now it completely overwhelmed me. And in that state I had no desire to live. Well, this produced in me, as it can in humans, a craving for that which will satisfy at least physical desire. I think I used it as an excuse. I have told you what the kill means to vampires. You can imagine from what I've said the difference between a rat and a man. I went down into the street after Lestat and walked for blocks. The streets were muddy then, the actual blocks, islands above the gutters, and the entire city so dark compared to the cities of today. The lights were as beacons in a black sea. Even with morning rising slowly, only the dormers and high porches of the houses were emerging from the dark, and to a mortal man the narrow streets I found were like pitch. Am I damned? Am I from the devil? Is my very nature that of a devil? I was asking myself over and over. And if it is... Why then do I revolt against it? Tremble when Babette hurls a flaming lantern at me. Turn away in disgust when Lestat kills. What have I become in becoming a vampire? Where am I to go? And all the while, as the death wish caused me to neglect my thirst, my thirst grew hotter. My veins were veritable threads of pain in my flesh. My temples throbbed, and finally I could stand it no longer. Torn apart by the wish to take no action, to starve, to wither in thought on the one hand, and driven to kill on the other, I stood in an empty, desolate street and heard the sound of a child crying. She was within. I drew close to the walls, trying in my habitual detachment only to understand the nature of her cry. She was weary and aching and utterly alone. She had been crying for so long now that soon she would stop from sheer exhaustion. I slipped my hand up under the heavy wooden shutter and pulled it so the bolt slipped. There she sat, 
in the dark room beside a dead woman, a woman who'd been dead for some days. The room itself was cluttered with trunks and packages, as though a number of people had been packing to leave, but the mother lay half-clothed, her body already in decay, and no one else was there but the child. It was moments before she saw me, but when she did she began to tell me that I must do something to help her mother. She was only five at most, and very thin and her face was stained with dirt and tears. She begged me to help. They had to take a ship, she said, before the plague came. Their father was waiting. She began to shake her mother now and to cry in the most pathetic and desperate way. And then she looked at me again and burst into the greatest flow of tears. You must understand that by now I was burning with physical need to drink. I could not have made it through another day without feeding. But there were alternatives. Rats abounded in the streets, and somewhere very near a dog was howling hopelessly. I might have fled the room had I chosen and fed and gotten back easily, but the question pounded in me. Am I damned? If so, why do I feel such pity for her, for her gaunt face? Why do I wish to touch her tiny, soft arms, hold her now on my knee as I am doing, feel her bend her head to my chest as I gently touch the satin hair? Why do I do this? If I am damned, I must want to kill her. I must want to make her nothing but food for a cursed existence, because being damned, I must hate her. And when I thought of this, I saw Babette's face contorted with hatred when she had held the lantern waiting to light it, and I saw Lestat in my mind and hated him, and I felt, yes, damned, and this is hell, and in that moment I had bent down and driven hard into her soft small neck, and hearing her tiny cry whispered, even as I felt the hot blood on my lips, it's only for a moment, and there'll be no more pain. But she was locked to me, and I was soon incapable of saying anything. For four years I had not savored a human. For four years I hadn't really known. And now I heard her heart in that terrible rhythm. And such a heart. Not the heart of a man or an animal, but the rapid, tenacious heart of the child, beating harder and harder, refusing to die, beating like a tiny fist, beating on a door, crying, I will not die, I will not die, I cannot die, I cannot die. I think I rose to my feet, still locked to her the heart pulling my heart faster with no hope of cease, the rich blood rushing too fast for me, the room reeling, and then despite myself I was staring over her bent head, her open mouth, down through the gloom at the mother's face, and through the half-mast lids her eyes gleamed at me as if they were alive. I threw the child down. She lay like a jointless doll, and turning in blind horror of the mother to flee, I saw the window filled with a familiar shape. It was Lestat, who backed away from it now, laughing, his body bent as he danced in the mud street. Louis, Louis, he taunted me and pointed a long, bone-thin finger at me, as if to say he'd caught me in the act. And now he bounded over the sill, brushing me aside, and grabbed the mother's stinking body from the bed and made to dance with her. Good God! whispered the boy. Yes, I might have said the same, said the vampire. He stumbled over the child as he pulled the mother along in widening circles, singing as he danced, her matted hair falling in her face as her head snapped back and a black fluid poured out of her mouth. He threw her down. I was out of the window and running down the street, and he was running after me. Are you afraid of me, Louis? he shouted. Are you afraid? The child's alive, Louis. You left her breathing. Shall I go back and make her a vampire? We could use her, Louis. And think of all the pretty dresses we could buy for her. Louis, wait! Louis, I'll go back for her if you say. 
And so he ran after me, all the way back to the hotel, all the way across the rooftops where I hoped to lose him, until I leaped in the window of the parlor and turned in rage and slammed the window shut. He hit it, arms outstretched like a bird who seeks to fly through glass, and shook the frame. I was utterly out of my mind. I went round and round in the room, looking for some way to kill him. I pictured his body burned to a crisp on the roof below. Reason had altogether left me, so that I was consummate rage, and when he came through the broken glass we fought as we'd never fought before. It was hell that stopped me, the thought of hell, of us being two souls in hell that grappled in hatred. I lost my confidence, my purpose, my grip. I was down on the floor then, and he was standing over me, his eyes cold, though his chest heaved. You're a fool, Lewis, he said. His voice was calm. It was so calm it brought me around. The sun's coming up, he said, his chest heaving slightly from the struggle, his eyes narrow as he looked at the window. I'd never seen him quite like this. The fight had got the better of him in some way, or something had. Get in your coffin, he said to me without even the slightest anger. But tomorrow night we talk. Well, I was more than slightly amazed. Lestat, talk! I couldn't imagine this. Never had Lestat and I really talked. I think I have described to you with accuracy our sparring matches, our angry go-rounds. He was desperate for the money, for your houses, said the boy. Or was it that he was as afraid to be alone as you were? These questions occurred to me. It even occurred to me that Lestat meant to kill me some way that I didn't know. You see, I wasn't sure then why I awoke each evening when I did, whether it was automatic, when the death-like sleep left me, and why it happened sometimes earlier than at other times. It was one of the things Lestat would not explain. And he was often up before me. He was my superior in all the mechanics, as I've indicated. And I shut the coffin that morning with a kind of despair. I should explain now, though, that the shutting of the coffin is always disturbing. It is rather like going under a modern anesthetic on an operating table. Even a casual mistake on the part of an intruder might mean death. But how could he have killed you? He couldn't have exposed you to the light. He couldn't have stood it himself. This is true, but rising before me he might have nailed my coffin shut or set it afire. The principal thing was, I didn't know what he might do, what he might know that I still did not know. But there was nothing to be done about it then, and with thoughts of the dead woman and child still in my brain, and the sun rising, I had no energy left to argue with him, and lay down to miserable dreams. You do dream, said the boy. Often, said the vampire, I wish sometimes that I did not. For such dreams, such long and clear dreams, I never had as a mortal, and such twisted nightmares I never had either. In my early days these dreams so absorbed me that often it seemed I fought waking as long as I could, and lay sometimes for hours thinking of these dreams until the night was half gone. And dazed by them, I often wandered about, seeking to understand their meaning. They were in many ways as elusive as the dreams of mortals. I dreamed of my brother, for instance, that he was near me in some state between life and death, calling to me for help. And often I dreamed of Babette. And often, almost always, there was a great wasteland backdrop to my dreams. That wasteland of night I'd seen when cursed by Babette, as I've told you. It was as if all figures walked and talked on the desolate home of my damned soul. I don't remember what I dreamed that day. Perhaps because I remember too well what Lestat and I discussed the following evening. 
I see you're anxious for that, too. Well, as I've said, Lestat amazed me in his new calm, his thoughtfulness. But that evening I didn't wake to find him the same way. Not at first. There were women in the parlor. The candles were a few, scattered on the small table in the carved buffet, and Lestat had his arm around one woman and was kissing her. She was very drunk and very beautiful, a great drugged doll of a woman with her careful coif falling slowly down on her bare shoulders and over her partially bared breasts. The other woman sat over a ruined supper table drinking a glass of wine, I could see that the three of them had dined. Lestat pretending to dine. You would be surprised how people do not notice that a vampire is only pretending to eat. And the woman at the table was bored. All this put me in a fit of agitation. I did not know what Lestat was up to. If I went into the room, the woman would turn her attentions to me. And what was to happen, I couldn't imagine. Except that Lestat meant for us to kill them both. This ends Disc 3. Interview with the Vampire, Disc 4. The woman on the settee with him was already teasing about his kisses, his coldness, his lack of desire for her. And the woman at the table watched with black almond eyes that seemed to be filled with satisfaction. When Lestat rose and came to her, putting his hands on her bare white arms, she brightened. Bending now to kiss her, he saw me through the crack in the door, and his eyes just stared at me for a moment, and then he went on talking with the ladies. He bent down and blew out the candles on the table. "'It's too dark in here,' said the woman on the couch. "'Leave us alone,' said the other woman. Lestat sat down and beckoned her to sit in his lap. And she did, putting her left arm around his neck, her right hand smoothing back his yellow hair. "'Your skin's icy,' she said, recoiling slightly. "'Not always,' said Lestat, and then he buried his face in the flesh of her neck. I was watching all this with fascination. Lestat was masterfully clever and utterly vicious. But I didn't know how clever he was until he sank his teeth into her now his thumb pressing down on her throat, his other arm locking her tight, so that he drank his fill without the other woman even knowing. "'Your friend has no head for wine,' he said, slipping out of the chair and seating the unconscious woman there, her arms folded under her face on the table. "'She's stupid,' said the other woman, who had gone to the window and had been looking out at the lights." New Orleans was then a city of many low buildings, as you probably know. And on such clear nights as this, the lamp-lit streets were beautiful from the high windows of this new Spanish hotel. And the stars of those days hung low over such dim light as they do at sea. I can warm that cold skin of yours better than she can. She turned to Lestat, and I must confess I was feeling some relief that he would now take care of her as well. But he planned nothing so simple. Do you think so? he said to her. He took her hand, and she said, Why, you're warm. You mean the blood had warmed him, said the boy. Oh, yes, said the vampire. After killing a vampire is as warm as you are now. And he started to resume, then, glancing at the boy, he smiled. As I was saying, Lestat now held the woman's hand in his and said that the other had warmed him. His face, of course, was flushed, much altered. He drew her close now, and she kissed him, remarking through her laughter that he was a veritable furnace of passion. Ah, but the price is high he said to her, affecting sadness. Your pretty friend, he shrugged his shoulders. I exhausted her. And he stood back, as if inviting the woman to walk to the table, and she did, a look of superiority on her small features. She bent down to see her friend, but then lost interest. 
until she saw something. It was a napkin. It had caught the last drops of blood from the wound in the throat. She picked it up, straining to see it in the darkness. Take down your hair, said Lestat softly, and she dropped it, indifferent, and took down the last tresses so that her hair fell blonde and wavy down her back. Soft, he said, so soft. I picture you that way, lying on a bed of satin. Such things you say, she scoffed, and turned her back on him playfully. Do you know what manner of bed? he asked. And she laughed and said his bed she could imagine. She looked back at him as he advanced, and never once looking away from her, he gently tipped the body of her friend so that it fell backwards from the chair and lay with staring eyes upon the floor. The woman gasped. She scrambled away from the corpse, nearly upsetting a small end table. The candle went over and went out. Put out the light, and then put out the light, Lestat said softly. And then he took her into his arms like a struggling moth and sank his teeth into her. But what were you thinking as you watched? asked the boy. Did you want to stop him the way you wanted to stop him from killing Frenier? No. Said the vampire, "I could not have stopped him, and you must understand. I knew that he killed humans every night. Animals gave him no satisfaction whatsoever. Animals were to be banked on when all else failed, but never to be chosen. If I felt any sympathy for the women, it was buried deep in my own turmoil." I still felt in my chest the little hammer heart of that starving child. I still burned with the questions of my own divided nature. I was angry that Lestat had staged this show for me, waiting till I woke to kill the women, and I wondered again if I might somehow break loose from him, and felt both hatred and my own weakness more than ever. Meantime, he propped their lovely corpses at the table, and went about the room lighting all the candles until it blazed as if for a wedding. Come in, Louis," he said. "I would have arranged an escort for you, but I know what a man you are about choosing your own. Pity Mademoiselle Frenier likes to hurl flaming lanterns. It makes a party unwieldy, don't you think? Especially for a hotel." He seated the blonde-haired girl so that her head lay to one side against the damask back of the chair, and the darker woman lay with her chin resting just above her breasts. This one had blanched, and her features had a rigid look to them already, as though she was one of those women in whom the fire of personality makes beauty. But the other looked only as if she slept, and I was not sure that she was even dead. The stot had made two gashes, one in her throat and one above her left breast, and both still bled freely. He lifted her wrist now and, slitting it with a knife, filled two wine glasses and bade me to sit down. "I'm leaving you," I said to him at once. "I wish to tell you that now." I thought as much," he answered, sitting back in the chair, "and I thought as well that you would make a flowery announcement." Tell me what a monster I am, what a vulgar fiend! I make no judgments upon you. I'm not interested in you. I am interested in my own nature now, and I've come to believe I can't trust you to tell me the truth about it. You use knowledge for personal power. I told him, and I suppose, in the manner of many people making such an announcement, I was not looking to him at all. I was mainly listening to my own words. But now I saw that his face was once again the way it had been when he'd said we would talk. He was listening to me. I was suddenly at a loss. I felt that gulf between us as painfully as ever. Why did you become a vampire? I blurted out. And why such a vampire as you are, vengeful and delighting in taking human life, even when you have no need? This girl. Why did you kill her when one would have done? And why did you frighten her so before you killed her? And why have you propped her here in some grotesque?
grotesque manner, as if tempting the gods to strike you down for your blasphemy. All this he listened to without speaking, and in the pause that followed I again felt at a loss. Lestat's eyes were large and thoughtful. I'd seen them that way before, but I couldn't remember when, certainly not when talking to me. What do you think a vampire is? he asked me sincerely. I don't pretend to know. You pretend to know. What is it? I asked. And to this he answered nothing. It was as if he sensed the insincerity of it, the spite. He just sat there looking at me with the same still expression. Then I said, I know that after leaving you I shall try to find out. I'll travel the world if I have to, to find other vampires. I know they must exist. I don't know of any reasons why they shouldn't exist, in great numbers. And I'm confident I shall find vampires who have more in common with me than I with you. Vampires who understand knowledge as I do, and have used their superior vampire nature to learn secrets of which you don't even dream. If you haven't told me everything, I shall find things out for myself, or from them when I find them. He shook his head. Louis, he said, you are in love with your mortal nature. You chase after the phantoms of your former self. Frenier! His sister, these are images for you of what you were and what you still long to be. And in your romance with mortal life, you're dead to your vampire nature. I objected to this at once. My vampire nature has been for me the greatest adventure of my life. All that went before it was confused, clouded, I went through mortal life like a blind man, groping from solid object to solid object. It was only when I became a vampire that I respected for the first time all of life. I never saw a living, pulsing human being until I was a vampire. I never knew what life was until it ran out in a red gush over my lips, my hands. I found myself staring at the two women, the darker one now turning a terrible shade of blue. The blonde was breathing. She's not dead, I said to him suddenly. I know, let her alone, he said. He lifted her wrist and made a new gash by the scab of the other and filled his glass. All that you say makes sense, he said to me, taking a drink. You are an intellect. I've never been. What I've learned, I've learned from listening to men talk, not from books. I never went to school long enough. But I'm not stupid, and you must listen to me because you are in danger. You do not know your vampire nature. You are like an adult who, looking back on his childhood, realizes that he never appreciated it. You cannot, as a man, go back to the nursery and play with your toys, asking for the love and care to be showered on you again simply because now you know their worth. So it is with you and mortal nature. You've given it up. You no longer look through a glass darkly. But you cannot pass back to the world of human warmth with your new eyes. I know that well enough, I said. But what is it that is our nature? If I can live from the blood of animals, why should I not live from the blood of animals, rather than go through the world bringing misery and death to human creatures? Does it bring you happiness? he asked. You wander through the night feeding on rats like a pauper, and then moon at Babette's window, filled with care, yet helpless as the goddess who came by night to watch Endymion sleep and could not have him. And suppose you could hold her in your arms, and she would look on you without horror or disgust. What then? A few short years to watch her suffer every prick of mortality and then die before your eyes? Does this give happiness? This is insanity, Louis. This is vain. And what truly lies before you is vampire nature, which is killing. For I guarantee you, 
that if you walk the streets tonight and strike down a woman as rich and beautiful as Babette and suck her blood until she drops at your feet, you will have no hunger left for Babette's profile in the candlelight or for listening by the window for the sound of her voice. You will be filled, Louis, as you were meant to be, with all the life that you can hold, and you will have hunger when that's gone for the same and the same and the same. The red in this glass will be just as red, the roses on the wallpaper just as delicately drawn. And you'll see the moon the same way, and the same the flicker of a candle. And with that same sensibility that you cherish, you will see death in all its beauty, life as it is only known on the very point of death. Don't you understand that, Louis? You alone, of all creatures, can see death that way with impunity. You alone, under the rising moon, can strike like the hand of God. He sat back now and drained the glass, and his eyes moved over the unconscious woman, her breasts heaved, and her eyebrows knit as if she were coming around. A moan escaped her lips. He'd never spoken such words to me before, and I had not thought him capable of it. Vampires are killers, he said now. Predators, whose all-seeing eyes were meant to give them detachment. The ability to see a human life in its entirety, not with any mawkish sorrow, but with a thrilling satisfaction in being the end of that life, in having a hand in the divine plan. That is how you see it, I protested. The girl moaned again. Her face was very white. Her head rolled against the back of the chair. That is the way it is, he answered. You talk of finding other vampires. Vampires are killers. They don't want you or your sensibility. They'll see you coming long before you see them, and they'll see your flaw. And distrusting you, they'll seek to kill you. They'd seek to kill you even if you were like me, because they are lone predators and seek for companionship no more than cats in the jungle. They're jealous of their secret and of their territory, and if you find one or more of them together, it will be for safety only, and one will be the slave of the other the way you are of me. I'm not your slave, I said to him, but even as he spoke, I realized I'd been his slave all along. That's how vampires increase, through slavery. How else? he asked. He took the girl's wrist again, and she cried out as the knife cut. She opened her eyes slowly as he held her wrist over the glass. She blinked and strained to keep them open. It was as if a veil covered her eyes. "'You're tired, aren't you?' he asked her. She gazed at him as if she couldn't really see him. "'Tired,' he said." now leaning close and staring into her eyes. You want to sleep. Yes, she moaned softly, and he picked her up and took her into the bedroom. Our coffins rested on the carpet and against the wall. There was a velvet-draped bed. Lestat did not put her on the bed. He lowered her slowly into his coffin. What are you doing? I asked him, coming to the door sill. The girl was looking around like a terrified child. No, she was moaning, and then as he closed the lid she screamed. She continued to scream within the coffin. Why do you do this, Lestat? I asked. I like to do it, he said. I enjoy it. He looked at me. I don't say that you have to enjoy it. Take your taste to purer things. Kill them swiftly if you will, but do it. Learn that you're a killer. Ah! He threw up his hands in disgust. 
The girl had stopped screaming. Now he drew up a little curved-legged chair beside the coffin, and crossing his legs he looked at the coffin lid. His was a black, varnished coffin, not a pure rectangular box as they are now, but tapered at both ends, and widest where the corpse might lay his hands upon his chest. It suggested the human form. It opened, and the girl sat up, astonished, wild-eyed, her lips blue and trembling. "'Lie down, love.' he said to her, and pushed her back, and she lay near hysterical, staring up at him. "'You're dead, love,' he said to her, and she screamed and turned desperately in the coffin like a fish, as if her body could escape through the sides, through the bottom. "'It's a coffin, a coffin!' she cried. "'Let me out!' "'But we all must lie in coffins eventually,' he said to her. "'Lie still, love. This is your coffin.' Most of us never get to know what it feels like. You know what it feels like, he said to her. I couldn't tell whether she was listening or not, or just going wild. But she saw me in the doorway, and then she lay still, looking at Lestat, and then at me. Help me, she said to me. Lestat looked at me. I expected you to feel these things instinctually, as I did, he said. When I gave you that first kill, I thought you would hunger for the next, and the next, that you would go to each human life as if to a full cup, the way I had. But you didn't. And all this time, I suppose, I kept from straightening you out because you were best weaker. I'd watch you playing shadow in the night, staring at the falling rain, and I'd think, he's easy to manage, he's simple. But you're weak, Lewis. You're a mark for vampires and now for humans alike. This thing with Babette has exposed us both. It's as if you want us both to be destroyed. I can't stand to watch what you're doing, I said, turning my back. The girl's eyes were burning into my flesh. She lay all the time he spoke, staring at me. You can stand it, he said. I saw you last night with that child. You're a vampire the same as I am. He stood up and came towards me, but the girl rose again, and he turned to shove her down. Do you think we should make her a vampire? Share our lives with her? he asked. Instantly, I said, no. Why, because she's nothing but a whore? he asked. A damned expensive whore at that, he said. Can she live now? Or has she lost too much? I asked him. Touching, he said. She can't live. Then kill her. She began to scream. He just sat there. I turned around. He was smiling, and the girl had turned her face to the satin and was sobbing. Her reason had almost entirely left her. She was crying and praying. She was praying to the Virgin to save her, her hands over her face now, now over her head, the wrist smearing blood in her hair and on the satin. I bent over the coffin. She was dying, it was true. Her eyes were burning, but the tissue around them was already bluish, and now she smiled. You won't let me die, will you? she whispered. You'll save me. Lestat reached over and took her wrist. But it's too late, love, he said. Look at your wrist, your breast. And then he touched the wound in her throat. She put her hands to her throat and gasped, her mouth open, the scream strangled. I stared at Lestat. I could not understand why he did this. His face was as smooth as mine is now, more animated for the blood, but cold and without emotion. He did not leer like a stage villain or hunger for her suffering as if the cruelty fed him. He simply watched her. I never meant to be bad, she was crying. I only did what I had to do. You won't let this happen to me. You'll let me go. I can't die like this. I can't. She was sobbing, the sobs dry and thin. You'll let me go. I have to go to the priest. You'll let me go. But my friend is a priest, said Lestat, smiling, as if he just thought of it as a joke. 
This is your funeral, dear. You see, you were at a dinner party and you died. But God has given you another chance to be absolved. Don't you see? Tell him your sins. She shook her head at first, and then she looked at me again with those pleading eyes. Is it true? she whispered. Well, said Lestat, I suppose you're not contrite, dear. I shall have to shut the lid. Stop this, Lestat! I shouted at him. The girl was screaming again, and I could not stand the sight of it any longer. I bent down to her and took her hand. I can't remember my sins, she said, just as I was looking at her wrist, resolved to kill her. You mustn't try. Tell God only that you are sorry, I said, and then you'll die and it will be over. She lay back and her eyes shut. I sank my teeth into her wrist and began to suck her dry. She stirred once, as if dreaming, and said a name. And then, when I felt her heartbeat reach that hypnotic slowness, I drew back from her, dizzy, confused for the moment, my hands reaching for the door frame. I saw her as if in a dream. The candles glared in the corner of my eye. I saw her lying utterly still, and Lestat sat composed beside her like a mourner. His face was still. Lewis, he said to me, don't you understand? Peace will only come to you when you can do this every night of your life. There is nothing else. But this is everything. His voice was almost tender as he spoke, and he rose and put both his hands on my shoulders. I walked into the parlor, shying away from his touch, but not resolute enough to push him off. Come with me, out into the streets. It's late. You haven't drunk enough. Let me show you what you are, really. Forgive me if I bungled it, left too much to nature. Come. I can't bear it, Lestat, I said to him. You chose your companion badly. But, Louis, he said, you haven't tried. The vampire stopped. He was studying the boy, and the boy, astonished, said nothing. It was true what he'd said. I had not drunk enough. And shaken by the girl's fear, I let him lead me out of the hotel, down the back stairs. People were coming now from the Conde Street ballroom, and the narrow street was jammed. There were supper parties in the hotels, and the planter families were lodged in town in great numbers, and we passed through them like a nightmare. My agony was unbearable. Never since I was a human being had I felt such mental pain. It was because all of Lestat's words had made sense to me. I knew peace only when I killed, only for that minute. And there was no question in my mind that the killing of anything less than a human being brought nothing but a vague longing, the discontent which had brought me close to humans to watch their lives through glass. I was no vampire. And in my pain I asked, irrationally, like a child, could I not return? Could I not be human again? Even as the blood of that girl was warm in me, and I felt that physical thrill and strength, I asked that question. The faces of humans passed me like candle flames in the night, dancing on dark waves. I was sinking into the darkness. I was weary of longing. I was turning around and around in the street, looking at the stars and thinking, Yes, it's true. I know what he is saying is true, that when I kill there is no longing, and I can't bear this truth. I can't bear it. Suddenly there was one of those arresting moments. The street was utterly quiet. We had strayed far from the main part of the old town and were near the ramparts. 
There were no lights, only the fire in a window and the far-off sound of people laughing. But no one here, no one near us. I could feel the breeze suddenly from the river and the hot air of the night rising in Lestat near me, so still he might have been made of stone. Over the long, low row of pointed roofs were the massive shapes of oak trees in the dark, great swaying forms of myriad sounds under the low-hung stars. The pain for the moment was gone, the confusion was gone. I closed my eyes and heard the wind and the sound of water flowing softly, swiftly in the river. It was enough for one moment. And I knew that it would not endure, that it would fly away from me like something torn out of my arms, and I would fly after it, more desperately lonely than any creature under God, to get it back. And then a voice beside me rumbled deep in the sound of the night, a drumbeat, as the moment ended, saying, Do what it is your nature to do. This is but a taste of it. Do what it is your nature to do. And the moment was gone. I stood like the girl in the parlor in the hotel, dazed and ready for the slightest suggestion. I was nodding at Lestat as he nodded at me. Pain is terrible for you, he said. You feel it like no other creature because you are a vampire. You don't want it to go on. No. I answered him. I'll feel as I felt with her, wed to her and weightless, caught as if by a dance. That and more. His hand tightened on mine. Don't turn away from it. Come with me. He led me quickly through the street, turning every time I hesitated, his hand out for mine, a smile on his lips. His presence as marvelous to me as the night he'd come in my mortal life and told me we would be vampires. Evil is a point of view, he whispered now. We are immortal, and what we have before us are the rich feasts that conscience cannot appreciate and mortal men cannot know without regret. God kills, and so shall we. Indiscriminately he takes the richest and the poorest, and so shall we. For no creatures under God are as we are, none so like him as ourselves, dark angels not confined to the stinking limits of hell, but wandering his earth and all its kingdoms. I want a child tonight. I am like a mother. I want a child. I should have known what he meant. I did not. He had me mesmerized, enchanted. He was playing to me as he had when I was mortal. He was leading me. He was saying, Your pain will end. We'd come to a street of lighted windows. It was a place of rooming houses, sailors, flatboatmen. We entered a narrow door, and then, in a hollow stone passage in which I could hear my own breath like the wind, he crept along the wall until his shadow leapt out in the light of a doorway beside the shadow of another man, their heads bent together, their whispers like the rustling of dry leaves. What is it? I drew near him as he came back, afraid suddenly this exhilaration in me would die. I saw again that nightmare landscape I'd seen when I spoke with Babette. I felt the chill of loneliness, the chill of guilt. She's there, he said, your wounded one, your daughter. What do you say? What are you talking about? You've saved her, he whispered. I knew it. You left the window wide on her and her dead mother, and people passing in the street brought her here. The child! The little girl! I gasped. 
but he was already leading me through the door to stand at the end of the long ward of wooden beds, each with a child beneath a narrow white blanket, one candle at the end of the ward, where a nurse bent over a small desk. We walked down the aisle between the rows. Starving children, orphans, he said, children of plague and fever. He stopped. I saw the little girl lying in the bed. And then the man was coming, and he was whispering with Lestat, such care for the sleeping little ones. Someone in another room was crying. The nurse rose and hurried away. And now the doctor bent and wrapped the child in the blanket. Lestat had taken money from his pocket and set it on the foot of the bed. The doctor was saying how glad he was we'd come for her, how most of them were orphans. They came in on the ships, sometimes orphans too young even to tell which body was that of their mother. He thought Lestat was the father. And in moments Lestat was running through the streets with her, the white of the blanket gleaming against his dark coat and cape. And even to my expert vision, as I ran after him, it seemed sometimes as if the blanket flew through the night, with no one holding it, a shifting shape, traveling on the wind like a leaf stood upright and sent scurrying along a passage, trying to gain the wind all the while and truly take flight. I caught him finally as we approached the lamps near the Place d'Armes. The child lay pale on his shoulder, her cheeks still full like plums, though she was drained and near death. She opened her eyes, or rather the lids slid back, and beneath the long curling lashes I saw a streak of white. Lestat, what are you doing? Where are you taking her? I demanded. But I knew too well. He was heading for the hotel and meant to take her into our room. The corpses were as we left them, one neatly set in the coffin as if an undertaker had already attended her, the other in her chair at the table. Lestat brushed past them as if he didn't see them, while I watched him in fascination. The candles had all burned down, and the only light was that of the moon and the street. I could see his iced and gleaming profile as he set the child down on the pillow. Come here, Louis. You haven't fed enough, I know you haven't, he said, with the same calm, convincing voice he had used skillfully all evening. He held my hand in his, his own warm and tight. See her, Louis, how plump and sweet she looks, as if even death can't take her freshness. The will to live is too strong. He might make a sculpture of her tiny lips and rounded hands, but he cannot make her fade. You remember the way you wanted her when you saw her in that room. I resisted him. I didn't want to kill her. I hadn't wanted to last night. And then suddenly I remembered two conflicting things and was torn in agony. I remembered the powerful beating of her heart against mine, and I hungered for it, hungered for it so badly I turned my back on her in the bed and would have rushed out of the room had not Lestat held me fast. And I remembered her mother's face, and that moment of horror when I dropped the child and he'd come into the room. But he wasn't mocking me now, he was confusing me. You want her, Louis? Don't you see, once you've taken her, then you can take whomever you wish. You wanted her last night, but you weakened, and that's why she's not dead. I could feel it was true, what he said. I could feel again that ecstasy of being pressed to her, her little heart going and going. She's too strong for me. Her heart, it wouldn't give up, I said to him. Is she so strong? He smiled. He drew me close to him. Take her, Louis. I know you want her. And I did. I drew close to the bed now and just watched her. Her chest barely moved with her breath, and one small hand was tangled in her long gold hair. 
I couldn't bear it, looking at her, wanting her not to die, and wanting her. And the more I looked at her, the more I could taste her skin, feel my arms sliding under her back and pulling her up to me, feeling her soft neck. Soft, soft, that's what she was, so soft. I tried to tell myself it was best for her to die. What was to become of her? But these were lying thoughts. I wanted her. And so I took her in my arms and held her, her burning cheek on mine, her hair falling down over my wrists and brushing my eyelids, the sweet perfume of a child, strong and pulsing in spite of sickness and death. She moaned now. Stirred in her sleep, and that was more than I could bear. I'd kill her before I'd let her wake and know it. I went into her throat, and heard Lestat saying to me, strangely, Just a little tear, it's just a little throat. And I obeyed him. I won't tell you again what it was like except that it caught me up just as it had done before, and as killing always does, only more, so that my knees bent, and I half lay on the bed, sucking her dry, that heart pounding again that would not slow, would not give up. And suddenly, as I went on and on, the instinctual part of me waiting, waiting for the slowing of the heart which would mean death, the stot wrenched me from her. But she's not dead! I whispered. But it was over. The furniture of the room emerged from the darkness. I sat stunned, staring at her, too weak to move, my head rolling back against the headboard of the bed, my hands pressing down on the velvet spread. Lestat was snatching her up, talking to her, saying a name. Claudia, Claudia, listen to me. Come round, Claudia. He was carrying her now out of the bedroom into the parlor, and his voice was so soft I barely heard him. You're ill. Do you hear me? You must do as I tell you to get well. And then in the pause that followed, I came to my senses. I realized what he was doing, that he had cut his wrist and given it to her, and she was drinking. That's it, dear. More, he was saying to her. You must drink it to get well. Damn you, I shouted, and he hissed at me with blazing eyes. He sat on the settee with her locked to his wrist. I saw her white hand clutching at his sleeve, and I could see his chest heaving for breath, and his face contorted the way I'd never seen it. He let out a moan and whispered again to her to go on, and when I moved from the threshold he glared at me again as if to say, I'll kill you. But why, Lestat? I whispered to him. He was trying now to push her off, and she wouldn't let go. With her fingers locked around his fingers and arm, she held the wrist to her mouth, a growl coming out of her. Stop, stop, he said to her. He was clearly in pain. He pulled back from her and held her shoulders with both hands. She tried desperately to reach his wrist with her teeth, but she couldn't. And then she looked at him with the most innocent astonishment. He stood back, his hand out lest she move. Then he clapped a handkerchief on his wrist and backed away from her toward the bell rope. He pulled it sharply, his eyes still fixed on her. What have you done, Lestat? I asked him. What have you done? I stared at her. She sat, composed, revived, filled with life, no sign of pallor or weakness in her, her legs stretched out straight on the damask, her white gown soft and thin like an angel's gown around her small form, she was looking at Lestat. Not me, he said to her, ever again. Do you understand? But I'll show you what to do. 
When I tried to make him look at me and answer me as to what he was doing, he shook me off. He gave me such a blow with his arm that I hit the wall. Someone was knocking now. I knew what he meant to do. Once more I tried to reach out for him, but he spun so fast I didn't even see him hit me. When I did see him, I was sprawled in the chair, and he was opening the door. Yes, come in, please. There's been an accident he said to the young slave boy, and then, shutting the door, he took him from behind, so that the boy never knew what happened. And even as he knelt over the body, drinking, he beckoned for the child, who slid from the couch, and went down on her knees, and took the wrist offered her, quickly pushing back the cuff of the shirt. She gnawed first, as if she meant to devour his flesh, and then Lestat showed her what to do. He sat back and let her have the rest, his eye on the boy's chest, so that when the time came he bent forward and said, No more. He's dying. You must never drink after the heart stops or you'll be sick again, sick to death. Do you understand? But she'd had enough, and she sat next to him, their backs against the legs of the settee, their legs stretched out on the floor. The boy died in seconds. I felt weary and sickened, as if the night had lasted a thousand years. I sat there watching them, the child drawing close to Lestat now, snuggling near him as he slipped his arm around her, though his indifferent eyes remained fixed on the corpse. Then he looked up at me. "'Where is Mama? asked the child softly. She had a voice equal to her physical beauty, clear, like a little silver bell. It was sensual. She was sensual. Her eyes were as wide and clear as Babette's. You understand that I was barely aware of what all this meant. I knew what it might mean, but I was aghast. Now Lestat stood up and scooped her from the floor and came towards me. She's our daughter, he said. You're going to live with us now. He beamed at her, but his eyes were cold as if it were all a horrible joke. Then he looked at me, and his face had conviction. He pushed her towards me. I found her on my lap, my arms around her, feeling again how soft she was, how plump her skin was, like the skin of warm fruit, plums warmed by sunlight. Her huge luminescent eyes were fixed on me with trusting curiosity. This is Louis, and I am Lestat, he said to her, dropping down beside her. She looked about and said that it was a pretty room, very pretty, but she wanted her mama. He had his comb out and was running it through her hair, holding the lock so as not to pull with the comb. Her hair was untangling and becoming like satin. She was the most beautiful child I had ever seen, and now she glowed with the cold fire of a vampire. Her eyes were a woman's eyes. I could see it already. She would become white and spare like us, but not lose her shape. I understood now what Lestat had said about death, what he meant. I touched her neck, where the two red puncture wounds were bleeding just a little. I took Lestat's handkerchief from the floor and touched it to her neck. Your mamas left you with us. She wants you to be happy he was saying with that same immeasurable confidence. She knows we can make you very happy. I want some more, she said, turning to the corpse on the floor. No, not tonight. Tomorrow night, said Lestat. And he went to take the lady out of his coffin. The child slid off my lap and I followed her. She stood watching as Lestat put the two ladies and the slave boy into the bed. He brought the covers up to their chin. "'Are they sick?' asked the child. 
Yes, Claudia, he said. They're sick and they're dead. You see, they die when we drink from them. He came towards her and swung her up into his arms again. We stood there with her between us. I was mesmerized by her, by her transformed, by her every gesture. She was not a child any longer. She was a vampire child. Now, Louis was going to leave us said Lestat, his eyes moving from my face to hers. He was going to go away. But now he's not, because he wants to stay and take care of you and make you happy. He looked at me. You're not going, are you, Louis? You bastard, I whispered to him. You fiend. Such language in front of your daughter, he said. I'm not your daughter, she said with a silvery voice. I'm my mamma's daughter. No, dear, not any more, he said to her. He glanced at the window, and then he shut the bedroom door behind us and turned the key in the lock. You're our daughter, Louis's daughter and my daughter, do you see? Now, whom should you sleep with, Louis or me? And then, looking at me, he said, Perhaps you should sleep with Louis. After all, when I'm tired, I'm not so kind. The vampire stopped. The boy said nothing. A child vampire, he whispered finally. The vampire glanced up suddenly, as though startled, though his body made no movement. He glared at the tape recorder as if it were something monstrous. The boy saw that the tape was almost out. Quickly he opened his briefcase and drew out a new cassette, clumsily fitting it into place. He looked at the vampire as he pressed the record button. The vampire's face looked weary, drawn, his cheekbones more prominent and his brilliant green eyes enormous. They had begun at dark, which had come early on this San Francisco winter night, and now it was just before 10 p.m. The vampire straightened and smiled and said calmly, We are ready to go on. He'd done this to the little girl just to keep you with him, asked the boy. Well, that is difficult to say. It was a statement. I'm convinced that Lestat was a person who believed not to think or talk about his motives or beliefs, even to himself. One of those people who must act. Such a person must be pushed considerably before he will open up and confess that there is method and thought to the way he lives. That is what had happened that night with Lestat. He'd been pushed to where he had to discover, even for himself, why he lived as he did. Keeping me with him, that was undoubtedly part of what pushed him. But I think in retrospect that he himself wanted to know his own reasons for killing, wanted to examine his own life. He was discovering when he spoke what he did believe. But he did indeed want me to remain. He lived with me in a way he could never have lived alone. And as I've told you, I was careful never to sign any property over to him, which maddened him. That he could not persuade me to do. The vampire laughed suddenly. Look at all the other things he persuaded me to do. How strange. He could persuade me to kill a child, but not to part with my money. He shook his head. But... He said, it wasn't greed, really, as you can see. It was fear of him that made me tight with him. You speak of him as if he were dead. You say Lestat was this or was that. Is he dead? asked the boy. I don't know, said the vampire. I think perhaps he is. But I'll come to that. 
We were talking of Claudia, weren't we? There was something else I wanted to say about Lestat's motives that night. Lestat trusted no one, as you see. He was like a cat, by his own admission a lone predator. Yet he had communicated with me that night. He had to some extent exposed himself simply by telling the truth. He had dropped his mockery, his condescension. He had forgotten his perpetual anger for just a little while. And this for Lestat was exposure. When we stood alone in that dark street, I felt in him a communion with another I hadn't felt since I died. I rather think that he ushered Claudia into vampirism for revenge. Revenge not only on you, but on the world, suggested the boy. Yes. As I said, Lestat's motives for everything revolved around revenge. Was it all started with the father, with the school? I don't know. I doubt it, said the vampire. But I want to go on. Oh, please go on. You have to go on. I, I mean, it's only ten o'clock. The boy showed his watch. The vampire looked at it, and then he smiled at the boy. The boy's face changed. It was blank as if from some sort of shock. Are you still afraid of me? asked the vampire. The boy said nothing, but he shrank slightly from the edge of the table. His body elongated, his feet moved out over the bare boards and then contracted. I should think you'd be very foolish if you weren't, said the vampire. But don't be. Shall we go on? Please, said the boy. He gestured towards the machine. Well, the vampire began, our life was much changed with Mademoiselle Claudia, as you can imagine. Her body died, yet her senses awakened much as mine had. And I treasured in her the signs of this. But I was not aware for quite a few days how much I wanted her, wanted to talk with her and be with her. At first I thought only of protecting her from Lestat. I gathered her into my coffin every morning and would not let her out of my sight with him, if possible. This was what Lestat wanted, and he gave little suggestions that he might do her harm. A starving child is a frightful sight, he said to me, a starving vampire even worse. They'd hear her screams in Paris, he said, were he to lock her away to die. But all this was meant for me, to draw me close and keep me there. Afraid of fleeing alone, I would not conceive of risking it with Claudia. She was a child. She needed care. And there was much pleasure in caring for her. She forgot her five years of mortal life at once, or so it seemed, for she was mysteriously quiet. And from time to time I even feared that she had lost all sense, that the illness of her mortal life, combined with the great vampire shock, might have robbed her of reason. But this proved hardly the case. She was simply unlike Lestat and me, to such an extent I couldn't comprehend her. For a little child she was, but also fierce killer, now capable of the ruthless pursuit of blood with all a child's demanding. And though Lestat still threatened me with danger to her, he did not threaten her at all, but was loving to her, proud of her beauty, anxious to teach her that we must kill to live and that we ourselves could never die. The Plague raged in the city then, as I've indicated. And he took her to the stinking cemeteries where the yellow fever and plague victims lay in heaps while the sounds of shovels never ceased all through the day and night. This is death, he told her, pointing to the decaying corpse of a woman, which we cannot suffer. Our bodies will stay always as they are, fresh and alive. But we must never hesitate to bring death, because it is how we live. 
and Claudia gazed on this with inscrutable liquid eyes. If there was not understanding in the early years, there was no smattering of fear. Mute and beautiful, she played with dolls, dressing, undressing them by the hour. Mute and beautiful, she killed. And I, transformed by Lestat's instruction, was now to seek out humans in much greater numbers. But it was not only the killing of them that soothed some pain in me, which had been constant in the dark, still nights on pointe lac when I sat with only the company of Lestat and the old man. It was their great, shifting numbers everywhere, in streets which never grew quiet, cabarets which never shut their doors, balls which lasted till dawn, the music and laughter streaming out of the open windows, people all around me now, my pulsing victims, not seen with that great love I'd felt for my sister and Babette, but with some new detachment and need. And I did kill them, kills infinitely varied and great distances apart, as I walked with the vampire's sight and light movement through this teeming, burgeoning city, my victims surrounding me, seducing me, inviting me to their supper tables, their carriages, their brothels. I lingered only a short while, long enough to take what I must have, soothed in my great melancholy that the town gave me an endless train of magnificent strangers. For that was it. I fed on strangers. I drew only close enough to see the pulsing beauty, the unique expression, the new and passionate voice, then killed before those feelings of revulsion could be aroused in me, that fear, that sorrow. Claudia and Lestat might hunt and seduce, stay long in the company of the doomed victim, enjoying the splendid humor in his unwitting friendship with death. But I still could not bear it. And so to me the swelling population was a mercy, a forest in which I was lost, unable to stop myself, whirling too fast for thought or pain, accepting again and again the invitation to death rather than extending it. We lived, meantime, in one of my new Spanish townhouses in the Rue Royale, a long, lavish upstairs flat above a shop I rented to a tailor, a hidden garden court behind us, well secure against the street, with fitted wooden shutters and a barred carriage door, a place of far greater luxury and security than pont -de lac Our servants were free people of color who left us to solitude before dawn for their own homes, and Lestat bought the very latest imports from France and Spain, crystal chandeliers and oriental carpets, silk screens with painted birds of paradise, canaries singing in great domed golden cages, and delicate marble Grecian gods, and beautifully painted Chinese vases. I did not need the luxury any more than I had needed it before but I found myself enthralled with the new flood of art and craft and design, could stare at the intricate pattern of the carpets for hours, or watch the gleam of the lamplight change the somber colors of a Dutch painting. All this Claudia found wondrous, with the quiet awe of an unspoiled child, and marveled when Lestat hired a painter to make the walls of her room a magical forest of unicorns and golden birds and laden fruit trees over sparkling streams. An endless train of dressmakers and shoemakers and tailors came to our flat to outfit Claudia in the best of children's fashions, so that she was always a vision, not just of child beauty with her curling lashes and her glorious yellow hair, but of the taste of finely trimmed bonnets and tiny lace gloves, flaring velvet coats and capes, and sheer white puffed sleeve gowns with gleaming blue sashes. Estat played with her as if she were a magnificent doll, and I played with her as if she were a magnificent doll. 
and it was her pleading that forced me to give up my rusty black for dandy jackets and silk ties and soft grey coats and gloves and black capes. The stout thought the best colour at all times for vampires was black, possibly the only aesthetic principle he steadfastly maintained. But he wasn't opposed to anything which smacked of style and excess. He loved the great figure we cut, the three of us, in our box at the new French opera house or the Théâtre d'Orléans, to which we went as often as possible, the Stott having a passion for Shakespeare, which surprised me, though he often dozed through the operas and woke just in time to invite some lovely lady to midnight supper, where he would use all his skill to make her love him totally, then dispatch her violently to heaven or hell, and come home with her diamond ring to give to Claudia. And all this time I was educating Claudia, whispering in her tiny seashell ear that our eternal life was useless to us if we did not see the beauty around us, the creation of mortals everywhere. I was constantly sounding the depth of her still gaze as she took the books I gave her, whispered the poetry I taught her, and played with a light but confident touch her own strange, coherent songs on the piano. She could fall for hours into the pictures in a book and listen to me read until she sat so still the sight of her jarred me, made me put the book down and just stare back at her across the lighted room. Then she'd move a doll coming to life, and say in the softest voice that I must read some more. And then strange things began to happen. For though she said little, and was the chubby, round-fingered child still, I'd find her tucked in the arm of my chair, reading the work of Aristotle, or Bothius, or a new novel just come over the Atlantic, or pecking out the music of Mozart we'd only heard the night before with an infallible ear and a concentration that made her ghostly as she sat there hour after hour discovering the music, the melody, then the bass, and finally bringing it together. Claudia was mystery. It was not possible to know what she knew or did not know, and to watch her kill was chilling. She would sit alone in the dark square, waiting for the kindly gentleman or woman to find her, her eyes more mindless than I had ever seen Lestat's. Like a child numbed with fright, she would whisper her plea for help to her gentle, admiring patrons, and as they carried her out of the square, her arms would fix about their necks, her tongue between her teeth, her vision glazed with consuming hunger. They found death fast in those first years, before she learned to play with them, to lead them to the doll shop or the café, where they gave her steaming cups of chocolate or tea to ruddy her pale cheeks, cups she pushed away, waiting, waiting, as if feasting silently on their terrible kindness. But when that was done, she was my companion, my pupil, her long hours spent with me consuming faster and faster the knowledge I gave her, sharing with me some quiet understanding which could not include Lestat. At dawn she lay with me, her heart beating against my chest, and many times when I looked at her, when she was at her music or painting and didn't know I stood in the room, I thought of that singular experience I'd had with her and no other, that I had killed her, taken her life from her, had drunk all of her life's blood in that fatal embrace I'd lavished on so many others, others who lay now moldering in the damp earth. But she lived. She lived to put her arms around my neck and press her tiny Cupid's bow to my lips and put her gleaming eye to my eye until our lashes touched, and laughing we reeled about the room, as if to the wildest waltz, father and daughter, lover and lover. You can imagine how well it was Lestat did not envy us this, but only smiled on it from afar, waiting until she came to him, 
Then he would take her out into the street, and they would wave to me beneath the window, off to share what they shared. The hunt, the seduction, the kill. This ends Disc 4. Interview with the Vampire, Disc 5. Years passed in this way. Years and years and years. Yet it wasn't until some time had passed that an obvious fact occurred to me about Claudia. I suppose from the expression on your face you've already guessed, and you wonder why I didn't guess. I can only tell you time is not the same for me, nor was it for us then. Day did not link to day, making a taut and jerking chain. Rather, the moon rose over lapping waves. Her body, the boy said. She was never to grow up. The vampire nodded. She was to be the demon child forever, he said, his voice soft as if he wondered at it. Just as I am the young man I was when I died, and Lestat the same. But her mind, it was a vampire's mind. And I strained to know how she moved towards womanhood. She came to talk more, though she was never other than a reflective person, and could listen to me patiently by the hour without interruption. Yet more and more, her doll-like face seemed to possess two totally aware adult eyes, and innocence seemed lost somewhere with neglected toys and the loss of a certain patience. There was something dreadfully sensuous about her lounging on the settee in a tiny nightgown of lace and stitched pearls, she became an eerie and powerful seductress, her voice as clear and sweet as ever, though it had a resonance which was womanish, a sharpness sometimes that proved shocking. After days of her usual quiet she would scoff suddenly at Lestat's predictions about the war, or drinking blood from a crystal glass say that there were no books in the house, we must get more, even if we had to steal them and then coldly tell me of a library she'd heard of in a palatial mansion in the Faubourg Saint-Marie, a woman who collected books as if they were rocks or pressed butterflies. She asked if I might get her into the woman's bedroom. I was aghast at such moments. Her mind was unpredictable, unknowable. But then she would sit on my lap, and put her fingers in my hair and doze there against my heart, whispering to me softly I should never be as grown up as she until I knew that killing was the more serious thing, not the books, the music. Always the music, she whispered. Doll, doll, I called her. That's what she was, a magic doll. Laughter and infinite intellect, and then the round-cheeked face, the bud mouth. Let me dress you, let me brush your hair, I would say to her out of old habit, aware of her smiling and watching me with the thin veil of boredom over her expression. Do as you like, she breathed into my ear as I bent down to fasten her pearl buttons. Only kill with me tonight. You never let me see you kill, Lewis. She wanted a coffin of her own now, which left me more wounded than I would let her see. I walked out, after giving my gentlemanly consent, for how many years had I slept with her as if she were part of me, I couldn't know. But then I found her near the Ursuline convent, an orphan lost in the darkness, and she ran suddenly towards me and clutched at me with a human desperation. I don't want it if it hurts you, she confided so softly that a human embracing us both could not have heard her or felt her breath. I'll stay with you always, but I must see it, don't you understand? A coffin for a child. 
we were to go to the coffin makers. A play, a tragedy in one act. I to leave her in his little parlor and confide to him in the anteroom that she was to die. Talk of love. She must have the best, but she must not know. And the coffin maker, shaken with the tragedy of it, must make it for her, picturing her laid there on the white satin, dabbing a tear from his eye, despite all the years. But why, Claudia? I pleaded with her. I loathed to do it, loathed cat and mouse with the helpless human. But hopelessly her lover, I took her there and set her on the sofa, where she sat with folded hands in her lap, her tiny bonnet bent down as if she didn't know what we whispered about her in the foyer. The undertaker was an old and greatly refined man of color who drew me swiftly aside lest the baby should hear. But why must she die? he begged me, as if I were God who ordained it. Her heart, she cannot live, I said. The words taking on for me a peculiar power, a disturbing resonance. The emotion in his narrow, heavily lined face disturbed me. Something came to my mind, a quality of light, a gesture, the sound of something. A child crying in a stench-filled room. Now he unlocked one after another of his long rooms and showed me the coffins, black lacquer and silver. She wanted that. And suddenly I found myself backing away from him, out of the coffin house, hurriedly taking her hand. The order's been taken, I said to her. It's driving me mad. I breathed the fresh air of the street as though I'd been suffocated, and then I saw her compassionless face studying mine. She slipped her small, gloved hand back into my own. I want it, Louis, she explained patiently. And then one night she climbed the undertaker's stairs, the stout beside her for the coffin, and left the coffin maker unawares, dead, across the dusty piles of papers on his desk. And there the coffin lay in our bedroom, where she watched it often by the hour when it was new, as if the thing were moving or alive, or unfolded some mystery to her little by little, as things do which change. But she did not sleep in it. She slept with me. There were other changes in her. I cannot date them or put them in order. She did not kill indiscriminately. She fell into demanding patterns. Poverty began to fascinate her. She begged Lestat or me to take a carriage out through the Faubourg Saint-Marie to the riverfront places where the immigrants lived. She seemed obsessed with the women and children. These things Lestat told me with great amusement, for I was loath to go and would sometimes not be persuaded under any circumstance. But Claudia had a family there which she took one by one. And she had asked to enter the cemetery of the suburb city of Lafayette, and there roam the high marble tombs in search of those desperate men who, having no place else to sleep, spend what little they have on a bottle of wine and crawl into a rotting vault. Lestat was impressed, overcome. What a picture he made of her. The infant death, he called her. Sister death and sweet death. And for me, mockingly, he had the term with a sweeping bow. Merciful death, which he said like a woman, clapping her hands and shouting out a word of exciting gossip. Oh, merciful heavens, so that I wanted to strangle him. But there was no quarreling. We kept to ourselves. We had our adjustments. Books filled our long flat from floor to ceiling in row after row of gleaming leather volumes as Claudia and I pursued our natural tastes and Lestat went about his lavish acquisitions. Until she began to ask questions. The vampire stopped.
and the boy looked as anxious as before, as if patience took the greatest effort. But the vampire had brought his long, white fingers together, as if to make a church steeple, and then folded them and pressed his palms tight. It was as if he'd forgotten the boy altogether. I should have known, he said, that it was inevitable, and I should have seen the signs of it coming, for I was so attuned to her. I loved her so completely. She was so much the companion of my every waking hour, the only companion that I had other than death. I should have known. But something in me was conscious of an enormous gulf of darkness very close to us, as though we walked always near a sheer cliff and might see it suddenly but too late if we made the wrong turn or became too lost in our thoughts. Sometimes the physical world about me seemed insubstantial except for that darkness, as if a fault in the earth were about to open and I could see the great crack breaking down the Rue Royale and all the buildings were falling to dust in the rumble. But worst of all, they were transparent, gossamer, like stage drops made of silk. Ah, I'm distracted. What do I say? That I ignored the signs in her that I clung desperately to the happiness she'd given me, and still gave me, and ignored all else. But these were the signs. She grew cold to Lestat. She fell to staring at him for hours. When he spoke, often she didn't answer him, and one could hardly tell if it was contempt or that she didn't hear. And our fragile domestic tranquillity erupted with his outrage. He did not have to be loved, but he would not be ignored. And once he even flew at her, shouting that he would slap her, and I found myself in the wretched position of fighting him as I'd done years before she'd come to us. She's not a child any longer, I whispered to him. I don't know what it is. She's a woman. I urged him to take it lightly, and he affected disdain and ignored her in turn. But one evening he came in flustered and told me she'd followed him, though she'd refused to go with him to kill, she'd followed him afterwards. What's the matter with her? He flared at me as though I'd given birth to her and must know. And then one night our servants vanished. Two of the best maids we'd ever retained, a mother and daughter. The coachman was sent to their house only to report they'd disappeared, and then the father was at our door, pounding the knocker. He stood back on the brick sidewalk, regarding me with that grave suspicion that sooner or later crept into the faces of all mortals who knew us for any length of time. A forerunner of death, as pallor might be to a fatal fever, and I tried to explain to him that they had not been here, mother or daughter, and we must begin some search. It's she, Lestat hissed from the shadows when I shut the gate. She's done something to them and brought risk for us all. I'll make her tell me. And he pounded up the spiral stairs from the courtyard. I knew that she'd gone, slipped out while I was at the gate, and I knew something else also that a vague stench came across the courtyard from the shut, unused kitchen, a stench that mingled uneasily with the honeysuckle, the stench of graveyards. I heard Lestat coming down as I approached the warped shutters, locked with rust to the small brick building. No food was ever prepared there, no work ever done, so that it lay like an old brick vault under the tangles of honeysuckle. The shutters came loose, the nails having turned to dust, and I heard Lestat's gasp as we stepped into the reeking dark. There they lay on the bricks, mother and daughter together, the arm of the mother fastened around the waist of the daughter, the daughter's head bent against the mother's breast, both foul with feces and swarming with insects. A great cloud of gnats rose as the shutter fell back, and I waved them away from me in a convulsive disgust. 
Ants crawled undisturbed over the eyelids, the mouths of the dead pair, and in the moonlight I could see the endless map of silvery paths of snails. Damn her! Lestat burst out, and I grabbed his arm and held him fast, pitting all my strength against him. What do you mean to do with her? I insisted. What can you do? She's not a child any more that will do what we say simply because we say it. We must teach her. She knows. He stood back from me, brushing his coat. She knows. She's known for years what to do, what can be risked and what cannot. I won't have her do this without my permission. I won't tolerate it. Then are you master of us all? You didn't teach her that. Was she supposed to imbibe it from my quiet subservience? I don't think so. She sees herself as equal to us now, and us as equal to each other. I tell you we must reason with her, instruct her to respect what is ours, as all of us should respect it. He stalked off, obviously absorbed in what I'd said, though he would give no admission of it to me. And he took his vengeance to the city. Yet when he came home, fatigued and satiated, she was still not there. He sat against the velvet arm of the couch and stretched his long legs out on the length of it. Did you bury them? he asked me. They're gone, I said. I did not care to say even to myself that I had burned their remains in the old unused kitchen stove. But there is the father to deal with, and the brother, I said to him. I feared his temper. I wished at once to plan some way to quickly dispose of the whole problem. But he said now that the father and the brother were no more, that death had come to dinner in their small house near the ramparts and stayed to say grace when everyone was done. Wine, he whispered now, running his finger on his lip. Both of them had drunk too much wine. I found myself tapping the fence posts with a stick to make a tune. He laughed. But I don't like it, the dizziness. Do you like it? And when he looked at me, I had to smile at him, because the wine was working in him, and he was mellow. And in that moment, when his face looked warm and reasonable, I leaned over and said, I hear Claudia's tap on the stairs. Be gentle with her. It's all done. She came in then, with her bonnet ribbons undone and her little boots caked with dirt. I watched them tensely, Lestat with a sneer on his lips, she as unconscious of him as if he weren't there. She had a bouquet of white chrysanthemums in her arms, such a large bouquet it made her all the more a small child. Her bonnet fell back now, hung on her shoulder for an instant, and then fell to the carpet. And all through her golden hair I saw the narrow petals of the chrysanthemums, Tomorrow is the feast of all saints, she said. Do you know? Yes, I said to her. It is the day in New Orleans when all the faithful go to the cemeteries to care for the graves of their loved ones. They whitewash the plaster walls of the vaults, clean the names cut into the marble slabs, and finally they deck the tombs with flowers. In the San Luis Cemetery which was very near our house, in which all the great Louisiana families were buried, in which my own brother was buried. There were even little iron benches set before the graves where the families might sit to receive the other families who would come to the cemetery for the same purpose. It was a festival in New Orleans, a celebration of death. It might have seemed to tourists who didn't understand it, but it was a celebration of the life after I bought this from one of the vendors, Claudia said. Her voice was soft and inscrutable, her eyes opaque and without emotion. For the two you left in the kitchen, Lestat said fiercely. She turned to him for the first time, but she said nothing. She stood there, staring at him, as if she'd never seen him before. And then she took several steps towards him and looked at him, still as if she were positively examining him. I moved forward. I could feel his anger, her coldness, 
and now she turned to me. And then, looking from one to the other of us, she asked, Which of you did it? Which of you made me what I am? I could not have been more astonished at anything she might have said or done. And yet it was inevitable that her long silence would thus be broken. She seemed very little concerned with me, though, her eyes fixed on Lestat. You speak of us as if we always existed as we are now, she said, her voice soft, measured, the child's tone rounded with the woman's seriousness. You speak of them out there as mortals, us as vampires, but it was not always so. Lewis had a mortal sister, I remember her, and there is a picture of her in his trunk. I've seen him look at it. He was mortal, the same as she, and so was I. Why else this size, this shape? She opened her arms now and let the chrysanthemums fall to the floor. I whispered her name. I think I meant to distract her. It was impossible. The tide had turned. Lestat's eyes burned with a keen fascination, a malignant pleasure. You made us what we are, didn't you? She accused him. He raised his eyebrows now in mock amazement. What you are? he asked. And would you be something other than what you are? He drew up his knees and leaned forward, his eyes narrow. Do you know how long it's been? Can you picture yourself? Must I find a hag to show you your mortal countenance now, if I had let you alone? She turned away from him, stood for a moment as if she had no idea what she would do, and then she moved towards the chair beside the fireplace, and climbing on it, curled up like the most helpless child. She brought her knees up close to her, her velvet coat open, her silk dress tight around her knees, and she stared at the ashes in the hearth. But there was nothing helpless about her stare. Her eyes had independent life, as if the body were possessed. You could be dead by now if you were mortal, the stot insisted to her, pricked by her silence. He drew his legs around and set his boots on the floor. Do you hear me? Why do you ask me this now? Why do you make such a thing of it? You've known all your life you're a vampire. And so he went on, in a tirade, saying much the same things he'd said to me many times over. Know your nature. Kill. Be what you are. But all of this seemed strangely beside the point for Claudia had no qualms about killing. She sat back now and let her head roll slowly to where she could see him across from her. She was studying him again, as if he were a puppet on strings. Did you do it to me? And how? she asked, her eyes narrowing. How did you do it? And why should I tell you? It's my power. Why yours alone? She asked, her voice icy, her eyes heartless. How was it done? She demanded suddenly in rage. It was electric. He rose from the couch, and I was on my feet immediately facing him. Stop her, he said to me. He wrung his hands. Do something about her. I can't endure her and then he started for the door, but turned and, coming back, drew very close so that he towered over Claudia, putting her in a deep shadow. She glared up at him fearlessly, her eyes moving back and forth over his face with total detachment. I can undo what I did, both to you and to him, he said to her, his finger pointing at me across the room. Be glad I made you what you are, he sneered, or I'll break you in a thousand pieces. 
well, the peace of the house was destroyed. Though there was quiet, days passed and she asked no questions, though now she was deep into books of the occult, of witches and witchcraft, and of vampires. This was mostly fancy, you understand, myth, tales, sometimes mere romantic horror tales, but she read it all. Till dawn she read, so that I had to go and collect her and bring her to bed. Lestat, meantime, hired a butler and maid, and had a team of workers in to make a great fountain in the courtyard, with a stone nymph pouring water eternal from a wide-mouthed shell. He had goldfish brought, and boxes of rooted water lilies set into the fountain, so their blossoms rested upon the surface and shivered in the ever-moving water. A woman had seen him kill on the Naiad's road, which ran to the town of Carrollton, and there were stories of it in the papers, associating him with a haunted house near Naiad's and Melpomene, all of which delighted him. He was the Naiad's road ghost for some time, though it finally fell to the back pages. And then he performed another grisly murder in another public place, and set the imagination of New Orleans to working. But all this had about it some quality of fear. He was pensive, suspicious, drew close to me constantly to ask where Claudia was, where she'd gone, and what she was doing. She'll be all right, I assured him, though I was estranged from her and in agony as if she'd been my bride. She hardly saw me now, as she'd not seen Lestat before, and she might walk away while I spoke to her. She had better be all right, he said nastily. And what will you do if she's not? I asked, more in fear than accusation. He looked up at me with his cold gray eyes. You take care of her, Louis. You talk to her, he said. Everything was perfect, and now this. There's no need for it. But it was my choice to let her come to me. And she did. It was early one evening when I'd just awakened. The house was dark. I saw her, standing by the French windows. She wore puffed sleeves and a pink sash, and was watching with lowered lashes the evening rush in the Rue Royale. I could hear Lestat in his room, the sound of water splashing from his pitcher. The faint smell of his cologne came and went like the sound of music from the café two doors down from us. He'll tell me nothing, she said softly. I hadn't realized she knew that I had opened my eyes. I came towards her and knelt beside her. You'll tell me, won't you, how it was done? Is this what you truly want to know, I asked, searching her face? Or is it why it was done to you and what you were before? I don't understand what you mean by how, for if you mean how was it done so that you in turn may do it. I don't even know what it is. What you're saying, she said with a touch of coldness. Then she turned full around and put her hands on my face. Kill with me tonight, she whispered as sensually as a lover, and tell me all that you know. What are we? Why are we not like them? She looked down into the street. I don't know the answers to your questions, I said to her. Her face contorted suddenly, as if she were straining to hear me over a sudden noise. And then she shook her head. But I went on. I wonder the same things you wonder. I do not know. How I was made, I'll tell you that, that Lestat did it to me, but the real how of it, I don't know. Her face had that same look of strain. I was seeing in it the first traces of fear, or something worse and deeper than fear. Claudia, I said to her, putting my hands over her hands and pressing them gently against my skin. Lestat has one wise thing to tell you. Don't ask these questions. 
You've been my companion for countless years in my search for all that I could learn of mortal life and mortal creation. Don't be my companion now in this anxiety. He can't give us the answers, and I have none. I could see she could not accept this, but I hadn't expected the convulsive turning away, the violence with which she tore at her own hair for an instant, and then stopped, as if the gesture were useless, stupid. It filled me with apprehension. She was looking at the sky. It was smoky, starless, the clouds blowing fast from the direction of the river. She made a sudden movement of her lips, as if she'd bitten into them. Then she turned to me, and still whispering, she said, Then he made me. He did it. You did not. There was something so dreadful about her expression. I'd left her before I meant to do it. I was standing before the fireplace, lighting a single candle in front of the tall mirror. And there, suddenly, I saw something which startled me, gathering out of the gloom, first as a hideous mask, then becoming its three-dimensional reality. A weathered skull. I stared at it. It smelled faintly of the earth still, but had been scrubbed. Why don't you answer me? she was asking. I heard Lestat's door open. He would go out to kill at once, at least to find the kill. I would not. I would let the first hours of the evening accumulate in quiet, as hunger accumulated in me till the drive grew almost too strong, so that I might give myself to it all the more completely, blindly. I heard her question again, clearly, as though it had been floating in the air like the reverberation of a bell, and felt my heart pounding. He did make me, of course. He said so himself. But you hide something from me, something he hints at when I question him. He says that it could not have been done without you. I found myself staring at the skull, yet hearing her as if the words were lashing me, lashing me to make me turn around and face the lash. The thought went through me more like a flash of cold than a thought, that nothing should remain of me now but such a skull. I turned around and saw, in the light from the street, her eyes, like two dark flames in her white face, a doll from whom someone had cruelly ripped the eyes and replaced them with a demonic fire. I found myself moving towards her, whispering her name, some thought forming on my lips, then dying, coming towards her, then away from her, fussing for her coat and her hat. I saw a tiny glove on the floor which was phosphorescent in the shadows, and for just a moment I thought it a tiny severed hand. What's the matter with you? She drew nearer, looking up into my face. What has always been the matter? Why do you stare at the skull like that, at the glove? She asked this gently, but not gently enough. There was a slight calculation in her voice, an unreachable detachment. I need you, I said to her without wanting to say it. I cannot bear to lose you. You're the only companion I have in immortality. But surely there must be others. Surely we are not the only vampires on earth. I heard her saying it as I had said it, heard my own words coming back to me now on the tide of her self-awareness, her searching. But there's no pain, I thought suddenly. There's urgency, heartless urgency. I looked down at her. Aren't you the same as I? She looked at me. You've taught me all I know. Lestat taught you to kill. I fetched the glove. Here, come, let's go out, I want to go out. I was stammering, trying to force the gloves on her. I lifted the great curly mass of her hair and placed it gently over her coat. 
But you taught me to see, she said. You taught me the words vampire eyes, she said. You taught me to drink the world, to hunger for more than— I never meant those words that way, vampire eyes, I said to her. It has a different ring when you say it. She was tugging at me, trying to make me look at her. Come, I said to her, I have something to show you. And quickly I led her down the passage and down the spiral stairs through the dark courtyard. But I no more knew what I had to show her, really, than I knew where I was going. Only that I had to move toward it with a sublime and doomed instinct. We rushed through the early evening city, the sky overhead a pale violet now that the clouds were gone. The stars small and faint, the air around us sultry and fragrant, even as we moved away from the spacious gardens, towards those mean and narrow streets where the flowers erupt in the cracks of the stones, and the huge oleander shoots out thick waxen stems of white and pink blooms like a monstrous weed in the empty lots. I heard the staccato of Claudia's steps as she rushed beside me, never once asking me to slacken my pace, and she stood finally, her face infinitely patient, looking up at me in a dark and narrow street where a few old slope-roofed French houses remained among the Spanish facades, ancient little houses, the plaster blistered from the moldering brick beneath. I had found the house now by a blind effort, aware that I had always known where it was and avoided it, always turned before this dark, lampless corner, not wishing to pass the low window where I had first heard Claudia cry. The house was standing still, sunk lower than it was in those days, the alleyway crisscrossed with sagging cords of laundry, the weeds high along the low foundation, the two dormer windows broken and patched with cloth. I touched the shutters. It was here I first saw you, I said to her, thinking to tell it to her so she would understand, yet feeling now the chill of her gaze, the distance of her stare. I heard you crying. You were there in a room with your mother, and your mother was dead, dead for days, and you didn't know. You clung to her, whining, crying pitifully, your body white and feverish and hungry. You were trying to wake her from the dead. You were hugging her for warmth, for fear. It was almost morning, and I put my hand to my temples. I opened the shutters. I came into the room. I felt pity for you. Pity. But something else. I saw her lips slack, her eyes wide. You fed on me, she whispered. I was your victim. Yes, I said to her. I did it. There was a moment so elastic and painful as to be unbearable. She stood stark still in the shadows, her huge eyes gathering the light, the warm air rising suddenly with a soft noise. And then she turned. I heard the clicking of her slippers as she ran, and ran, and ran. I stood frozen, hearing the sound grow smaller and smaller, and then I turned, the fear in me unraveling, growing huge and insurmountable, and I ran after her. It was unthinkable that I not catch her, that I not overtake her at once, and tell her that I loved her, must have her, must keep her, and every second that I ran headlong down the dark street after her was like her slipping away from me, drop by drop. My heart was pounding, unfed, pounding and rebelling against the strain, until I came suddenly to a dead stop. She stood beneath a lamppost staring mutely as if she didn't know me. I took her small waist in both hands and lifted her into the light. She studied me, her face contorted, her head turning as if she wouldn't give me her direct glance, as if she must deflect an overpowering feeling of revulsion. You killed me, she whispered. You took my life. Yes, I said to her, holding her so that I could feel her heart pounding. Rather, I tried to take it, to drink it away. 
But you had a heart like no other heart I've ever felt, a heart that beat and beat until I had to let you go, had to cast you away from me, lest you quickened my pulse till I would die, and it was Lestat who found me out. Louis, the sentimentalist, the fool, feasting on a golden-haired child, a holy innocent, a little girl. He brought you back from the hospital where they'd put you, and I never knew what he meant to do except teach me my nature. Take her, finish it, he said, and I felt that passion for you again. Oh, I know I've lost you now, forever. I can see it in your eyes. You look at me as you look at mortals, from aloft, from some region of cold self-sufficiency I can't understand. But I did it. I felt it for you again, a vile, unsupportable hunger for your hammering heart, this cheek, this skin. You were pink and fragrant, as mortal children are, sweet with the bite of salt and dust. I held you again. I took you again. And when I thought your heart would kill me and I didn't care, he parted us, and gashing his own wrist, gave it to you to drink. And drink you did. And drink and drink until you nearly drained him and he was reeling. But you were a vampire then. And that very night you drank a human's blood, and have every night thereafter. Her face had not changed. The flesh was like the wax of ivory candles. Only the eyes showed life. There was nothing more to say to her. I set her down. I took your life, I said. He gave it back to you. And here it is, she said under her breath. And I hate you both. The vampire stopped. But why did you tell her? asked the boy after a respectful pause. How could I not tell her? The vampire looked up in mild astonishment. She had to know it. She had to weigh one thing against the other. It was not as if Lestat had taken her full from life as he had taken me. I had stricken her. She would have died. There would have been no mortal life for her. But what's the difference? For all of us it's a matter of years dying. So what she saw more graphically then was what all men knew, that death will come inevitably unless one chooses this. He opened his white hands now and looked at the palms. And did you lose her? Did she go? Go? Where would she have gone? She was a child, no bigger than that. Who would have sheltered her? Would she have found some vault, like a mythical vampire, lying down with worms and ants by day and rising to haunt some small cemetery in its surroundings? But that's not why she didn't go. Something in her was as akin to me as anything in her could have been. That thing in Lestat was the same. We could not bear to live alone. We needed our little company. A wilderness of mortals surrounded us, groping, blind, preoccupied, and the brides and bridegrooms of death. Locked together in hatred, she said to me calmly afterwards. I found her by the empty hearth, picking the small blossoms from a long stem of lavender. I was so relieved to see her there that I would have done anything, said anything, and when I heard her ask me in a low voice if I would tell her all I knew, I did this gladly. For all the rest was nothing compared to that old secret that I had claimed her life. I told her of myself, as I've told you, of how Lestat came to me, and what went on the night he carried her from the little hospital. She asked no questions, and only occasionally looked up from her flowers. 
And then, when it was finished and I was sitting there, staring again at that wretched skull, and listening to the soft slithering of the petals of the flowers on her dress, and feeling a dull misery in my limbs and mind, she said to me, I don't despise you. I wakened. She slipped off the high, rounded damask cushion and came towards me, covered with the scent of flowers, the petals in her hand. Is this the aroma of mortal child? she whispered. Louis, lover. I remember holding her and burying my head in her small chest, crushing her bird shoulders, her small hands working into my hair, soothing me, holding me. I was mortal to you, she said, and when I lifted my eyes I saw her smiling. But the softness on her lips was evanescent, and in a moment she was looking past me like someone listening for faint, important music. You gave me your immortal kiss, she said, though not to me but to herself. You loved me with your vampire nature. I love you now with my human nature, if ever I had it, I said to her. Ah, yes, she answered, still musing. Yes, and that's your flaw, and why your face was miserable when I said, as humans say, I hate you, and why you look at me as you do now. Human nature. I have no human nature. And no short story of a mother's corpse and hotel rooms where children learn monstrosity can give me one. I have none. Your eyes grow cold with fear when I say this to you. Yet I have your tongue your passion for the truth, your need to drive the needle of the mind right to the heart of it all, like the beak of the hummingbird, who beats so wild and fast that mortals might think he had no tiny feet, could never set, just go from quest to quest, going again and again for the heart of it. I am your vampire self more than you are. And now the sleep of sixty-five years has ended. The sleep of sixty-five years has ended. I heard her say it, disbelieving, not wanting to believe she knew and meant precisely what she'd said, for it had been exactly that since the night I'd tried to leave Lestat and failed, and falling in love with her forgot my teeming brain, my awful questions. And now she had the awful questions on her lips, and must know. She'd strolled slowly to the center of the room and strewn the crumpled lavender all around her. She broke the brittle stem and touched it to her lips, and having heard the whole story, said, He made me, then, to be your companion. No chains could have held you in your loneliness, and he could give you nothing. He gives me nothing. I used to think him charming. I liked the way he walked, the way he tapped the flagstones with his walking stick and swung me in his arms, and the abandon with which he killed, which was as I felt. But I no longer find him charming, and you never have. And we've been his puppets, you and I, you remaining to take care of him and I your saving companion. Now's time to end it, Louis. Now's time to leave him. Time to leave him. I hadn't thought of it, dreamed of it in so long. I'd grown accustomed to him as if he were a condition of life itself. I could hear a vague mingling of sounds now, which meant he had entered the carriageway that he would soon be on the back stairs. And I thought of what I always felt when I heard him coming a vague anxiety, a vague need. And then the thought of being free of him forever rushed over me, like water I'd forgotten, waves and waves of cool water. I was standing now, whispering to her that he was coming. I know, she smiled. I heard him when he turned the far corner. But he'll never let us leave, I whispered. 
though I'd caught the implication of her words. Her vampire sense was keen. She stood on guard magnificently. But you don't know him if you think he'll let us leave, I said to her, alarmed at her self-confidence. He will not let us go. And she, still smiling, said, Oh, really? It was agreed then to make plans, at once. The following night my agent came with his usual complaints about doing business by the light of one wretched candle and took my explicit orders for an ocean crossing. Claudia and I would go to Europe, on the first available ship, regardless of what port we had to settle for. And paramount was that an important chest be shipped with us, a chest which might have to be fetched carefully from our house during the day and put on board, not in the freight, but in our cabin. And then there were arrangements for Lestat. I had planned to leave him the rents for several shops and townhouses and a small construction company operating in the Faubourg Marigny. I put my signature to these things readily. I wanted to buy our freedom. To convince Lestat we wanted only to take a trip together and that he could remain in the style to which he was accustomed. He would have his own money and need come to me for nothing. For all these years I'd kept him dependent on me. Of course he demanded his funds from me as if I were merely his banker and thanked me with the most acrimonious words at his command, but he loathed his dependence. I hoped to deflect his suspicion by playing to his greed and, convinced that he could read any emotion in my face, I was more than fearful. I did not believe it would be possible to escape him. Do you understand what that means? I acted as though I believed it, but I did not. Claudia, meantime, was flirting with disaster, her equanimity overwhelming to me as she read her vampire books and asked Lestat questions. She remained undisturbed by his caustic outbursts, sometimes asking the same question over and over again in different ways, and carefully considering what little information he might let escape in spite of himself. "'What vampire made you what you are?' she asked, without looking up from her book and keeping her lids lowered under his onslaught. "'Why do you never talk about him?' she went on, as if his fierce objections were thin air. She seemed immune to his irritation. "'You're greedy, both of you,' he said the next night as he paced back and forth in the dark of the center of the room, turning a vengeful eye on Claudia, who was fitted into her corner in the circle of her candle flame, her books in stacks about her. "'Immortality is not enough for you. No, you would look the gift-horse of God in the mouth. I could offer it to any man out there in the street, and he would jump for it.' "'Did you jump for it?' she asked softly, her lips barely moving. But you, you would know the reason for it. Do you want to end it? I can give you death more easily than I gave you life. He turned to me, her fragile flame, throwing his shadow across me. It made a halo around his blonde hair and left his face except for the gleaming cheekbone dark. Do you want death? Consciousness is not death, she whispered. Answer me, do you want death? And you give all these things. They proceed from you, life and death, she whispered, mocking him. I have, he said, I do. You know nothing, she said to him gravely, her voice so low that the slightest noise from the street interrupted it, might carry her words away, so that I found myself straining to hear her against myself as I lay with my head back against the chair. And suppose the vampire who made you knew nothing, and the vampire who made that vampire knew nothing, and the vampire before him knew nothing, and so it goes back and back, nothing proceeding from nothing, until there is nothing. And we must live with the knowledge that there is no knowledge. Yes! he cried out suddenly, his hands out, his voice tinged with something other than anger. He was silent. She was silent. He turned, 
slowly, as if I had made some movement which alerted him, as if I were rising behind him. It reminded me of the way humans turn when they feel my breath against them, and know suddenly that where they thought themselves to be utterly alone, that moment of awful suspicion before they see my face and gasp, he was looking at me now, and I could barely see his lips moving. And then I sensed it. He was afraid. Lestat afraid. And she was staring at him with the same level gaze, evincing no emotion, no thought. You infected her with this, he whispered. He struck a match now, with a sharp crackle, and lit the mantel candles, lifted the smoky shades of the lamps, went around the room making light, until Claudia's small flame took on a solidity, and he stood with his back to the marble mantel, looking from light to light, as if they restored some peace. I'm going out, he said. She rose the instant he had reached the street. And suddenly she stopped in the center of the room and stretched, her tiny back arched, her arms straight up into small fists, her eyes squeezed shut for a moment and then wide open as if you were waking to the room from a dream. There was something obscene about her gesture. The room seemed to shimmer with Lestat's fear, echo with his last response. It demanded her attention. I must have made some involuntary movement to turn away from her, because she was standing at the arm of my chair now and pressing her hand flat upon my book, a book I hadn't been reading for hours. Come out with me. You were right. He knows nothing. There is nothing he can tell us, I said to her. Did you ever really think that he did? She asked me in the same small voice. We'll find others of our kind, she said. We'll find them in Central Europe. That is where they live in such numbers that the stories, both fiction and fact, fill volumes. I'm convinced it was from there that all vampires came, if they came from any place at all. We've tarried too long with him. Come out. Let the flesh instruct the mind. I think I felt a tremor of delight when she said these words. Let the flesh instruct the mind. Put books aside and kill, she was whispering to me. I followed her down the stairs, across the courtyard, and down a narrow alley to another street. Then she turned with outstretched arms for me to pick her up and carry her, though of course she was not tired. She wanted only to be near my ear, to clutch my neck. I haven't told him my plan about the voyage, the money. I was saying to her, conscious of something about her that was beyond me as she rode my measured steps, weightless in my arms. He killed the other vampire, she said. No, why do you say this? I asked her. But it wasn't the saying of it that disturbed me, stirred my soul as if it were a pool of water longing to be still. I felt as if she were moving me slowly towards something, as if she were the pilot of our slow walk through the dark street. Because I know it now, she said with authority. The vampire made a slave of him, and he would no more be a slave than I would be a slave, and so he killed him. Killed him before he knew what he might know, and then in a panic made a slave of you. And you've been his slave. Never really, I whispered to her. I felt the press of her cheek against my temple. She was cold and needed the kill. Not a slave, just some sort of mindless accomplice, I confessed to her, confessed to myself. I could feel the fever for the kill rising in me, a knot of hunger in my insides, a throbbing in the temples, as if the veins were contracting and my body might become a map of tortured vessels. No, slave, she persisted in her grave monotone, as though thinking aloud, the words, revelations, pieces of a puzzle. 
and I shall free us both. I stopped. Her hand pressed me, urged me on. We were walking down the long, wide alley beside the cathedral, towards the lights of Jackson Square, the water rushing fast in the gutter down the center of the alley, silver in the moonlight. She said, I will kill him. I stood still at the end of the alley. I felt her shift in my arm, move down as if she could accomplish being free of me without the awkward aid of my hands. I set her on the stone sidewalk. I said no to her. I shook my head. I had that feeling then which I described before, that the building around me, the cabildo, the cathedral, the apartments along the square, all this was silk and illusion and would ripple suddenly in a horrific wind, and a chasm would open in the earth that was the reality. Claudia, I gasped, turning away from her. And why not kill him? she said now, her voice rising, silvery, and finally shrill. I have no use for him. I can get nothing from him, and he causes me pain which I will not abide. And if he had so little use for us, I said to her. But the vehemence was false, hopeless. She was at a distance from me now, small shoulders straight and determined, her pace rapid, like a little girl who, walking out on Sundays with her parents, wants to walk ahead and pretend she is all alone. Claudia! I called after her, catching up with her in a stride. I reached for the small waist and felt her stiffen as if she had become iron. Claudia, you cannot kill him, I whispered. She moved backwards, skipping, clicking on the stones, and moved out into the open street. A cabriolet rolled past us with a sudden surge of laughter and the clatter of horses and wooden wheels. The street was suddenly silent. I reached out for her and moved forward over an immense space and found her standing at the gate of Jackson Square, hands gripping the wrought iron bars. I drew down close to her. I don't care what you feel. What you say you cannot mean to kill him, I said to her. And why not? Do you think him so strong? She said, her eyes on the statue in the square, two immense pools of light. He is stronger than you know, stronger than you dream. How do you mean to kill him? You can't measure his skill. You don't know. I pleaded with her, but could see her utterly unmoved, like a child staring in fascination through the window of a toy shop. Her tongue moved suddenly between her teeth and touched her lower lip in a strange flicker that sent a mild shock through my body. I tasted blood. I felt something palpable and helpless in my hands. I wanted to kill. I could smell and hear humans on the paths of the square, moving about the market, along the levee. I was about to take her, making her look at me, shake her if I had to, to make her listen, when she turned to me with her great, liquid eyes. I love you, Louis, she said. Then listen to me, Claudia, I beg you. I whispered, holding her, pricked suddenly by a nearby collection of whispers, the slow, rising articulation of human speech over the mingled sounds of the night. He'll destroy you if you try to kill him. There is no way you can do such a thing for sure. You don't know how. And pitting yourself against him, you'll lose everything, Claudia. I can't bear this. There was a barely perceptible smile on her lips. No, Louis, she whispered. I can kill him. And I want to tell you something else now, a secret between you and me. I shook my head, but she pressed even closer to me, lowering her lids so that her rich lashes almost brushed the roundness of her cheeks. The secret is, Louis, that I want to kill him. I will enjoy it. I knelt beside her, speechless, her eyes studying me as they'd done so often in the past, and then she said, I kill humans every night. I seduce them, draw them close to me, with an insatiable hunger, a constant, never-ending search for something, something I don't know what it is. 
She brought her fingers to her lips now and pressed her lips, her mouth partly open so I could see the gleam of her teeth. And I care nothing about them, where they came from, where they would go, if I did not meet them on the way. But I dislike him. I want him dead, and will have him dead. I shall enjoy it. But Claudia, he is not mortal. He is immortal. No illness can touch him. Age has no power over him. You threaten a life which might endure to the end of the world. Ah, yes, that's it precisely, she said with reverential awe. A lifetime that might have endured for centuries. Such blood, such power. Do you think I'll possess his power and my own power when I take him? I was enraged now. I rose suddenly and turned away from her. I could hear the whispering of humans near me. They were whispering of the father and the daughter, of some frequent sight of loving devotion. I realized they were talking of us. It's not necessary. I said to her, "It goes beyond all need, all common sense, all what? Humanity? He's a killer," she hissed. "Lone predator," she repeated his own term, mocking it. "Don't interfere with me or seek to know the time I choose to do it, nor try to come between us." She raised her hand now to hush me and caught mine in an iron grasp, her tiny fingers biting into my tight, tortured flesh. If you do, you will bring me destruction by your interference. I can't be discouraged. She was gone then, in a flurry of bonnet ribbons and clicking slippers. I turned, paying no attention to where I went, wishing the city would swallow me, conscious now of the hunger rising to overtake reason. I was almost loath to put an end to it. I needed to let the lust, the excitement, blot out all consciousness, and I thought of the kill over and over and over, walking slowly up this street and down the next, moving inexorably towards it, saying, "It's a string which is pulling me through the labyrinth. I am not pulling the string; the string is pulling me." And then I stood in the Rue Conti, listening to a dull thundering, a familiar sound. It was the fencers above in the salon, advancing on the hollow wooden floor, forward, back again, scuttling, and the silver zinging of the foils. I stood back against the wall, where I could see them through the high naked windows. The young men dueling late into the night, left arm poised like the arm of a dancer, grace advancing towards death, grace thrusting for the heart. Images of the young Frenier now driving the silver blade forward, now being pulled by it towards hell. Someone had come down the narrow wooden steps to the street. A young boy. A boy so young he had the smooth, plump cheeks of a child. His face was pink and flushed from the fencing, and beneath his smart gray coat and ruffled shirt there was the sweet smell of cologne and salt. I could feel his heat as he emerged from the dim light of the stairwell. He was laughing to himself, talking almost inaudibly to himself. His brown hair falling down over his eyes as he went along, shaking his head. The whispers rising, then falling off. Then he stopped short, his eyes on me. He stared, and his eyelids quivered, and he laughed quickly, nervously. "Excuse me," he said now in French. "You gave me a start." And then, just as he moved to make a ceremonial bow and perhaps go around me, he stood still, and the shock spread over his flushed face. I could see the heart beating in the pink flesh of his cheeks, smell the sudden sweat of his young, taut body. You saw me in the lamplight," I said to him, "and my face looked to you like the mask of death." His lips parted and his teeth touched, and involuntarily he nodded, his eyes dazed. "Pass by," I said to him, "fast." This ends disc five. Interview with the Vampire, Disc Six. The Vampire paused, then moved as if he meant to go on. 
but he stretched his long legs under the table and, leaning back, pressed his hands to his head, as if exerting a great pressure on his temples. The boy, who had drawn himself up into a crouched position, his hands hugging his arms, unwound slowly. He glanced at the tapes and then back at the vampire. But you killed someone that night, he said. Every night, said the vampire. Why did you let him go, then? asked the boy. I don't know, said the vampire, but it did not have the tone of truly I don't know, but rather let it be. You look tired, said the vampire. You look cold. It doesn't matter, said the boy quickly. The room's a little cold. I don't care about that. You're not cold, are you? No. The vampire smiled, and then his shoulders moved with silent laughter. A moment passed in which the vampire seemed to be thinking and the boy to be studying the vampire's face. The vampire's eyes moved to the boy's watch. She didn't succeed, did she? The boy asked softly. What do you honestly think? asked the vampire. He had settled back in his chair. He looked at the boy intently. That she was... As you said, destroyed, said the boy. And he seemed to feel the word so that he swallowed after he'd said the word destroyed. Was she? he asked. Don't you think that she could do it? asked the vampire. But he was so powerful. You said yourself you never knew what powers he had, what secrets he knew. How could she even be sure how to kill him? How did she try? The vampire looked at the boy for a long time, his expression unreadable to the boy, who found himself looking away as though the vampire's eyes were burning lights. "'Why don't you drink from that bottle in your pocket?' asked the vampire. "'It will make you warm.' "'Oh, that,' said the boy. "'I was going to. I just—' The vampire laughed. "'You didn't think it was polite,' he said." and he suddenly slapped his thigh. That's true, the boy shrugged, smiling now, and he took the small flask out of his jacket pocket, unscrewed the gold cap, and took a sip. He held the bottle, now looking at the vampire. No, the vampire smiled and raised his hand to wave away the offer. Then his face became serious again, and sitting back, he went on. Lestat had a musician friend in the Rue du Maine. We had seen him at a recital in the home of Madame Leclerc, who lived there also, which was at that time an extremely fashionable street. And this Madame Leclerc, with whom Lestat was also occasionally amusing himself, had found the musician a room in another mansion nearby, where Lestat visited him often. I told you he played with his victims made friends with them, seduced them into trusting and liking him, even loving him, before he killed. So he apparently played with this young boy, though it had gone on longer than any other such friendship I had ever observed. The young boy wrote good music, and often Lestat brought fresh sheets of it home and played the songs on the square grand in our parlor. The boy had a great talent, but you could tell that this music would not sell, because it was too disturbing. Lestat gave him money and spent evening after evening with him, often taking him to restaurants the boy could never have afforded, and he bought him all the paper and pens which he needed for the writing of his music. As I said, it had gone on far longer than any such friendship Lestat had ever had, and I could not tell whether he had actually become fond of a mortal in spite of himself, or was simply moving towards a particularly grand betrayal and cruelty. Several times he'd indicated to Claudia and me that he was headed out to kill the boy directly, but he had not. And, of course, I never asked him what he felt, because it wasn't worth the great uproar my question would have produced. Lestat, entranced with a mortal, he probably would have destroyed the parlor furniture in a rage. The next night, 
after that which I had just described to you. He jarred me miserably by asking me to go with him to the boy's flat. He was positively friendly in one of those moods when he wanted my companionship. Enjoyment could bring that out of him. Wanting to see a good play, the regular opera, the ballet, he always wanted me along. I think we must have seen Macbeth with him fifteen times. We went to every performance, even those by amateurs, and Lestat would stride home afterwards, repeating the lines to me, and even shouting out to passers-by with an outstretched finger, "'Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow,' until they skirted him as if he were drunk. But this effervescence was frenetic, and likely to vanish in an instant. Just a word or two of amiable feeling on my part, some suggestion that I found his companionship pleasant, could banish all such affairs for months, even years. But now he came to me in such a mood, and asked me to go to the boy's room. He was not above pressing my arm as he urged me, and I, dull, catatonic, gave him some miserable excuse, thinking only of Claudia, of the agent of imminent disaster. I could feel it, and wondered that he did not feel it, and finally he picked up a book from the floor and threw it at me, shouting, "'Read your damn poems, then! Rot!' and he bounded out. This disturbed me. I cannot tell you how it disturbed me. I wished him cold, impassive, gone. I resolved to plead with Claudia to drop this. I felt powerless and hopelessly fatigued. But her door had been locked until she left, and I had glimpsed her only for a second while Lestat was chattering, a vision of lace and loveliness as she slipped on her coat, puffed sleeves again, and a violet ribbon on her breast, her white lace stocking showing beneath the hem of the little gown, and her white slippers immaculate. She cast a cold look at me as she went out. When I returned later, satiated and for a while too sluggish for my own thoughts to bother me, I gradually began to sense that this was the night. She would try to-night. I cannot tell you how I knew this. Things about the flat disturbed me, alerted me. Claudia moved in the back parlor behind closed doors, and I fancied I heard another voice there, a whisper. Claudia never brought anyone to our flat. No one did, except Lestat, who brought his women of the streets. But I knew there was someone there. Yet I got no strong scent, no proper sounds. And then there were aromas in the air of food and drink, and chrysanthemums stood in the silver vase on the square grand, flowers which to Claudia meant death. Then Lestat came, singing something soft under his breath, his walking stick making a rat-tat-tat on the rails of the spiral stairs. He came down the long hall, his face flushed from the kill, his lips pink, and he set his music on the piano. Did I kill him, or did I not kill him? He flashed the question at me now with a pointing finger. What's your guess? You did not, I said numbly, because you invited me to go with you and would never have invited me to share that kill. Ah, but did I kill him in a rage because you would not go with me? he said, and threw back the cover from the keys. I could see that he would be able to go on like this until dawn. He was exhilarated. I watched him flip through the music, thinking, Can he die? Can he actually die? And does she mean to do this? At one point I wanted to go to her and tell her we must abandon everything, even the proposed trip, and live as we had before. But I had the feeling now that there was no retreat. Since the day she'd begun to question him, this, whatever it was to be, was inevitable, and I felt a weight on me holding me in the chair. He pressed two cords with his hands. He had an immense reach, and even in life could have been a fine pianist. But he played without feeling. 
He was always outside the music, drawing it out of the piano as if by magic, by the virtuosity of his vampire senses and control. The music did not come through him, was not drawn through him by himself. Well, did I kill him? he asked me again. No, you did not, I said again, though I could just as easily have said the opposite. I was concentrating on keeping my face a mask. You're right, I did not, he said. It excites me to be close to him, to think over and over I can kill him, and I will kill him, but not now. And then to leave him and find someone who looks as nearly like him as possible. If he had brothers, why, I'd kill them one by one. The family would succumb to a mysterious fever which dried up the very blood in their bodies, he said, now mocking a barker's tone. Claudia has a taste for families. Speaking of families, I suppose you heard. The Frenier place is supposed to be haunted. They can't keep an overseer and the slaves run away. This was something I did not wish to hear in particular. Babette had died young, insane, restrained finally from wandering toward the ruins of pont du lac insisting she had seen the devil there and must find him. I'd heard of it in wisps of gossip. And then came the funeral notices. I'd thought occasionally of going to her, of trying some way to rectify what I had done, and other times I thought it would all heal itself. And in my new life of nightly killing, I had grown far from the attachment I'd felt for her, or for my sister, or any mortal. And I watched the tragedy finally, as one might from a theater balcony, moved from time to time, but never sufficiently to jump the railing and join the players on the stage. Don't talk of her, I said. Very well. I was talking of the plantation, not her, her, your lady love, your fancy. He smiled at me. You know I had it all my way, finally, in the end, didn't I? But I was telling you about my young friend and how I wish you would play the music, I said softly, unobtrusively, but as persuasively as possible. Sometimes this worked with Lestat. If I said something just right, he found himself doing what I'd said. And now he did just that. With a little snarl, as if to say, you fool, he began playing the music. I heard the doors of the back parlor open, and Claudia's steps moved down the hall. Don't come, Claudia, I was thinking, feeling. Go away from it before we're all destroyed. But she came on steadily until she reached the hall mirror. I could hear her opening the small table drawer, and then the zinging of her hairbrush. She was wearing a floral perfume. I turned slowly to face her as she appeared in the door, still all in white, and moved across the carpet silently toward the piano. She stood at the end of the keyboard, her hands folded on the wood, her chin resting on her hands, her eyes fixed on Lestat. I could see his profile and her small face beyond, looking up at him. "'What is it now?' he said, turning his page and letting his hand drop to his thigh. "'You irritate me. Your very presence irritates me.' His eyes moved over the page. "'Does it?' she said in her sweetest voice. "'Yes, it does. And I'll tell you something else.' I've met someone who would make a better vampire than you do. This stunned me, but I didn't have to urge him to go on. Do you get my meaning? he said to her. Is it supposed to frighten me? she asked. You're spoiled because you're an only child, he said. You need a brother. Or rather, I need a brother. I get weary of you both greedy, brooding vampires that haunt our own lives. I dislike it. I suppose we could people the world with vampires, the three of us, she said. You think so? 
he said, smiling, his voice with a note of triumph. Do you think you could do it? I suppose Lewis has told you how it was done, or how he thinks it was done. You don't have the power, either of you, he said. This seemed to disturb her, something she had not accounted for. She was studying him. I could see she did not entirely believe him. And what gave you the power? she asked softly, but with a touch of sarcasm. That, my dear, is one of those things which you may never know, for even the Erebus in which we live must have its aristocracy. You're a liar, she said with a short laugh. And just as he touched his fingers to the keys again, she said, But you upset my plans. Your plans? he asked. I came to make peace with you, even if you are the father of lies. You're my father, she said. I want to make peace with you. I want things to be as they were. Now he was the one who did not believe. He threw a glance at me, then looked at her. That can be. Just stop asking me questions. Stop following me. Stop searching in every alleyway for other vampires. There are no other vampires. And this is where you live, and this is where you stay. He looked confused for the moment, as if raising his own voice had confused him. I take care of you. You don't need anything. And you don't know anything. And that is why you detest my questions. All that's clear. So now let's have peace, because there's nothing else to be had. I have a present for you. And I hope it's a beautiful woman with endowments you'll never possess, he said, looking her up and down. Her face changed when he did this. It was as if she almost lost some control I'd never seen her lose. But then she just shook her head and reached out one small rounded arm and tugged at his sleeve. I meant what I said. I'm weary of arguing with you. Hell is hatred, people living together in eternal hatred. We're not in hell. You can take the present or not. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Only let's have an end to all this before Lewis in disgust leaves us both. She was urging him now to leave the piano, bringing down the wooden cover again over the keys, turning him on the piano stool until his eyes followed her to the door. You're serious. Present? What do you mean, present? You haven't fed enough. I can tell by your color, by your eyes. You've never fed enough at this hour. Let's say that I can give you a precious moment. Suffer the little children to come unto me, she whispered, and was gone. He looked at me. I said nothing. I might as well have been drugged. I could see the curiosity in his face, the suspicion. He followed her down the hall. And then I heard him let out a long, conscious moan, a perfect mingling of hunger and lust. When I reached the door, and I took my time. He was bending over the settee. Two small boys lay there, nestled among the soft velvet pillows, totally abandoned to sleep as children can be, their pink mouths open, their small round faces utterly smooth. Their skin was moist, radiant, the curls of the darker of the two damp and pressed to the forehead. I saw at once by their pitiful and identical clothes that they were orphans, and they had ravaged a meal set before them on our best china. The tablecloth was stained with wine, and a small bottle stood half full among the greasy plates and forks. But there was an aroma in the room I did not like. I moved closer, better to see the sleeping ones, and I could see their throats were bare but untouched, Lestat had sunk down beside the darker one. He was by far the more beautiful. He might have been lifted to the painted dome of a cathedral. No more than seven years old, he had that perfect beauty that is of neither sex but angelic.
Lestat brought his hand down gently on the pale throat, and then he touched the silken lips. He let out a sigh, which had again that longing, that sweet, painful anticipation. Oh, Claudia, he sighed, you've outdone yourself. Where did you find them? She said nothing. She had receded to a dark armchair and sat back against two large pillows, her legs out straight on the rounded cushion, her ankles drooping so that you did not see the bottom of her white slippers but the curved insteps and the tight, delicate little straps. She was staring at Lestat. Drunk on brandy wine, she said, a thimbleful, and gestured to the table. I thought of you when I saw them. I thought if I share this with him, even he will forgive. He was warmed by her flattery. He looked at her now and reached out and clutched her white lace ankle. Ducky, he whispered to her and laughed. But then he hushed as if he didn't wish to wake the doomed children. He gestured to her intimately, seductively. Come, sit beside him. You take him and I'll take this one. Come. He embraced her as she passed and nestled beside the other boy. He stroked the boy's moist hair. He ran his fingers over the rounded lids and along the fringe of lashes. And then he put his whole softened hand across the boy's face and felt at the temples, cheeks and jaw, massaging the unblemished flesh. He had forgotten I was there or she was there, but he withdrew his hand and sat still for a moment, as though his desire was making him dizzy. He glanced at the ceiling and then down at the perfect feast. He turned the boy's head slowly against the back of the couch, and the boy's eyebrows tensed for an instant, and a moan escaped his lips. Claudia's eyes were steady on Lestat, though now she raised her left hand, and slowly undid the buttons of the child who lay beside her and reached inside the shabby little shirt and felt the bare flesh. Lestat did the same, but suddenly it was as if his hand had life itself and drew his arm into the shirt and around the boy's small chest in a tight embrace, and Lestat slid down off the cushions of the couch to his knees on the floor, his arm locked to the boy's body, pulling it up close to him so that his face was buried in the boy's neck. His lips moved over the neck and over the chest and over the tiny nipple of the chest, and then putting his other arm into the open shirt so that the boy lay hopelessly wound in both arms, he drew the boy up tight and sank his teeth into his throat. The boy's head fell back, the curls loose, as he was lifted, and again he let out a small moan, and his eyelids fluttered, but never opened. And Lestat knelt, the boy pressed against him, sucking hard, his own back arched and rigid, his body rocking back and forth, carrying the boy, his long moans rising and falling in time with the slow rocking, until suddenly his whole body tensed, and his hands seemed to grope for some way to push the boy away, as if the boy himself in his helpless slumber were clinging to Lestat. And finally he embraced the boy again and moved slowly forward over him, letting him down among the pillows, the sucking softer, now almost inaudible. He withdrew. His hands pressed the boy down. He knelt there, his head thrown back, so the wavy blond hair hung loose and disheveled. And then he slowly sank to the floor, turning, his back against the leg of the couch. Ah! God, he whispered, his head back, his lids half-mast. I could see the color rushing to his cheeks, rushing into his hands. One hand lay on his bent knee, fluttering, and then it lay still. Claudia had not moved. She lay like a Botticelli angel beside the unharmed boy. The other's body already withered the neck like a fractured stem, the heavy head falling now at an odd angle, the angle of death into the pillow. But something was wrong. Lestat was staring at the ceiling. 
I could see his tongue between his teeth. He lay too still, the tongue, as it were, trying to get out of the mouth, trying to move past the barrier of the teeth and touch the lip. He appeared to shiver, his shoulders convulsing, then relaxing heavily. Yet he did not move. A veil had fallen over his clear gray eyes. He was peering at the ceiling. Then a sound came out of him. I stepped forward from the shadows of the hallway, but Claudia said in a sharp hiss, Go back! Louis, he was saying, I could hear it now, Louis, Louis. Don't you like it, Lestat? she asked him. Something's wrong with it, he gasped, and his eyes widened as if the mere speaking were a colossal effort. He could not move. I saw it. He could not move at all. Claudia, he gasped again, and his eyes rolled towards her. Don't you like the taste of children's blood? she asked softly. Louis, he whispered, finally lifting his head just for an instant. It fell back on the couch. Louis, it's... it's absinthe. Too much absinthe, he gasped. She's poisoned them with it. She's poisoned me, Louis. He tried to raise his hand. I drew nearer, the table between us. Stay back, she said again. And now she slid off the couch and approached him, peering down into his face as he had peered at the child. Absinthe, father, she said, and laudanum. Demon, he said to her. Louis, put me in my coffin. He struggled to rise. Put me in my coffin. His voice was hoarse, barely audible. The hand fluttered, lifted, and fell back. I'll put you in your coffin, father she said, as though she were soothing him. I'll put you in it forever. And then, from beneath the pillows of the couch, she drew a kitchen knife. Claudia, don't do this thing, I said to her, but she flashed at me a virulency I'd never seen in her face. And as I stood there, paralyzed, she gashed his throat, and he let out a sharp, choking cry. God, he shouted out, God! The blood poured out of him down his shirt front, down his coat. It poured as it might never pour from a human being, all the blood with which he had filled himself before the child and from the child, and he kept turning his head, twisting, making the bubbling gash gape. She sank the knife into his chest now, and he pitched forward, his mouth wide, his fangs exposed, both hands convulsively flying towards the knife, fluttering around its handle, slipping off its handle. He looked up at me, the hair falling down into his eyes. Louis, Louis! He let out one more gasp and fell sideways on the carpet. She stood looking down at him. The blood flowed everywhere like water. He was groaning, trying to raise himself, one arm pinned beneath his chest, the other shoving at the floor. And now suddenly she flew at him, and clamping both arms about his neck, bit deep into him as he struggled. Louis, Louis, he gasped over and over, struggling, trying desperately to throw her off, but she rode him, her body lifted by his shoulder, hoisted and dropped, hoisted and dropped until she pulled away. And finding the floor, quickly, she backed away from him, her hands to her lips, her eyes for the moment clouded, then clear. I turned away from her, my body convulsed by what I'd seen, unable to look any longer. Lewis, she said, but I only shook my head. For a moment the whole house seemed to sway, but she said, Look what's happening to him. He had ceased to move. He lay now on his back, and his entire body was shriveling, drying up, the skin thick and wrinkled and so white that all the tiny veins showed through it, I gasped, but I could not take my eyes off it, even as the shape of the bones began to show through, his lips drawing back from his teeth, the flesh of his nose drying to two gaping holes. But his eyes, they remained the same, staring wildly at the ceiling, the irises dancing from side to side, even as the flesh cleaved to the bones, became nothing but a parchment wrapping for the bones, the clothes hollow and limp over the skeleton that remained. Finally the irises rolled to the top of his head, 
and the whites of his eyes went dim. The thing lay still. A great mass of wavy blonde hair, a coat, a pair of gleaming boots, and this horror that had been Lestat, and I staring helplessly at it. For a long time Claudia merely stood there. Blood had soaked the carpet, darkening the woven wreaths of flowers. It gleamed sticky and black on the floorboards. It stained her dress, her white shoes, her cheek. She wiped at it with a crumpled napkin, took a swipe at the impossible stains of the dress, and then she said, Louis, you must help me get him out of here. I said, No! I turned my back on her, on the corpse at her feet. Are you mad, Louis? It can't remain here she said to me. And the boys, you must help me. The other one's dead from the absinthe. Louis! I knew that this was true, necessary, and yet it seemed impossible. She had to prod me then, almost lead me every step of the way. We found the kitchen stove still heaped with the bones of the mother and daughter she'd killed, a dangerous blunder, a stupidity. So she scraped them out now into a sack and dragged the sack across the courtyard stones to the carriage. I hitched the horse myself, shushing the groggy coachman, and drove the hearse out of the city, fast, in the direction of the Bayou Saint-Jean, toward the dark swamp that stretched to Lake Pontchartrain. She sat beside me, silent, as we rode on and on, until we'd passed the gas-lit gates of the few country houses, and the shell road narrowed and became rutted, the swamp rising on either side of us, a great wall of seemingly impenetrable cypress and vine. I could smell the stench of the muck, hear the rustling of the animals. Claudia had wrapped Lestat's body in a sheet before I would even touch it, and then, to my horror, she had sprinkled it over with the long-stemmed chrysanthemums. So it had a sweet, funereal smell as I lifted it last of all from the carriage. It was almost weightless, as limp as something made of knots and cords, as I put it over my shoulder and moved down into the dark water, the water rising and filling my boots, my feet seeking some path in the ooze beneath, away from where I'd laid the two boys. I went deeper and deeper in with Lestat's remains, why I did not know. And finally, when I could barely see the pale space of the road and the sky which was coming dangerously close to dawn, I let his body slip down out of my arms into the water. I stood there, shaken, looking at the amorphous form of the white sheet beneath the slimy surface. The numbness which had protected me since the carriage left the Rue Royale threatened to lift and leave me flayed suddenly, staring, thinking, this is Lestat. This is all of transformation and mystery, dead, gone into eternal darkness. I felt a pull suddenly, as if some force were urging me to go down with him, to descend into the dark water and never come back. It was so distinct and so strong that it made the articulation of voices seem only a murmur by comparison. It spoke without language, saying, You know what you must do. Come down into the darkness. Let it all go away. But at that moment I heard Claudia's voice. She was calling my name. I turned, and through the tangled vines I saw her, distant and tiny, like a white flame on the faint, luminescent shell road. That morning she wound her arms around me, pressed her head against my chest in the closeness of the coffin, whispering she loved me, that we were free now of Lestat forever. I love you, Louis, she said over and over, as the darkness finally came down with the lid and mercifully blotted out all consciousness. When I awoke, she was going through his things. It was a tirade, 
silent, controlled, but filled with a fierce anger. She pulled the contents from cabinets, empty drawers onto the carpets, pulled one jacket after another from his armoires, turning the pockets inside out, throwing the coins and theater tickets and bits and pieces of paper away. I stood in the door of his room, astonished, watching her. His coffin lay there, heaped with scarves and pieces of tapestry. I had the compulsion to open it. I had the wish to see him there. Nothing, she finally said in disgust. She wadded the clothes into the grate. Not a hint of where he came from, who made him, she said. Not a scrap. She looked to me as if for sympathy. I turned away from her. I was unable to look at her. I moved back into that bedroom which I kept for myself, that room filled with my own books and what things I'd saved from my mother and sister, and I sat on the bed. I could hear her at the door, but I would not look at her. He deserved to die, she said to me. Then we deserve to die, the same way, every night of our lives. I said back to her, Go away from me. It was as if my words were my thoughts, my mind alone only formless confusion. I'll care for you because you can't care for yourself. But I don't want you near me. Sleep in that box you bought for yourself. Don't come near me. I told you I was going to do it. I told you, she said. Never had her voice sounded so fragile, so like a little silvery bell. I looked up at her, startled but unshaken. Her face seemed not her face. Never had anyone shaped such agitation into the features of a doll. Lewis, I told you, she said, her lips quivering. I did it for us, so we could be free. I couldn't stand the sight of her. Her beauty, her seeming innocence, and this terrible agitation. I went past her, perhaps knocking her backwards, I don't know. And I was almost to the railing of the steps when I heard a strange sound. Never in all the years of our life together had I heard this sound. Never since the night long ago, when I had first found her, a mortal child, clinging to her mother. She was crying. It drew me back now, against my will. Yet it sounded so unconscious, so hopeless, as though she meant no one to hear it, or didn't care if it were heard by the whole world. I found her lying on my bed, in the place where I often sat to read, her knees drawn up, her whole frame shaking with her sobs. The sound of it was terrible. It was more heartfelt, more awful than her mortal crying had ever been. I sat down slowly, gently beside her, and put my hand on her shoulder. She lifted her head, startled, her eyes wide, her mouth trembling. Her face was stained with tears, tears that were tinted with blood. Her eyes brimmed with them, and the faint touch of red stained her tiny hand. She didn't seem to be conscious of this to see it. She pushed her hair back from her forehead. Her body quivered then, with a long, low, pleading sob. Louis, if I lose you, I have nothing, she whispered. I would undo it to have you back. I can't undo what I've done. She put her arms around me, climbing up against me, sobbing against my heart. My hands were reluctant to touch her, and then they moved as if I couldn't stop them, to enfold her and hold her and stroke her hair. I can't live without you she whispered. I would die rather than live without you. I would die the same way he died. I can't bear you to look at me the way you did. I cannot bear it if you do not love me. Her sobs grew worse, more bitter, until finally I bent and kissed her soft neck and cheeks. Winter plums. Plums from an enchanted wood where the fruit never falls from the boughs where the flowers never wither and die. 
All right, my dear, I said to her. All right, my love. And I rocked her slowly, gently in my arms, until she dozed, murmuring something about our being eternally happy, free of Lestat forever, beginning the great adventure of our lives. The great adventure of our lives. What does it mean to die when you can live until the end of the world? And what is the end of the world except a phrase? Because who knows even what is the world itself? I had now lived in two centuries, seen the illusions of one utterly shattered by the other, been eternally young and eternally ancient, possessing no illusions, living moment to moment in a way that made me picture a silver clock ticking in a void, the painted face, the delicately carved hands looked upon by no one, looking out at no one, illuminated by a light which was not a light, like the light by which God made the world before he had made light. Ticking, 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 the precision of the clock in a room as vast as the universe. I was walking the streets again. Claudia gone her way to kill, the perfume of her hair and dress lingering on my fingertips, on my coat, my eyes moving far ahead of me like the pale beam of a lantern. I found myself at the cathedral. What does it mean to die when you can live until the end of the world? I was thinking of my brother's death, of the incense and the rosary. I had the desire suddenly to be in that funeral room, listening to the sound of the women's voices rising and falling with the aves, the clicking of the beads, the smell of the wax. I could remember the crying. It was palpable, as if it were just yesterday, just behind a door. I saw myself walking fast down a corridor and gently giving the door a shove. The great façade of the cathedral rose in a dark mass opposite the square. But the doors were open, and I could see a soft flickering light within. It was Saturday evening, early, and the people were going to confession for Sunday Mass and Communion. Candles burned dim in the chandeliers. At the far end of the nave, the altar loomed out of the shadows, laden with white flowers. It was to the old church on this spot that they had brought my brother for the final service before the cemetery, and I realized suddenly that I hadn't been in this place since, never once come up the stone steps, crossed the porch, and passed through the open doors. I had no fear. If anything, perhaps I longed for something to happen, for the stones to tremble as I entered the shadowy foyer and saw the distant tabernacle on the altar. I remembered now that I had passed here once when the windows were ablaze and the sound of singing poured out into Jackson Square. I had hesitated then, wondering if there were some secret Lestat had never told me, something which might destroy me were I to enter. I had felt compelled to enter, but I had pushed this out of my mind, breaking loose from the fascination of the open doors, a throng of people making one voice. I had had something for Claudia, a doll I was taking to her, a bridal doll I'd lifted from a darkened toy shop window and placed in a great box with ribbons and tissue paper. A doll for Claudia. I remembered pressing on with it, hearing the heavy vibrations of the organ behind me, my eyes narrow from the great blaze of the candles. Now I thought of that moment that fear in me at the very sight of the altar, the sound of the pange lingua, and I thought again, persistently, of my brother. I could see the coffin rolling along up the center aisle, the procession of mourners behind it. I felt no fear now. 
As I said, I think, if anything, I felt a longing for some fear, for some reason for fear, as I moved slowly along the dark stone walls. The air was chill and damp in spite of summer. The thought of Claudia's doll came back to me. Where was that doll? For years Claudia had played with that doll. Suddenly I saw myself searching for the doll, in the relentless and meaningless manner one searches for something in a nightmare, coming on doors that won't open or drawers that won't shut, struggling over and over against the same meaningless thing, not knowing why the effort seems so desperate, why the sudden sight of a chair with a shawl thrown over it inspires the mind with horror. I was in the cathedral. A woman stepped out of the confessional and passed the long line of those who waited. A man who should have stepped up next did not move, and my eye, sensitive even in my vulnerable condition, noted this, and I turned to see him. He was staring at me. Quickly I turned my back on him. I heard him enter the confessional and shut the door. I walked up the aisle of the church, and then, more from exhaustion than from any conviction, went into an empty pew and sat down. I had almost genuflected from old habit. My mind seemed as muddled and tortured as that of any human. I closed my eyes for a moment and tried to banish all thoughts. Hear and see, I said to myself. And with this act of will, my senses emerged from the torment. All around me in the gloom I heard the whisper of prayers, the tiny click of the rosary beads, soft the sighing of the woman who knelt now at the twelfth station. Rising from the sea of wooden pews came the scent of rats, a rat moving somewhere near the altar, a rat in the great wood-carved side altar of the Virgin Mary. The gold candlesticks shimmered on the altar. A rich white chrysanthemum bent suddenly on its stem, droplets glistening on the crowded petals, a sour fragrance rising from a score of vases, from altars and side altars, from statues of virgins and Christs and saints. I stared at the statues. I became obsessed suddenly and completely with the lifeless profiles, the staring eyes, the empty hands, the frozen folds. Then my body convulsed with such violence that I found myself pitched forward, my hand on the pew before me. It was a cemetery of dead forms, of funereal effigy and stone angels. I looked up and saw myself, in a most palpable vision, ascending the altar steps, opening the tiny sacrosanct tabernacle, reaching with monstrous hands for the consecrated ciborium, and taking the body of Christ, and strewing its white wafers all over the carpet, and walking then on the sacred wafers, walking up and down before the altar, giving holy communion to the dust. I rose up now in the pew and stood there, staring at this vision. I knew full well the meaning of it. God did not live in this church. These statues gave an image to nothingness. I was the only supernatural in this cathedral. I was the only supermortal thing that stood conscious under this roof. Loneliness. Loneliness to the point of madness. The cathedral crumbled in my vision. The saints listed and fell. Rats ate the holy Eucharist and nested on the sills. A solitary rat with an enormous tail stood tugging and gnawing at the rotted altar cloth until the candlesticks fell and rolled on the slime-covered stones. And I remained standing, untouched, undead, reaching out suddenly for the plaster hand of the Virgin and seeing it break in my hand, so that I held the hand crumbling in my palm, the pressure of my thumb turning it to powder. And then suddenly through the ruins, 
up through the open door through which I could see a wasteland in all directions, even the great river, frozen over and stuck with the encrusted ruins of ships, up through these ruins now came a funeral procession. A band of pale white men and women, monsters with gleaming eyes and flowing black clothes, the coffin rumbling on the wooden wheels, the rats scurrying across the broken and buckling marble, the procession advancing, so that I could see then Claudia in the procession, her eyes staring from behind a thin black veil, one gloved hand locked upon a black prayer book, the other on the coffin as it moved beside her. And there, now, in the coffin, beneath a glass cover, I saw to my horror the skeleton of Lestat, the wrinkled skin now pressed into the very texture of his bones, his eyes but sockets, his blond hair billowed on the white satin. The procession stopped. The mourners moved out, filling the dusty pews without a sound, and Claudia, turning with her book, opened it and lifted the veil back from her face, her eyes fixed on me as her finger touched the page. "'And now art thou cursed from the earth,' she whispered, her whisper rising in echo in the ruins. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and vagabond shalt thou be in the earth, and whoever slayeth thee, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. I shouted at her. I screamed, the scream rising up out of the depths of my being like some great rolling black force that broke from my lips and sent my body reeling against my will. A terrible sighing rose from the mourners, a chorus growing louder and louder as I turned to see them all about me, pushing me into the aisles against the very sides of the coffin so that I turned to get my balance and found both my hands upon it. And I stood there staring not down at the remains of Lestat, but at the body of my mortal brother. A quiet descended, as if a veil had fallen over all and made their forms dissolve beneath its soundless folds. There was my brother, blond and young and sweet as he had been in life, as real and warm to me now as he'd been years and years beyond which I could never have remembered him thus, so perfectly was he recreated, so perfectly in every detail. His blond hair brushed back from his forehead, his eyes closed as if he slept, his smooth fingers around the crucifix on his breast, his lips so pink and silken I could hardly bear to see them and not touch them. And as I reached out, just to touch the softness of his skin. The vision ended. I was sitting still in the Saturday night cathedral, the smell of the tapers thick in the motionless air, the woman of the stations gone and darkness gathering, behind me, across from me, and now above me, a boy appeared in the black cassock of a lay brother, with a long extinguisher on a golden pole, putting its little funnel down upon one candle, and then another, and then another. I was stupefied. He glanced at me, and then away, as if not to disturb a man deep in prayer. And then, as he moved on up to the next chandelier, I felt a hand on my shoulder— that two humans should pass this close to me without my hearing, without my even caring, registered somewhere within me that I was in danger, but I did not care. I looked up now and saw a grey-haired priest. "'You wish to go to confession?' he asked. "'I was about to lock up the church.' He narrowed his eyes behind his thick glasses. The only light now came from the racks of little red glass candles which burned before the saints, and shadows leaped upon the towering walls. "'You are troubled, aren't you? Can I help you?' "'It's too late, too late,' I whispered to him, and rose to go. 
He backed away from me, still apparently unaware of anything about my appearance that should alarm him, and said kindly to reassure me, No, it's still early. Do you want to come into the confessional? For a moment I just stared at him. I was tempted to smile, and then it occurred to me to do it. But even as I followed him down the aisle in the shadows of the vestibule, I knew this would be nothing, that it was madness. Nevertheless, I knelt down in the small wooden booth, my hands folded on the prie dieu as he sat in the booth beside it, and slid back the panel to show me the dim outline of his profile. I stared at him for a moment, and then I said it, lifting my hand to make the sign of the cross. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, sinned so often and so long I do not know how to change, nor how to confess before God what I have done. Son, God is infinite in his capacity to forgive, he whispered to me. Tell him in the best way you know how. And from your heart. Murders, father. Death after death. The woman who died two nights ago in Jackson Square, I killed her, and thousands of others before her, one and two a night, father, for seventy years. I have walked the streets of New Orleans like the Grim Reaper, and fed on human life for my own existence. I am not mortal, father, but immortal and damned, like angels put in hell by God. I am a vampire. The priest turned. What is this, some sort of sport for you, some joke? You take advantage of an old man, he said. He slid the wooden panel back with a splat. Quickly I opened the door and stepped out to see him standing there. Young man, do you fear God at all? Do you know the meaning of sacrilege? He glared at me. Now I moved closer to him, slowly, very slowly, and at first he merely stared at me, outraged. Then, confused, he took a step back. The church was hollow, empty, black, the sacristan gone and the candles throwing ghastly light only on the distant altars. They made a wreath of soft gold fibers about his gray head and face. Then there is no mercy, I said to him, and suddenly clamping my hands on his shoulders, I held him in a preternatural lock from which he couldn't hope to move and held him close beneath my face. His mouth fell open in horror. Do you see what I am? Why, if God exists, does he suffer me to exist? I said to him. You talk of sacrilege. He dug his nails into my hands, trying to free himself, his missile dropping to the floor, his rosary clattering in the folds of his cassock. He might as well have fought the animated statues of the saints. I drew my lips back and showed him my virulent teeth. Why does he suffer me to live? I said. His face infuriated me, his fear, his contempt, his rage. I saw in it all the hatred I'd seen in Babette, and he hissed at me, Let me go, devil, in sheer mortal panic. I released him, watching with a sinister fascination as he floundered, moving up the center aisle as if he plowed through snow. And then I was after him so swift that I surrounded him in an instant with my outstretched arms, my cape throwing him into darkness, his legs scrambling still. He was cursing me, calling on God at the altar. And then I grabbed him on the very steps to the communion rail and pulled him down to face me there and sank my teeth into his neck. The vampire stopped. Some time before, the boy had been about to light a cigarette, and he sat now with the match in one hand, the cigarette in the other, still as a stored dummy, staring at the vampire. The vampire was looking at the floor. He turned suddenly, took the book of matches from the boy's hand, struck the match, and held it out. The boy bent the cigarette to retrieve it. 
He inhaled and let the smoke out quietly. He uncapped the bottle and took a deep drink, his eyes always on the vampire. He was patient again, waiting until the vampire was ready to resume. I didn't remember Europe from my childhood. Not even the voyage to America, really. That I had been born there was an abstract idea. Yet it had a hold over me, which was as powerful as the hold France can have on a colonial. I spoke French, read French, remembered waiting for the reports of the Revolution and reading the Paris newspaper accounts of Napoleon's victories. I remember the anger I felt when he sold the colony of Louisiana to the United States. How long the mortal Frenchman lived in me, I don't know. He was gone by this time, really, but there was in me that great desire to see Europe and to know it, which comes not only from the reading of all the literature and the philosophy, but from the feeling of having been shaped by Europe more deeply and keenly than the rest of Americans. I was a Creole who wanted to see where it had all begun. And so I turned my mind to this now, to divesting my closets and trunks of everything that was not essential to me. And very little was essential to me, really. And much of that might remain in the townhouse, to which I was certain I would return sooner or later, if only to move my possessions to another similar one and start a new life in New Orleans. I couldn't conceive of leaving it forever, wouldn't. But I fixed my mind and heart on Europe. It began to penetrate for the first time that I might see the world if I wanted, that I was, as Claudia said, free. Meantime, she made a plan. It was her idea, most definitely, that we must go first to Central Europe, where the vampire seemed most prevalent. She was certain we could find something there that would instruct us, explain our origins. But she seemed anxious for more than answers, a communion with her own kind. She mentioned this over and over, my own kind, and she said it with a different intonation than I might have used. She made me feel the gulf that separated us. In the first years of our life together I had thought her like Lestat, imbibing his instinct to kill, though she shared my tastes in everything else. Now I knew her to be less human than either of us, less human than either of us might have dreamed. Not the faintest conception bound her to the sympathies of human existence. Perhaps this explained why, despite everything I had done or failed to do, she clung to me. I was not her own kind, merely the closest thing to it. But wouldn't it have been possible, asked the boy suddenly, to instruct her in the ways of the human heart the way you'd instructed her in everything else? To what avail, asked the vampire frankly, so she might suffer as I did? Oh, I'll grant you I should have taught her something to prevail against her desire to kill Lestat. For my own sake I should have done that. But you see, I had no confidence in anything else. Once fallen from grace... I had confidence in nothing. The boy nodded. I didn't mean to interrupt you. You were coming to something, he said. Only to the point that it was possible to forget what had happened to Lestat by turning my mind to Europe. And the thought of the other vampires inspired me also. I had not been cynical for one moment about the existence of God, only lost from it drifting preternatural through the natural world. But we had another matter before we left for Europe. Oh, a great deal happened, indeed. It began with the musician he had called while I was gone that evening to the cathedral, and the next night he was to come again. I had dismissed the servants and went down to him myself. And his appearance startled me at once. He was much thinner than I'd remembered him, and very pale, with a moist gleam about his face that suggested fever. And he was perfectly miserable, 
When I told him Lestat had gone away, he refused at first to believe me, and began insisting Lestat would have left him some message, something. And then he went off up the Rue Royale, talking to himself about it, as if he had little awareness of anyone around him. I caught up with him under a gas lamp. He did leave you something, I said, quickly feeling for my wallet. I didn't know how much I had in it, but I planned to give it to him. It was several hundred dollars. I put it into his hands. They were so thin I could see the blue veins pulsing beneath the watery skin. Now he became exultant, and I sensed at once that the matter went beyond the money. Then he spoke of me. He told you to give this to me, he said, holding on to it as though it were a relic. He must have said something else to you. He stared at me with bulging, tortured eyes. I didn't answer him at once, because during these moments I had seen the puncture wounds in his neck, two red scratch-like marks to the right, just above his soiled collar. The money flapped in his hand. He was oblivious to the evening traffic of the street, the people who pushed close around us. Put it away, I whispered. He did speak of you, that it was important you go on with your music. He stared at me as if anticipating something else. Yes? Did he say anything else? He asked me. I didn't know what to tell him. I would have made up anything if it would have given him comfort and also kept him away. It was painful for me to speak of Lestat. The words evaporated on my lips. And the puncture wounds amazed me. I couldn't fathom this. I was saying nonsense to the boy, finally, that Lestat wished him well, that he had to take a steamboat up to St. Louis, that he would be back, that war was imminent, and he had business there, the boy hungering after every word as if he couldn't possibly get enough, and was pushing on with it for the thing he wanted. He was trembling, the sweat broke out fresh on his forehead as he stood there pressing me, and suddenly he bit his lip hard and said, "'But why did he go?' as if nothing had sufficed." "'What is it?' I asked him. "'What did you need from him? I'm sure he would want me to—' "'He was my friend!' He turned on me suddenly, his voice dropping with repressed outrage. "'You're not well,' I said to him. "'You need rest. There's something—' And now I pointed to it, attentive to his every move. "'On your throat.' He didn't even know what I meant. His fingers searched for the place, found it, rubbed it. "'What does it matter? I don't know. The insects, they're everywhere,' he said, turning away from me. "'Did he say anything else?' For a long while I watched him move up the Rue Royale. A frantic, lanky figure in rusty black, for whom the bulk of the traffic made way. I told Claudia at once about the wound on his throat. "'It was our last night in New Orleans.' We'd board the ship just before midnight tomorrow for an early morning departure. We had agreed to walk out together. She was being solicitous, and there was something remarkably sad in her face, something which had not left after she had cried. What could the marks mean? she asked me now. That he fed on the boy when the boy slept? That the boy allowed it? I can't imagine, she said. Yes. That must be what it is. But I was uncertain. I remembered now Lestat's remark to Claudia that he knew a boy who would make a better vampire than she. Had he planned to do that? Planned to make another one of us? It doesn't matter now, Louis, she reminded me. We had to say our farewell to New Orleans. We were walking away from the crowds of the Rue Royale, my senses were keen to all around me, holding it close, reluctant to say this was the last night. This ends Disc 6. Interview with the Vampire, Disc 7. The old French city had been for the most part burned a long time ago, and the architecture of these days was, as it is now, Spanish which meant that as we walked slowly through the very narrow street where one cabriolet had to stop for another, 
We passed whitewashed walls and great courtyard gates that revealed distant lamplit courtyard paradises like our own, only each seemed to hold such promise, such sensual mystery. Great banana trees stroked the galleries of the inner courts, and masses of fern and flower crowded the mouth of the passage. Above, in the dark, figures sat on the balconies, their backs to the open doors, their hushed voices and the flapping of their fans barely audible above the soft river breeze. And over the walls grew wisteria and passiflora, so thick that we could brush against it as we passed, and stop occasionally at this place or that to pluck a luminescent rose or tendrils of honeysuckle. Through the high windows we saw again and again the play of candlelight on richly embossed plaster ceilings, and often the bright iridescent wreath of a crystal chandelier. Occasionally a figure dressed for evening appeared at the railings, the glitter of jewels at her throat, her perfume adding a lush, evanescent spice to the flowers in the air. We had our favorite streets, gardens, corners, but inevitably we reached the outskirts of the old city and saw the rise of swamp. Carriage after carriage passed us, coming in from the bayou road, bound for the theater or the opera. But now the lights of the city lay behind us, and its mingled scents were drowned in the thick odor of swamp decay. The very sight of the tall, wavering trees, their limbs hung with moss, had sickened me made me think of Lestat. I was thinking of him as I'd thought of my brother's body. I was seeing him sunk deep among the roots of cypress and oak, that hideous withered form folded in the white sheet. I wondered if the creatures of the dark shunned him, knowing instinctively the parched, crackling thing there was virulent, or whether they swarmed about him in the reeking water, picking his ancient dried flesh from the bones. I turned away from the swamps, back to the heart of the old city, and felt the gentle press of Claudia's hand comforting. She had gathered a natural bouquet from all the garden walls, and she held it crushed to the bosom of her yellow dress, her face buried in its perfume. Now she said to me in such a whisper that I bent my ear to her, Louis, it troubles you. You know the remedy. Let the flesh, let the flesh instruct the mind. She let my hand go, and I watched her move away from me, turning once to whisper the same command. Forget him. Let the flesh instruct the mind. It brought back to me that book of poems I'd held in my hand when she first spoke these words to me, and I saw the verse upon the page. Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. She was smiling from the far corner, a bit of yellow silk visible for a moment in the narrowing dark, then gone. My companion, my companion forever. I was turning into the Rue du Maine, moving past darkened windows. A lamp died very slowly behind a broad scream of heavy lace, the shadow of the pattern on the brick expanding, growing fainter, then vanishing into blackness. I moved on, nearing the house of Madame Leclerc, hearing faint but shrill the violins from the upstairs parlor, and then the thin metallic laughter of the guests. I stood across from the house in the shadows, seeing a small handful of them moving in the lighted room. From window to window to window moved one guest, a pale lemon-colored wine in his stem glass, his face turned towards the moon as if he sought something from a better vantage and found it finally at the last window, his hand on the dark drape. Across from me a door stood open in the brick wall. 
and a light fell on the passage at the far end. I moved silently over the narrow street and met the thick aromas of the kitchen rising on the air past the gate, the slightly nauseating smell of cooking meat. I stepped into the passage. Someone had just walked fast across the courtyard and shut a rear door. But then I saw another figure. She stood by the kitchen fire, a lean black woman with a brilliant tignon around her head, her features delicately chiseled and gleaming in the light like a figure in diorite. She stirred the mixture in the kettle. I caught the sweet smell of the spices and the fresh green of marjoram and bay, and then in a wave came the horrid smell of the cooking meat, the blood and flesh decaying in the boiling fluids. I drew near and saw her set down her long iron spoon and stand with her hands on her generous tapered hips, the white of her apron sash outlining her small, fine waist. The juices of the pot foamed on the lip and spit in the glowing coals below. Her dark odor came to me, her dusky, spiced perfume, stronger than the curious mixture from the pot, tantalizing as I drew nearer and rested back against a wall of matted vine. Upstairs the thin violins began a waltz, and the floorboards groaned with the dancing couples. The jasmine of the wall enclosed me, and then receded like water leaving the clean-swept beach, and again I sensed her salt perfume. She had moved to the kitchen door, her long black neck gracefully bent as she peered into the shadows beneath the lighted window. Monsieur, she said, and stepped out now into the shaft of yellow light. It fell on her great round breasts and long, sleek, silken arms, and now on the long, cold beauty of her face. You're looking for the party, monsieur, she asked. The party's upstairs. No, my dear, I wasn't looking for the party, I said to her, moving forward out of the shadows. I was looking for you. Everything was ready when I woke the next evening. The wardrobe trunk on its way to the ship, as well as a chest which contained a coffin. The servants gone, the furnishings draped in white. The sight of the tickets and a collection of notes of credit and some other papers all placed together in a flat black wallet made the trip emerge into the bright light of reality. I would have foregone killing had that been possible, and so I took care of this early and perfunctorily, as did Claudia. And as it neared time for us to leave, I was alone in the flat waiting for her. She had been gone too long for my nervous frame of mind. I feared for her. Though she could bewitch almost anyone into assisting her if she found herself too far away from home, and had many times persuaded strangers to bring her to her very door, to her father, who thanked them profusely for returning his lost daughter. When she came now, she was running, and I fancied as I put my book down that she had forgotten the time. She thought it later than it was. By my pocket watch we had an hour. But the instant she reached the door, I knew that this was wrong. Louis, the doors! she gasped, her chest heaving, her hand at her heart. She ran back down the passage with me behind her, and as she desperately signaled me, I shut up the doors to the gallery. What is it? I asked her. What's come over you? But she was moving to the front windows now, the long French windows which opened onto the narrow balconies over the street. She lifted the shade of the lamp and quickly blew out the flame. The room went dark, and then lightened gradually with the illumination of the street. She stood, panting, her hand on her breast, and then she reached out for me and drew me close to her beside the window. "'Someone followed me,' she whispered now. I could hear him, block after block, behind me. At first I thought it was nothing. She stopped for breath, her face blanched in the bluish light that came from the windows across the way. Louis, it was the musician, she whispered. But what does that matter? He must have seen you with Lestat. Louis, he's down there. Look out the window, try to see him. 
She seemed so shaken, almost afraid, as if she would not stand exposed on the threshold. I stepped out on the balcony, though I held her hand as she hovered by the drape, and she held me so tightly that it seemed she feared for me. It was eleven o'clock in the Rue Royale, for the moment was quiet. Shops shut, the traffic of the theatre just gone away. A door slammed somewhere to my right, and I saw a woman and a man emerge and hurry towards the corner, the woman's face hidden beneath an enormous white hat. Their steps died away. I could see no one, sense no one. I could hear Claudia's labored breathing. Something stirred in the house. I started, then recognized it as the jingling and rustling of the birds. We'd forgotten the birds. But Claudia had started worse than I, and she pulled near to me. There is no one, Claudia, I started to whisper to her. Then I saw the musician. He had been standing so still in the doorway of the furniture shop that I had been totally unaware of him, and he must have wanted this to be so. For now he turned his face upwards, towards me, and it shone from the dark like a white light. The frustration and care were utterly erased from his stark features. His great dark eyes peered at me from the white flesh. He had become a vampire. I see him, I murmured to her, my lips as still as possible, my eyes holding his eyes. I felt her move closer, her hand trembling, a heart beating in the palm of her hand. She let out a gasp when she saw him now. But at that same moment something chilled me even as I stared at him, and he did not move. Because I heard a step in the lower passage. I heard the gate hinge groan. And then that step again, deliberate, loud, echoing under the arched ceiling of the carriageway, deliberate, familiar. That step advancing now up the spiral stairs. A thin scream rose from Claudia, and then she caught it at once with her hand. The vampire in the furniture shop door had not moved, and I knew the step on the stairs. I knew the step on the porch. It was Lestat. Lestat pulling on the door, now pounding on it, now ripping at it, as if to tear it loose from the very wall. Claudia moved back into the corner of the room, her body bent as if someone had struck her a sharp blow, her eyes moving frantically from the figure in the street to me. The pounding on the door grew louder. And then I heard his voice. Louis, he called to me. Louis, he roared against the door. And then came the smash of the back parlor window, and I could hear the latch turning from within. Quickly I grabbed the lamp, struck a match hard, and broke it in my frenzy then got the flame as I wanted it and held the small vessel of kerosene poised in my hand. "'Get away from the window! Shut it!' I told her, and she obeyed as if the sudden, clear-spoken command released her from a paroxysm of fear. "'And light the other lamps! Now, at once!' I heard her crying as she struck the match. The stop was coming down the hallway. And then he stood at the door. I let out a gasp, and not meaning to, I must have taken several steps backwards when I saw him. I could hear Claudia's cry. It was Lestat, beyond question, restored and intact as he hung in the doorway, his head thrust forward, his eyes bulging as if he were drunk and needed the door jam to keep him from plunging headlong into the room. His skin was a mass of scars, a hideous covering of injured flesh, as though every wrinkle of his death had left its mark upon him. He was seared and marked as if by the random strokes of a hot poker, and his once clear gray eyes were shot with hemorrhaged vessels. "'Stay back, for the love of God,' I whispered. "'I'll throw it at you. I'll burn you alive,' I said to him." and at the same moment I could hear a sound to my left, something scraping, scratching against the façade of the townhouse. It was the other one. I saw his hands now on the wrought-iron balcony. Claudia let out a piercing scream as he threw his weight against the glass doors. I cannot tell you all that happened then. I cannot possibly recount it as it was. I remember heaving the lamp at Lestat. 
It smashed at his feet, and the flames rose at once from the carpet. I had a torch then in my hands, a great tangle of sheet I'd pulled from the couch and ignited in the flames. But I was struggling with him before that, kicking and driving savagely at his great strength. And somewhere in the background were Claudia's panicked screams. And the other lamp was broken, and the drapes of the windows blazed. I remember that his clothes reeked of kerosene, and that he was at one point smacking wildly at the flames. He was clumsy, sick, unable to keep his balance, but when he had me in his grip I even tore at his fingers with my teeth to get him off. There was noise rising in the street, shouts, the sound of a bell. The room itself had fast become an inferno and I did see in one clear blast of light Claudia battling the fledgling vampire. He seemed unable to close his hands on her like a clumsy human after a bird. I remember rolling over and over with Lestat in the flames, feeling the suffocating heat in my face, seeing the flames above his back when I rolled under him. And then Claudia rose up out of the confusion and was striking at him over and over with the poker until his grip broke and I scrambled loose from him. I saw the poker coming down again and again on him and could hear the snarls rising from Claudia in time with the poker like the stress of an unconscious animal. Lestat was holding his hand, his face a grimace of pain, and there sprawled on the smoldering carpet lay the other one, blood flowing from his head. What happened then is not clear to me. I think I grabbed the poker from her and gave him one fine blow with it to the side of the head. I remember that he seemed unstoppable, invulnerable to the blows. The heat by this time was singeing my clothes, had caught Claudia's gossamer gown, so that I grabbed her up and ran down the passage, trying to stifle the flames with my body. I remember taking off my coat and beating at the flames in the open air, and men rushing up the stairs and past me. A great crowd swelled from the passage into the courtyard, and someone stood on the sloped roof of the brick kitchen. I had Claudia in my arms now, and was rushing past them all, oblivious to the questions, thrusting a shoulder through them, making them divide. And then I was free with her hearing her pant and sob in my ear, running blindly down the Rue Royale, down the first narrow street, running and running, until there was no sound but the sound of my running and her breath. And we stood there, the man and the child, scorched and aching and breathing deep in the quiet of night. Thank you.